Hachette Audio presents The Secret Diary of Hendrik Groen, written by Hendrik Groen, translated by Hester Velmans, read by Derek Jacobi. Tuesday, 1st of January, 2013. Another year, and I still don't like old people. Their Zimmer frame shuffle, their unreasonable impatience, their endless complaints, their tea and biscuits, their belly aching. Me? I'm 83 years old. Wednesday, the 2nd of January. Great clouds of icing sugar were spilled a moment ago. Mrs. Smith had put the plate of apple tartlets on a chair because she wanted to wipe down the table with a cloth. Along comes Mrs. Fuhrheisen, who inadvertently parks her enormous bottom right on top of the pastries. It wasn't until Mrs. Smith began looking for the dish to put it back that someone came up the idea of checking underneath Mrs. Vorheisen. When she stood up, she had three tartlets stuck to her flowery behind. D the apples match the pattern on your frock perfectly, Ebert remarked. I almost choked to death laughing. This brilliant start to the new year should have given rise to all-round hilarity, but instead led to forty-five minutes of carping about whose fault it was. I was glared at, darkly, from all sides, on account of having found it funny, apparently. And what did I do? I mumbled I was sorry. Instead of laughing even harder, I found myself groveling for forgiveness. For I, Henricus Gerardus Groen, am ever the civil, ingratiating, courteous, polite, and helpful bloke. Not because I really am all those things, but because I don't have the balls to act differently. I rarely say what I want to say. I tend to choose the path of least confrontation. My speciality? Wanting to please everybody. My parents showed foresight in naming me Hendrick. You can't get any blander than that. I shall wind up spiralling into depression, I thought. That's when I made the decision to give the world a little taste of the real Hendrik Groen. I hereby declare that in this diary I am going to give the world an uncensored expose, a year in the life of the inmates of a care home in North Amsterdam. I may die before the year's out, true. That's beyond my control. In the event, I will ask my friend, Evert Dyker, to read a few pages from this diary at my funeral. I'll be laid out, neatly laundered and pressed, in the small chapel of the Horizon Crematorium, waiting for Evert's croaky voice to break the uncomfortable silence and read some choice passages to the bewildered mourners. I do worry about one thing. What if Evert should die before me? It wouldn't be fair, considering that I have even more infirmities and funny lumps and bumps than he does. And you ought to be able to count on your best friend. I shall have to have a word with him about it. Thursday, the 3rd of January. Evert was keen, but wouldn't guarantee he'd live longer than me. He also had a few reservations. The first was that, after reading publicly from my diary, he'd probably have to look for another place to live. The second consideration was the state of his dentures, caused by a careless jab of the billiards cue by Fair Metteron. Since he has a cataract in his right eye, their metron needs some assistance with his aim. Evert, ever prepared to help, was standing behind him giving directions. His nose lined up with the cue. Uh, Tad to the left, and uh, a bit deeper. And before he could finish, their metron had rammed the back of his cue right through Evert's snappers. Score! Now Evert looks like a little kid waiting for a visit from the Tooth Fairy. People have a hard time understanding him because of the lisp. He'll have to have those teeth fixed before reading at my funeral. But that's not bloody going to happen any time soon. The denture repairman, it seems, is out of action. Two hundred thousand per annum, an assistant who's a real looker, three trips to Hawaii every year, and still his nerves are shot. How is it possible? Maybe years of having to deal with ancient dentures so food-encrusted that they're crawling with maggots and sent him over the edge. 
so to speak. The New Year's doughnuts they're serving in the conversation lounge downstairs can only have come from the charity shop. Yesterday morning I took one, to be polite, and spent a good twenty minutes trying to get it down. As a final result, I had to pretend my shoelace had come undone, so that I could duck under the table and stuff the last piece down my sock. No wonder they'd hardly been touched. Normally anything that's free round here is gone in the blink of an eye. In the conversation lounge, coffee is usually served at 10.30. If the coffee hasn't arrived by 10.32, the first residents start glancing pointedly at their watches, as if they've got something better to do. The same goes for tea, which is supposed to be brought in at 15.15. .15. One of the most exciting moments of the day. What kind of biscuits will we have with our tea and coffee today? Both yesterday and the day before it was the elderly doughnuts, because, of course, we wouldn't dream of throwing food away. We'd rather choke to death on it. Friday, the 4th of January. Yesterday I took a walk to the florists to buy some potted bulbs so that I can tell myself a week from now, when the hyacinths start to bloom, that I've made it to another spring. Most of the rooms in this retirement home keep their Christmas decorations on display until April, next to an ancient Sansevieria and a Primula, whose days are numbered. Be ashamed to chuck it. If nature's role is to bring cheer to a person's life, it certainly doesn't do the job in the room of a Dutch old-age pensioner. There, the condition of the house plant is usually an accurate reflection of the state of mind of the human entrusted with its care, both just waiting for the sad end. Since they have nothing else to do, or are a bit forgetful, the old biddies water their plants at least three times a day. In the long run, not even a Sansevieria can survive that. Mrs. Fisser has invited me in for a cup of tea tomorrow afternoon. I should have declined, if only because of how she smells, but I said I would love to stop by for a minute. There goes my afternoon. Cripes, what a gormless wimp I am. On the spur of the moment I couldn't think of a good excuse. So I shall have to endure the mindless jabbering of the dry sponge. How she manages to turn the moistest of cakes into dusty cardboard is beyond me. You need three cups of tea per slice to wash it down. Tomorrow I will take a bold stand and turn down the second helping. Start a new life. A new life in scrupulously polished shoes. I spent half the morning on them. The shoes themselves were done relatively quickly. Trying to scrub the shoe polish out of my shirt sleeves took much longer. But they're nice and shiny now. The shoes, I mean. The sleeves are just rolled up in the end. I couldn't get them clean. It's bound to raise some eyebrows. How do you always manage to get your sleeves so grubby, Mr. Groen? Life in here consists of either never or always. One day the food is never served on time, and always too hot, and the next always too early, and never hot enough. On occasion I have ventured to remind people of their previous rather contradictory statements, but they don't have much use for logic here. Ah, Mr. Crone, you do have a lot to say for yourself, don't you? Saturday, the 5th of January a kerfuffle again last night at dinner. Indonesian fried rice on the menu. Most of the old folk in here are of the bubble and squeak persuasion. None of that fancy foreign fare for them. Even back in the mid-sixties, when spaghetti was first introduced to the Netherlands, they'd said, no thanks. Spaghetti simply didn't fit into the week's menu. On the eve Monday... Cauliflower and porridge, Tuesday, mince, Wednesday, beans, Thursday, fish, Friday, soup and bread, Saturday, and the Sunday roast. If they really threw all caution to the wind and had hamburgers on Tuesday, it made a right dog's dinner of the rest of the week. Foreign grub just 
isn't our thing. We're usually shown the menu a week ahead so that we may choose from three different options. But sometimes there's a slip-up. Yesterday, for some unknown reason, there was nothing but Indonesian fried rice. Something about a delivery mix-up. It wasn't the cook's fault. Naturally. The choice, therefore, was fried rice or fried rice. People on restricted diets were given bread. A tidal wave of indignation. Mrs. Hoogstraten van Dam, who insists on being addressed by her full name, just picked at the bits of fried egg. Van Gelder doesn't eat rice, but scoffed down an entire jar of pickles. And fat old Backer demanded that they bring him some gravy for his rice. My mate Everett, who sometimes joins us for dinner when he gets sick of his own culinary prowess, offered his unsuspecting dinner companions a jar of chilli sauce. Would you care for some ketchup with your rice? He was the picture of innocence, as Mrs. de Pryker proceeded to spit her dentures into the relish. She was helped out of the room, coughing and sputtering, upon which Everett picked up her teeth and started passing them round like Cinderella's slipper, to see if anyone wanted to try them on. When the facilities manager reprimanded him, he was all bewildered indignation. He even threatened to go to the food inspector to report that he had found a set of dentures in the relish. Before dinner, I had tea with Mrs. Fiser. Her conversation is even more tepid than her tea. Told her the doctor had said I shouldn't have any cake. But why? she asked. I said it was my blood sugar. It's on the high side, somewhere between twenty and twenty-five. I blurted it out without thinking, but she decided it was very sensible of me. She pressed three slices of cake on me when I left, in case my blood sugar went down again. Those slices have found a home in the fish tank on the third floor. Sunday, the 6th of January. My dribbling keeps getting worse. White underpants are excellent for highlighting yellow stains. Yellow underpants would be a lot better. I'm mortified at the thought of the laundry ladies handling my soiled garments. I have therefore taken to scrubbing the worst stains by hand before sending the washing out. Call it a pre-pre-wash. If I didn't send out anything to be laundered, it would arouse suspicion. You have been changing your underwear, haven't you, Mr. Groan? The fat lady from housekeeping would probably ask. What I'd like to reply is, No, fat lady from housekeeping, this pair is caked so firmly onto the old buttocks that I think I'll just keep wearing them for the rest of my days. It has been a trying day. The body creaks in all its joints. There's nothing that will stop the decline. At best you have the occasional day when you're not bothered as much by this ache or that, but genuine improvement is not on the cards. Ever. Hair isn't suddenly going to start growing back. Not on the pate, at least. It readily sprouts from the nose and ears. The arteries aren't going to clear themselves out. The bumps and lumps won't go away, and the leaky nether parts aren't going to stop dripping. A one-way ticket to the grave, that's what it is. You never grow younger, not by a day, nor an hour, not even a minute. Look at me, whining and moaning like an old crock. If that's where I'm headed, I might as well go and sit in the conversation lounge downstairs. Whinging is pastime number one down there. I don't think half an hour goes by without somebody bringing up their aches and pains. I do believe I'm in a rather sombre mood. You're supposed to enjoy your sunset years. But it bloody well isn't always easy. Time for a little stroll. It's Sunday afternoon, for Pete's sake. Then a smidgen of Mozart and a large snifter of brandy. Perhaps I'll stop by Abbott's, too. His thick-headedness can be very therapeutic. Monday, the 7th of January. 
It appears that an investigation was launched yesterday into the sudden demise of fish on the third floor. A considerable amount of cake was found floating in the water. I suppose it wasn't one of my brightest ideas, tossing Mrs. Fisser's sponge into the fish tank. If she should ever hear that the fish died from soggy cake overdose, the evidence will point straight at me. I had better start preparing for my defence. I'll swing by Diker the lawman for some good advice. Everett is an expert in the art of little white lies. Pets are forbidden in this home, with the exception of fish or birds, as long as they do not exceed ten or twenty centimetres in length, respectively. It says in the house regulations, just in case people wanted to keep sharks or white-tailed eagles. The policy has caused a great deal of anguish for poor old biddies mercilessly torn from their dogs or cats when they move into the house of the setting sun. No matter how calm and sedate, old or lame the animals are, rules are rules. Off to the pound. No, madam, it makes no difference that Rascal is the only creature in the whole wide world that you love. We simply cannot make an exception. Yes, we understand that all your cat ever does is sleep on the windowsill, but if we were to allow one cat, then someone else would want to bring in three Great Danes that sleep on the windowsill, wouldn't they? Or maybe a purple crocodile. Mrs. Brinkman holds the record. She managed to hide an old dachshund under the sink for weeks before it was discovered. Someone must have ratted on her. To have lived through the war, as we all did, and still be so heartless as to turn in a mangy old dog. And instead of tarring and feathering the traitorous collaborator, it was the poor little dog the director deported to the pound. Where it spent the next two days, howling pitifully, before dying of a broken heart. And where was the SPCA when we needed it? The director thought it best to keep Mrs. Brinkman in the dark about this turn of events. But when Mrs. Brinkman finally managed to catch the right tram to take her to the pound, her dog was already six feet under. She asked if her dog could be exhumed and laid to rest beside her when her own time comes. She was informed that it's against the rules. Tomorrow I have to go to the doctor. Tuesday the 8th of January. There was a notice on the board by the lift. A quantity of cake crumbs was found in the fish tank on the third floor. The fish in the tank have died as a result of ingesting said cake. Anyone who is able to shine some light on this incident is kindly requested to report to Mrs. DeRose, floor manager, as soon as possible. Anonymity honoured upon request. I went to see Mrs. DeRose at eleven. What marvellous irony for someone like her to be named after a rose. Even Mrs. Stinging Nettle will give her too much credit. It would make sense if truly ugly people were extra nice to compensate. But in this case the opposite is true. This one's a solid wall of cantankerousness. But to resume, I told her I might be able to provide some explanation about the cake incident. She was immediately all ears. I explained that I had been reluctant to refuse Mrs. Fisser's homemade sponge and had left a plate of it on the table in the third-floor pantry. Fully confident that some resident would appreciate the offering from an unknown donor, to my regret I realised that the cake had somehow ended up in the aquarium and that my blue plate had disappeared. DeRose heard me out with undisguised incredulity. Why hadn't I eaten the cake myself? Why the third floor? Was there anyone who could corroborate my story? I asked her to keep it confidential. She said she would see what she could do. She then began wondering how Mrs. Fisser could have baked the cake herself in the first place. Cooking, 
or baking in one's room is strictly forbidden. I hastened to add that I wasn't sure that it was homemade. But it was too late. The cake mystery was out of the box. I shall lose Mrs. Fisher's friendship, not a big tragedy in itself, but the distrust and suspicion in our unit, already rife, will be whipped up for weeks, and there will be no end to the gossip. I went to the doctor's surgery today. He was off sick. If he hasn't recovered by Monday, they'll dig up a locum. If it's an emergency, the GP of a rival nursing home will see us. Some in here would rather die than let that quack from Twilight House have a look at their wrinkled carcass. Others prefer to call in the air ambulance for every little fart. Speaking for myself, it doesn't make any difference which doctor ends up telling me there's nothing much that can be done. Wednesday the 9th of January I had to say I was a bit off my game yesterday because of the dead fish business. I came down with a bad case of the runs, more the tea I'd had at Mrs. Fisser's, combined with my nerves. Spent half the morning on the loo with some old reading material I'd borrowed from the conversation lounge. It's quite a mouthful, that conversation lounge, but it doesn't do justice to what really goes on there. The GGG suite would be more accurate, in which the three Gs stand for gossip, grousing, and gibberish. A full day's work for some. Everett stopped by briefly to fill me in through the loo door on the latest. Everyone now suspects everyone else, seeing a potential fish assassin in every co-inmate. My absence has aroused suspicion. I've asked Everett if he would quietly spread word of my diarrhoea as an alibi of sorts. I wasn't up to much except leaving the loo door ajar, as well as the door out to the corridor in order to air the place out. I can usually stand my own smell, but this time I was making myself nauseous, both literally and metaphorically. For what a calculating piece of chicken shit am I? In this case, a rather fitting image. Speaking of fresh air, I really need to get out for a bit. After a whole day of dry toast and emodium, I think I might risk venturing outside again to go and look for the Celandine, which, if so say, both the newspaper and the nature calendar of the Phenological Observation Network, another mouthful, is the first true sign of spring. If, beside the Celandine, I were to find some coat's foot, cow parsley, or wood violets as well, I'd know that spring has truly sprung. Pity I haven't the foggiest what those plants are supposed to look like. Nature is six weeks ahead of herself. But bad news for the migratory birds that have made the decision to stay put this year. There's a cold spell on the way. Thursday the 10th of January. The care home has a lovely garden. But for some inexplicable reason it is locked. In winter, no one is allowed in. For our own good, presumably, management knows what's best for us inmates. So, if you want some fresh air at this time of year, you have to make do with a stroll round the neighbourhood. Ugly sixties flats, dismal refuse dumps masquerading as strips of grass. You would think that at night, the street cleaners roll through the area strewing litter instead of sweeping it up. One has to wade through a sea of tins, empty crisp packets and old newspaper. The people who used to live here have almost all traded their flats for a modern terrace in Permarent or Almira. The only ones left are those who can't afford to do so. Turkish, Moroccan and West Indian families have moved into the vacated buildings. It makes for quite a jolly melting pot. My range these days is about five hundred metres each way, with a pause on a bench at the halfway mark. I can't manage much more than that. The world is shrinking. Starting from here, I can take one of four possible one-kilometre round trips. Everett has just been to see me. He is getting enormous pleasure from the kerfuffle surrounding the fish massacre, and has a plan to turn it up a notch. He wants to mount a second offensive. 
this time with pink fondant fancies. He thinks the colour will have a more dramatic effect on the water. Yesterday he took the bus to a supermarket a few kilometres down the road, specially to obtain a supply. If he had bought them here in the home's mini-market, they would be bound to remember his purchase. The cakes are now stashed in his cupboard. I asked if he thought they were safe there. It's a free country. A person can hide as many fancies in his own home as he fancies, can't they? He said. Saturday, the 12th of January. The home's director, Mrs. Stellwagen, I'll have much more to say about her later, in all probability, has announced an energy-saving measure. The thermostats in the residents' rooms are not to be set above 23 degrees. If the oldies are cold, they should simply wear their coats, is the message. There is an Indonesian lady who likes to have a thermometer at 27 degrees. There are bowls of water set out all over her room to increase the humidity. Her tropical plants are thriving. There hasn't yet been a decree stipulating the maximum size for houseplants, but I suspect Stelvagen is working on it. Mrs. Stelvagen is always friendly, ready with a willing ear, and an encouraging word for everyone, but concealed beneath that veneer of sympathy is an unhealthy dose of self-importance and power-lust. She's forty-two years old, and has been in charge for a year and a half now, but is always on the lookout for an opportunity to kick or arse-lick her way up the ladder, depending on whom she's dealing with. I've been watching her for a year or so. I also have a most valuable informant, her secretary, Mrs. Applebaum. Anya Applebaum was the secretary of the last director, Mr. Lemaire, for twenty-three years, until the latest merger when Lemaire was forced into early retirement. Anya has two years to go before she gets her pension, and since a new office manager was appointed over her head, she's determined not to let Stelvagen get the better of her again. Anya still has access to all the minutes and confidential documents. A few years ago, she lived next door to me and saved me from the homeless shelter by arranging for me to come here. More on that some other day, perhaps. I'll often have a coffee with Anya in her office on Thursday mornings. That's when Stelbargen and the office manager are off to their meeting with the unit managers and the district manager. Promotion to district manager is the next leap Stelbargen is hoping for. It's a chance for us to gossip. Can you keep a secret? she'll often ask before launching into a blow-by-blow blow of Stelvagen's latest machinations. We've collected quite a dossier on her. Sunday, the 13th of January. Last night, Ever tossed six pink fondant fancies into the fish tank on the second floor. The goldfish gorge themselves silly. Their corpses are floating up there among the cake crumbs. All hell has broken loose. Everett simply excused himself during after-dinner coffee, announcing he was going to the loo, then climbed the stairs, peering round to make sure no one saw him, and chucked the cakes he'd been hiding under his jacket into the water. He deposited the plastic wrapper neatly in the waste-paper basket. Not such a bright way to dispose of the evidence, I suppose, but luckily the cleaner has already been round to empty the bins. The fish tank is tucked away in a rather dark corner, so no one noticed anything last night. The operation wasn't without risk. If he'd been nabbed, he'd have been obliged to call in the moving van. Perhaps somewhere, deep down, he doesn't care if he gets caught. Even though whenever he's in a tight spot, he'll lie through his teeth and rant and rave, swearing he had nothing to do with it. That's how the game is played, he says. His philosophy? The only point of being alive is to kill time as pleasantly as possible. The trick is not to take anything too seriously. I envy him. But I'm a fast learner. I myself was rather on edge yesterday because Everett had told me about the attack beforehand so that I could prepare a foolproof alibi for myself. 
It wasn't easy. I had to hang about in the conversation lounge until finally a couple who live on my floor stood up to go upstairs. I'll walk with you for some company, I said. Mr. and Mrs. Jacobs did give me a rather funny look. The alarm was sounded just after nine this morning. Mrs. Bransma, on her way to church, caught sight of the fish floating belly up. They tried to keep it quiet at first, apparently, but Bransma had already blabbed about it to everyone she encountered on her way to find the duty nurse. My next-door neighbour has just knocked on my door. You won't believe what I just heard. I'm looking forward to all the chin-wagging when I go down for coffee. Monday the 14th of January Another Pet Catastrophe Mrs. Schruder accidentally hoovered up her canary while she was cleaning its cage. When, after several desperate minutes, she finally managed to control her shaking hands enough to get the hoover open, there wasn't much left of her poky little birdie. She should have turned off the machine immediately, of course. Her little Pete was still alive at first, but gave up the ghost a few minutes later. Schruder is inconsolable and racked with guilt. The only victim support from the staff was the advice to throw out the cage as soon as possible. Everyone in here has strong views on the subject of cake crumbs in fish tanks, but ask them what they think of the war in Syria, and they'll stare at you as if you've just asked them to explain the theory of relativity. A handful of fish floating belly up are a thousand times worse than a busload of women and children blown to smithereens in some far-off country. But let's not be hypocritical. I am enjoying the fish scandal immensely. I cannot pretend otherwise. The outrage that has overtaken the entire population here is remarkable. I'm about to go back down to the conversation lines for some more juicy fish talk. Winter has arrived. Not a flake of snow on the ground, but yesterday I saw the first old gentleman stepping outside with wool socks pulled on over his shoes to guard against slipping. Tuesday the 15th of January. Here it is, the first snowfall of the year. Which means nobody ventures outside, and everyone's stocking up on provisions. In our little shop downstairs, there's not a packet of biscuits or a bar of chocolate to be had anymore. The war, you know. It's lucky for today's young people that we are just about the only ones left who've lived through the war. Soon they won't have to put up with any more old crock's tales about tulip bulb soup and having to walk seven hours for a bunch of carrots. The final count is seven dead fish. Yesterday, the police were called in. The two young constables hadn't a clue how to go about solving the case. None of the bright deficiency you see on the telly from these two. First, they inspected every nook and cranny of the aquarium, as if they thought there might still be one left in there in need of resuscitation. Yeah, they're dead all right, said the one. The cakes what did them in, probably, said the other. Steelbargain had ordered the dead fish to be left in the tank as evidence. Maybe she'd been expecting a forensic pathologist, who knows? In any case, the officers just seemed eager to get out of there as soon as they decently could. The director was insisting on a thorough investigation, but the younger copper told her that it would entail lodging a criminal complaint. Couldn't she do that right now? No, she'd have to make an appointment at the station, either in person or via the website. Fine, but what were they supposed to do with the dead fish? The constable suggested the rubbish bin. Yeah, but don't leave them in there too long. Yeah, or you could flush them down the toilet. Then the gentlemen turned on their heels and vacated the premises. Night, ma'am. Mrs. Stelbargen was appalled. Outrageous! It's simply outrageous! 
Is this any way to treat the taxpayer? It was lovely to witness the woman's helpless tantrum. Apparently, her power has no reach outside the four walls of this institution. Wednesday, the 16th of January. Ebert dropped by. To avoid the conversation lounge, we went for a little shuffle through the snow. Walk for five, rest for five. We are faced with the inevitable. Rollator, mobility scooter, or the Canter LX microcar. Such sexy options. A week ago, in front of the secondary school round the corner, a boy of sixteen or seventeen showed off a tomato-red canter he must have borrowed from his gran. He used the little car to tote the prettiest girls' school bags, with the pretty girls themselves following on their bikes. I haven't ever seen a youngster driving a mobility scooter for fun or pushing a relator. That is why my preference is for a nicely pimped canter even if that throws me in with all the other pathetically bad drivers at the wheel of one of those biscuit tins. A canter ploughed full steam ahead into a confectioner's shop the other day, coming to a stop in a deluge of licorice and assorted shortbread, with two fat ladies' horrified faces smashed against the windshield. Their little dog got stuck under the brake pedal. Truth is better than fiction. Here, the topic of almost every conversation is either the snow or the great fish caper. The old biddies keep coming up with the most fanciful conspiracy theories, and some aren't shy about making unsubstantiated accusations. For example, close to the time of the murder, two residents had seen Mrs. Alcher in the corridor where the fish tank is located. The fact that her room is on that corridor and that being three floors up she can hardly be expected to climb in through the window, did not deter anyone. Poor Alchie, a timid little mouse who can't weigh more than forty kilos, and doesn't dare look you in the eye, has never harmed fish nor fly. After the copper's visit, the director called a meeting to allay fears a bit. She informed us that every room on the second floor had been thoroughly searched, for form's sake, as if the perpetrator's room would be revealed by the presence of cake crumbs galore. No one piped up to ask if management had the right to inspect the rooms. I didn't either. Didn't have the nerve. However, over coffee there was plenty of whispered innuendo about rooms on other floors that could stand a thorough inspection as well. "'accompanied by vehement nods. "'Oh, yes!' "'Thursday, 17th of January. "'I've been reading back through my diary entries. "'Perhaps they're a bit gloomy so far. "'I assure you that there are some decent people in here, too. "'My friend Everett, of course. "'He lives independently, "'just around the corner in the sheltered accommodation with his dog. "'An old, friendly... Very intelligent, lazy mutt, named Mohammed. Whenever Ebert's gout acts up, I'm the one who walks the dog. Walking the dog doesn't entail very much, owing to my limited range, but then Moe's range is even more limited than mine. One loop round the building, that's it. A trickle against ten tree trunks, and once a day, a turd deposited on the grass, which I have to whisk away in a little plastic bag, since I'm being spied on from dozens of windows. If I were to leave a poo in the spot where it was expelled, there would be a scramble to be the first to report me. Then there's Edward, a man of few words. He is hard to understand because of his stroke, but he chooses his near-unintelligible words carefully. Whenever he does attempt to say something, you know that repeating, excuse me, several times, will be worth it. What he economises on words, he expends on shrewd observation. Creature, a real dear, friendly and sympathetic, without fawning. Graham, 
the last of this group for now, seems insecure and introverted, but always tells it to you straight, without riling you. These are the men and women I don't mind sitting with over a cuppa. It's more or less a given, really, for something as simple as whether to sit down next to someone or not follows strict unwritten rules. We all have our prescribed places, at the lunch table, at bingo, in moving to music class, in the meditation room. If you want to be hated, just try sitting down in someone else's spot and not moving. When one of these doddery old babies comes up to you and pouts, that's where I sit. Well, if I may venture to say so, you seem to be standing at the moment, right in front of my nose. That is, if you haven't already been warned, as you're limping to an empty chair. That's where Mrs. So-and-so sits. Upon which everyone always apologises and shuffles on when what you really should do is sit down and say, pointing to the other empty chairs, she'll sit over there today, or she can just sod off. Friday the 18th of January Over the past three days, management has issued a travel restriction. After all, who wants to risk a broken hip? It doesn't improve the mood round here. Not that the residents tend to go out much, even when it isn't slippery, but still, most take a daily stroll to the shopping centre, the post box, or the park. And the greater the prohibition, the greater the need. The old biddies are sitting by the window today, staring at the snow that just will not melt, complaining about the council that keeps the roads ploughed but leaves the pavement and bicycle paths awash in brown sludge. They do have a point. The staff have swept the front steps so that we can make our way unhampered from the front door to the bus stop, but the agonising uncertainty about what might await you at the other end when you get off the minibus makes most people decide not to risk it. Fear is an ever-present counsellor. The fish, tempest in a teacup, has died down. Somewhat. It was only a matter of time before something else came along to distract people's attention. Well, here it is. Besides the snow, it's the rumour that the council wants to put up the parking rates. The oldies worry that if the meter needs to be fed with one euro more, their children will come less often. If my children were so put off by having to pay one bloody euro extra that it made them stay away, I wouldn't want them to visit me at all when I ventured very cautiously to express my opinion on the matter over coffee, I was told that it was easy for me to say, seeing that I don't have any children, and never have any visitors in the first place. There is a grain of truth in that. Almost every name in my address book is crossed out. Two that aren't may or may not still be alive. Another doesn't remember who I am. That leaves only Ebert and Anya. Graham, Edward and Grecia aren't listed in my address book. Not a very impressive list of friends, is it? The choice is either dying young or enduring an endless string of funerals. I now have just five more funerals to go, Max, not counting the ones I go to only out of politeness. Saturday, the 19th of January. Friday is feel-good fitness day. That's when you see the old biddies scurrying down the halls on their way to the gym in the most remarkable exercise outfits. The ladies are truly past the point of shame, and it is not a pretty sight. Pink leggings, hugging skinny, bony knees, or fat, jiggling thighs, Form-fitting T-shirts pulled tight across what was once a pair of breasts. The physical decline on proud display. At my age, it is not conducive to feeling good. The venue. 
a little used conference room, in which the tables are pushed to the side and the chairs arranged in a circle. The exercise largely takes place sitting down, so as not to dishearten the wheelchair band. There's a bit of waving of arms and legs to the beat of some cheerful music. And groaning. And loud proclaiming of ailments preventing the execution of certain moves. I can't do that with my colostomy. Then it's time for a game of ball tossing. Confession? The ball isn't in play all that much. It's the vocal cords that get the most exercise, cheering one another on for the simplest of exploits, like a mother applauding a toddler who, after twenty tries, finally manages to catch the ball. Yes, you did it! What a clever boy! We're all very good sports. Let's just put it that way. So, indeed, yesterday I attended Feel Good Fitness. It was my first time, and also my last. When it was over, and the instructor, call me Tina, gushed that I should definitely come again next week, I told her right then and there that once was enough. Oh, and why is that? she asked, suspiciously. Because with so much female pulchritude about, I can't concentrate on the exercises properly. I stiffen up. I blurted it out without thinking. It wasn't until I'd said it that I felt myself getting hot, much more so than during the fitness class. Hey, I'm beginning to speak my mind. Or, nearly, I am improving by leaps and bounds. Thanks to this diary, perhaps. Tina stood there, nonplussed. The sarcasm was clear, but I hadn't laid it on thick enough that she could object not with all the dolled-up tarts still standing there. Most of them still consider themselves quite attractive. Self-knowledge tends to decrease drastically with age, just as in children it increases year by year. Sunday, the 20th of January We pensioners are definitely not bearing the brunt of the economic crisis. According to the calculations of a prominent research institute, a single OAP living off a state pension is going to be two, two euros better off per month this year. So the panic Henk Kroll and his 50-plus party set off was for nothing. A majority of the residents voted for him in last year's election. People with generous pensions and those who have taken early retirement, are getting a bit less. But they have more to start with. Anyway, there are no early retirees in here. It's astonishing how frugal the residents are. Even people living on the state pension are able to squirrel away quite a bit. Though God only knows why they bother. Last year, some residents of another nursing home won the jackpot in the lottery. The fuss associated with having all those millions wound up making a good number of them thoroughly miserable. I am seeing to it that I'll be deep in the red when I die. With the help of the Virgin Mary calendar that I won at Bingo in December, I have calculated that from the shortest day, 21st of December, until today, a month later, the sun has risen just eleven minutes earlier and set thirty-seven minutes later. Curious, isn't it? I've been a bit constipated lately, you see, and the Virgin Mary calendar hangs in the loo. It has passages from the Bible, but also recipes, quotations, and jokes. Tomorrow, 21st of January, is the day of St. Agnes, Virgin and Martyr. She died in 304. Just so you know. There was a fuss in the paper again about a mentally handicapped boy who was found chained to the wall in his care home. The reason wasn't given. He probably gets violent. There are people in the dementia unit here who can hardly throw a punch or even stand up, but they too lie there, trussed up like escape artists who've forgotten the trick to breaking free. 
You are welcome to come and have a look, paparazzi. Monday, the 21st of January. My daughter would have been 56 today. I try to imagine what she would have looked like. I can't see beyond the image of a four-year-old, dripping wet, slack in a neighbor's arms. I watch them approach in seconds that were without end. Not until fifteen or twenty years later did a whole day go by when I didn't think about it. No one is going out. Snowstorm. More doom and gloom. Everett has diabetes. Actually, he's had it for a while. Everett doesn't follow the doctor's orders all that carefully, and the doctor's assistant took it upon herself to rub it in. Certainly, Mr. Dyker, if you insist on drinking and eating the wrong things and smoking, there's not much I can do for you, is there? Go oh, for the only pleasures left in life, love. I am not your love. Nor are you my doctor, medal assistant. Even so, he's a bit worried, Everett. He used to frequent his local pub when he was friendly with a fat patron who also had diabetes. The man were down twenty-five pints on a normal night. Afterwards, he'd have a few shots of whiskey at home. One fine day, his mate's toe turned black. The toe had to be amputated. Then other toes. Then a foot. Then a leg below the knee. Everything that turned black got sawn off in the hospital. He was a regular customer there. He was a very friendly bloke who simply couldn't stop drinking or smoking. For a while he was still propped up at the bar on an artificial leg, but then he wound up in a wheelchair and could no longer get to the pub. Two months later he was dead. Everett's nightmare to start turning black at the extremities and wind up at the mercy of doctors and nurses. Tomorrow I'll write about something cheerful again. Tuesday, the 22nd of January. Yet another to-do about the price of parking. The ever-cantankerous Mr. Kuiper has submitted a proposal to the Residents' Association to introduce paid indoor parking. Practically no one in here walks with a cane. The residents like to push one of those rollator things instead, with handbrake and a shopping basket. If you get tired, you can rest your weary behind on it. Some tootle about on mobility scooters, even indoors. Those machines take up quite a bit of room. They also seem to be getting bigger. They're a status symbol. Management is worried about traffic jams, and has asked that the rollators and scooters be used indoors as little as possible. That got the hobblers terribly upset. But when Kuiper proposed following the city of Amsterdam's example to solve the parking problem by making people pay, all hell broke out. I do think that Kuiper has a few screws loose. This home was built in the late sixties, when children started having such busy lives that they couldn't have their aged peas move in with them anymore. Or they simply didn't feel like having their parents live in and I'd be the last to be much surprised by that. Be that as it may, about forty years ago, homes for the aged began to sprout from the ground like mushrooms, and so nice and spacious, too, rooms measuring twenty-four square meters, bath alcove and kitchenette included. A married couple was granted another eight square meters for a bedroom, over the past twenty years, there's been some half-assed remodeling, but the space is still far too small. They never took into account the armada of rolling equipment. The lifts aren't big enough for more than two scooters or four rollators at a time. And then it takes a good fifteen minutes before they all maneuver themselves in or out, impatiently ramming into people's legs standing right in front of the door when people are still trying to get out. 
the solution Stellbargen came up with was to commandeer one of the lifts for the staff, which made the queue for the other lifts even longer, of course. You now have to leave even earlier in order to reach your destination on time. They ought to start giving traffic reports. I used to take the stairs, but I'm no longer able to, so these days you'll often find me standing in the queue. If a fire ever breaks out in here, the entire population will be cremated. Only the staff will be able to make it outside in time. Wednesday, the 23rd of January. I casually asked the doctor about the availability of the pill that cures all ailments. He pretended he didn't understand. Such a cure-all doesn't exist, I'm afraid. I didn't have the nerve to ask again. He did find my list of complaints impressive, however. The dribble, pains in my legs, dizziness, bumps, eczema. But he couldn't do much about any of it. A little placating with a pill here, and an ointment there. He even discovered a new one, high blood pressure. I didn't have that before. So, now I have pills for that as well. Our oldest resident has passed away. Mrs. de Gans, for many years as senile as a goldfish. She had to be tied to her chair so she wouldn't slide off, but still. Hooray! She reached the grand old age of ninety-eight. Just old enough to have lived through World War I. Three months ago, the local alderman brought her a cake on her birthday because she was the district's oldest citizen. They'd propped her up at a table for the photographer of the local paper, but in a moment of inattention, she had plopped head first into the whipped cream cake. It made a great photo op. Sadly, the director refused to allow it to be printed in the paper. The alderman, who is so fond of seeing his own face in the newspaper, ordered a fresh cake to be rushed in. But by that time, Mrs. de Gans had already conked out and could not be woken up. So now she is past ever being awakened again. Not that it makes a great difference. I don't think I'll go to the cremation. I'm finding them hard to take these days. Thursday, the 24th of January. The atmosphere in the home is not improving. There's been snow on the ground for over a week, and a fierce east wind, so everybody stays indoors, sulking at being cooped up. Short daily walks and an errand or two are the activities life normally revolves around in here. Without those, there's even more time to keep tabs on each other. Not the day has to get filled with something. Yesterday, wanting a breath of fresh air, I went and sat down on the bench by the front door. I hadn't been there more than a few minutes when the doorkeeper told me I wasn't supposed to sit there. A shivering old crock next to the entrance is not good for business. You can look out the window, can't you? I muttered, just wanted to stick my nose out for some fresh air. Your nose is purple, Mr. Groan, and runny. Mr. Hogdalen has been driving a mobility scooter for a few months. Three days ago, his son, who owns a garage, took it home and he returned it this morning. All pimped up. Spoilers, extra white tyres, sat-nav, sound system with speakers, horn, and the cherry on the top, an airbag. All quite unnecessary, but no less brilliant for that. Hogdalen... Proud as a peacock, drove his Lamborghini scooter round and round the home. Now, of course, there were snide remarks, but fortunately also some compliments. That's what it's about, isn't it? Keep living and doing what you love. This morning there was an obituary for Ellen Blazer, the talk show producer in the newspaper. I wonder how many obituaries the newspapers keep in reserve just in case. If I rang the newspaper, would they tell me? Or, to be more specific, could Nelson Mandela, for example, request to see his own obituary ahead of time 
and be allowed to make some changes. Friday, the 25th of January. I did manage to go quite a distance today before fate intervened. A motorbike nearly ran me off the pavement, and the next instant I found myself lying flat on my back. It just act as if nothing's the matter, is the knee-jerk reaction when that sort of thing happens, and that reflex still seems to be in perfect working order. I pick myself up, slap the snow from my coat, and look round to see if anyone had seen me fall. Fortunately, no one had, and I could trundle back to the home, no harm done. When I greeted the porter, he stared at me in surprise. What's happened to you? Uh, oh, nothing, I just slipped. Nothing? You're covered in blood! I felt the spot on my skull he was pointing at, and, indeed, it was rather sticky. A nurse was sent for, who immediately started nattering about stitches. So, long story short, I and my bloody head sat in ER for an hour and a half, and now I have a white turban on my head, and am keeping to my room as much as possible, to avoid the finger-wagging. Doesn't it hurt? That's how it usually begins. But sooner or later comes the follow-up. You really shouldn't go out when it's so slippery. There's your biggest headache. Right there. Oh, that white bonnet is most becoming on you. Ebert popped round to rub a bit more salt in the wound. If there's ever a shortage of rubbing salt, Ebert has plenty in his personal arsenal. To pay him back, I squashed him at chess. Usually I aim for a fairly equitable end game, with a win for one and then for the other, but this time, to his consternation, he was checkmate in fifteen minutes. That blow to your head seems to have done you some good, he remarked. It does wonders for your chess game anyway. I said that I hoped it would also do wonders for my billiards game tomorrow. Ah, oh, but your memory's shot, Hank, because billiards is three days from now. He was right. Strange that I'd got it wrong. Saturday the 26th of January. The last Saturday of the month. Bingo night. Geriatric gambling addicts competing for a box of cherry liqueur chocolates. The head of the Residents' Association takes it upon himself to call out the numbers. Don't even think of opening your mouth while he's at it. Whenever the number 44 is called, Mrs. Slothauer always says, Hunger Winter, and the entire room looks up, perturbed. Not long ago, a group of residents wanted Bingo moved to Wednesday nights, because Saturdays are for family visits which is hogwash, actually. The real motivation was probably what programme was on the telly on Saturdays. The Wednesday night choir promptly objected and proposed Monday night, which was quashed by the billiards club. The billiards club thought Friday night was a better option. That met with stiff resistance from the feel-good fitness people, who were too tuckered out from their afternoon exercises to face the exertion of a game of bingo in the evening. When three meetings of the Residents' Association were still unable to come to an agreement, our own King Solomon, Mrs. Stellwagen, decided that everything should stay as it was for now. Relations within the committee have suffered as a result. The knives are out. Bullying, at school or on the web, is a popular topic in the press nowadays but you seldom hear about intimidation in homes for the aged. Respectable OAPs can't possibly be bullies. How wrong they are. Just hang around here for a day and you'll know. We have real experts at it here. The Mrs. Slothauer Spinster Sisters are a greatly feared duo. This morning the first Miss Slothauer twisted the top of the salt shaker loose before her sister passed it to their favourite victim, Mrs. DeLeo, who promptly dumped the entire contents, top and all, onto her fried egg. 
Mrs. DeLeug gazed in bewilderment from her egg to the empty shaker and then at her neighbour. It's got nothing to do with me. It's your own fault. You're so clumsy of late. Slothower snapped at her, her sister nodding in agreement. I've no idea why they do it. Mrs. DeLeu, unlike the lion that is her namesake, is a timid little thing. She's always apologising for whatever's gone wrong around her, just to be on the safe side. It would take someone committing suicide and leaving a note clearly laying out the reason to make people take notice of the bullying that goes on in here. Sunday the 27th of January I tried, but did not make it to the end of bingo night. When a fight broke out over who was the winner of the fifth prize, a liver sausage from Aldi, I pleaded a migraine and went back to my room. A migraine is a handy ailment because it's always accepted as a fair excuse. When I first arrived, when no one knew me yet, I happened to mention my fictional migraines and have had frequent occasion to make use of them since. Squinting a bit and rubbing my forehead will do it. Some concerned soul will always ask if I have a migraine coming on. Then I have to have a little lie down. No questions asked, and Bob's your uncle. I've just come from the meditation room. I sometimes pop in there on a Sunday for the ecumenical service. One Sunday, it's a vicar leading the service. The next, it's a priest. They fit in well since they're both almost as old as the congregation. The vicar is a jokester. He takes God with a grain of salt. The priest is old school, preaching hell fire and damnation. It doesn't make a hell of a difference, actually, since they're both devilishly hard to understand. With death on the horizon, I'd say that a healthy proportion of the inmates here cling tightly to their faith. After the service... There's always raisin bread and coffee. Yesterday there was a great ballyhoo over the rise in the individual contribution to the cost of residential care. It had been in the newspaper. Pensioners are to be charged an income adjustment supplement of 8% on top of the means-tested 4%. There was great outrage over this news, but when Graham asked who among us was in fact rich enough to be required to pay it, only Mrs. Bregman put up her hand. She thought we were talking about the Residents' Association fee. The occupants here are mostly piss poor, with at most a modest pension here or there. It was funny that even the 50-plus party in Parliament had agreed to the rise in the individual levy. Hank Kroll's explanation? We had only just taken our seats in the House and saw that everyone else was voting for it, even the socialists. We were bamboozled, basically. I read the quote aloud to the group. Some were of the opinion that the other parties really ought to have warned Hank beforehand. Monday the 28th of January. At Elevenses this morning, I congratulated Mr. Hogdun on his extraordinarily fine scooter. He showed me all the upgrades. The only thing he wasn't able to demonstrate was the airbag. He wants to start a scooter club, the Antelopes. He admitted he'd stolen the name from somewhere. I told him that I might be in the market for a Canta Cabrio, but that I was still thinking about it. He, for his part, was willing to consider allowing canters into the club. At first I was inclined to find a polite way to wriggle out of it, but his club has suddenly begun to sound rather appealing. It might be fun to be a tour organiser. I can just picture a long line of mobility scooters slowly putt-putting across an unending flat landscape, with an OAP landing in a ditch every now and then. Two years ago there was an accident in Gainamiden involving a canter. I like to save interesting items that I cut out of the newspaper. Both people on board were killed. But, note this, they were aged 96 and 97 respectively. Ploughed head-on into another car. 
Perhaps their doctor had refused to give them the euthanasia pill. Who can say? You survive two world wars, and you meet your Waterloo in a flimsy biscuit tin that lands on its head on a burge near Gainamidon. One hundred and ninety-three years between the two of them. Not bad, really. He didn't say if they were married. Maybe she was his mistress, like Ted Kennedy at Chappaquiddick. That would just be too perfect. Speaking of newspaper cuttings, Friday's item, The Escape of Fifteen Thousand Crocodiles. Can one have two colons in a single sentence? Tuesday, the 29th of January. At 6.45pm yesterday evening, almost all of the inmates were gathered round the flat-screen television in the conversation lounge. What was Beatrix going to say in her annual Queen's speech? And there it was. She is abdicating. Apart from that announcement, her short speech was rather a letdown, to tell the truth. Mrs. Grunterman, who's a bit daft, wondered if the Queen would now be put in a care home. The room of the recently deceased Mrs. de Gans has been hurriedly cleared, so that it can be rented out as of the first of the month this Friday. Business is business, money is money. Poor Gans's only daughter was given three days to remove her mother's things and store them somewhere, or donate the lot to the Salvation Army. Otherwise, she'd have had to come up with another month's rent. She had called someone who advertised in the Yellow Pages that he paid good money for household contents. Upon casting a glance at the deceased's effects, he promptly turned and left. That's not worth my while even loading into the van. Tactful bloke. Granted, Mrs. de Gans had neither money nor taste. In the end, the daughter selected a few keepsakes and donated the rest to the charity shop. She'd begged Mrs. Stelvagen for three more days, to no avail. I'm so sorry, such a shame. I wish that I could tell you something different, but I simply must follow management rules. Stelvagen must have sanctimoniously told her. We'll have to ask Anya if I'm right. If the home itself has to take care of clearing out the room, they send the bereaved next of kin a bill for 580 euros or more, even if the job took less than an hour. If she knew of this, Mrs. de Gans would be turning in her grave. The grave she hasn't even been buried in yet. Yesterday afternoon there was an opportunity to say goodbye to her, the last viewing day, so to speak. It's the harsh lord of the dotage jungle. Either view or be viewed. She's being laid to rest this afternoon. Wednesday the 30th of January. I had better not air my Republican sympathies right now. This is not the time to shout down with the king. I don't really mind Beatrix, but I do think it's time for her to take a step back. She ought to devote more time to her painting, and less time to her hairdresser. That stiff hairdo has irked me for years. I shouldn't let it aggravate me, but I can't help it. There are at least thirty pictures of B on the front page of De Volkskrant. Not a single hair out of place in any one of them. The Queen is greatly revered in here. The magazine royalty has pride of place on the coffee table with Hello and Women's Own. Evert once tried to slip in a copy of Playboy as an experiment. Within an hour, it was gone. All the magazines have a big black stamp with the name of the institution on them, so that nobody will have the nerve to remove them from the common rooms. That Playboy wasn't stamped. A few residents have already put their names down for the minibus to Dam Square on the 30th of April. For the inauguration. They don't want to miss out on the royal festivities. I'm going to look in on Everett in a few minutes. He's had another attack of gout. And so I have to let out his dog, Mo. According to Everett, you can tell Mo's intelligent from the way he growls whenever Stellbargan is in the neighbourhood. She ignored the growling once. 
so I have to let out his dog, Mo. According to Ebert, you can tell Mo's intelligent from the way he growls whenever Stellbargel is in the neighbourhood. She ignored the growling once and went to pet him. He bit her hand, or rather he just missed and nipped her dress instead. An expensive dress it was. Ever since then, the relationship between the director and Ebert is rather icy, to put it mildly. There's a sign on the door. Respect the growl. Last night, when I went to fetch the dog, I found Ebert nodding off in his chair. When he has gout, he doesn't drink, but takes loads of pills instead. As soon as the attack is over, it's back to the other way round. Meanwhile, I'm looking after both dog and master. Mo is grateful, and Everett mumbles that it isn't necessary. He hates being pitied, so everyone had better stay out of his way. He'd like to see them put up a no-whinging sign in big neon letters over the front door. He tolerates me. I do a little shopping, pop a ready meal into the microwave for him, and then leave. When he's recovered, he always has a gift for me. A big bunch of tulips, half a kilo of smoked eel, a pin-up calendar. Thursday the 31st of January The royal family experts have been sleeping on the job. Nobody had given us advance warning that there was to be an abdication after two days of a Queen Beatrix deluge in the newspapers, on the radio, on the telly, and at the table. I'm beginning to wish for some kind of honest-to-goodness disaster, for a bit of balance. Beatrix's actual birthday, which is today, is always humbly celebrated in here with a round of cream cakes. Not the orange ones, I hasten to say. Those are only available on the official Queen's Day, on the 30th of April. Some of the residents also like to deck the place out in flags. Small flags for the table, since a big flag hanging on the wall is naturally out of the question. The rules are clear on this point. No holes in the wall. Every room comes equipped with four picture hooks in pre-assigned spots. And you just have to manage with those. Mr. Elroy tried to hang his moose head from one of those little picture hooks. It crashed onto his sideboard, smashing his tea set to smithereens. They wouldn't give him a bigger hook, no matter how he begged and pleaded. He's very attached to his moose. If we start allowing it, Christ knows where it will end, the head of buildings and grounds told him. That's the argument that ends all arguments in this place as if the residents would suddenly rise up as one and begin nailing all kinds of stuffed trophies to the walls if they let Elroy have a more substantial hook for his moose. The head is now balanced on a chair. Elroy can't really use it as a coat rack anymore. He does like to toss his hat onto it. He usually misses. Bending down to pick it up from the floor costs him a great deal of effort. But time and again, the challenge of the antlers beckons. Nice bloke, only he's as deaf as a post, which is a shame, because I'm sure he's someone you could have had a nice chat with otherwise. Friday the 1st of February I just had an unannounced visit from the social worker. Lucky for her, I'm almost always home. It was rather a surprise. I made her a cup of coffee and inquired to what I owed this pleasure. She began by beating about the bush. Was I still enjoying life? Was I feeling at all down? She sat there, charmingly hemming and hawing. She's quite young and inexperienced at her job, but was endearingly trying to do her best. I asked what had prompted this interest. Oh, it doesn't really matter. Well. <laughs> Miss, if it doesn't really matter, you can tell me, surely. And then she came out with it. The GP had sent her over, probably because I had casually asked about that euthanasia pill. 
he'd made this poor lamb come and check on me, to make sure I wasn't about to jump off the roof. I assured her that I had no plans in the near future to commit suicide. The word startled her a bit. Oh, sir, that isn't what I meant. I know what you meant. Everything's A-OK, -okay, and tell the doc that I would appreciate it if he took care of his problems himself. Another cup? No, she had to go. Yesterday I paid a visit to Anya, my informant in the boss's office, and she gave me a copy of Mrs. Stelbargen's report on the fish murders. I am not fingered as a suspect. Everett isn't either. She is convinced the culprit is one of the staff. An attempt to undermine her position, she thinks. She is going to install surveillance cameras in the corridors. I wonder if that's legal. Saturday the 2nd of February Stop the rot! Keep moving! That was the banner headline of a newspaper article with the subheading Scientists all over the world are seeking the root causes of the problems of ageing and their solution. Cool! Scientists! Right on time, aren't you? For us, it's far too late. But come on over, there's plenty of research material staggering about in here. Biologically speaking, you become superfluous on your fortieth birthday, or thereabouts, since the children are born by then and approaching self-sufficiency. That is when slowly but surely the rot starts to set in, with hair loss and reading glasses. On a cellular level, too, things start going wrong. You have more and more errors of division and multiplication. A slowing metabolism leads to a weaker nervous system, which also makes the mind begin to weaken. I'm giving a rough summary of the article. They don't know very much yet, but one thing is clear. Use it or lose it. You have to keep both body and mind active especially the prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that controls functions such as planning, initiative and flexibility. Well, we may presume that the management of this place doesn't care much about the prefrontal cortex. Neither money nor trouble is spared to keep the oldies docile, passive and lethargic, camouflaged by bingo, billiards and feel good fitness. Let me not, however, place the blame squarely on the staff. The patrons are only too willing to let themselves be coddled and patronized. And let's be honest, I do understand the temptation sometimes. There are days when I don't mind being a bit of a laggard myself. I'm going to keep moving for a bit. Let's see how far I get. The head bandage for my fall has come off, so I'll be spared the snide comments. Sunday the 3rd of February The 50-plus party stands at nine seats in some polls. In six years' time, there will be more voters over the age of 50 than under. Seemingly from nowhere, all kinds of political parties are getting wise to this. They have discovered the disgruntled OAP. We have become interesting all of a sudden. Not that in here there is much political awareness. They're robbing us blind is about the most complex opinion you ever hear, aired over coffee. The new resident who has moved into the late Mrs. de Gann's room, Effia Brandt, it seems a pleasant sort. A breath of fresh air compared to the average matron shuffling along our corridors. Not that she doesn't shuffle, but... At least she does it with style. I had a nice chat with her, and she told me it wasn't really her choice to move here, but she was determined not to let them nail me into my coffin. At least, not yet. And anyway, maybe I'll have myself cremated. I haven't decided yet. I said I wasn't sure yet, either, and that neither choice was very appealing to me, six feet under or up the chimney, and she agreed. There aren't too many alternatives. 
Perhaps one could have oneself dropped into the sea from the air. We could ask that Argentinian death flight pilot. I don't think the man's out of prison yet, I said. I don't believe I have exchanged this sort of banter with anyone since I've been in here. Even my chats with Everett are of a different order. The other inmates talk almost exclusively about the weather, the food, or their ailments. Well, the weather is fine, the food is passable. And with the help of a handful of pills, the aches and pains aren't troubling me very much today. In short, life is good. Monday, the 4th of February. I read in the newspaper that someone ran over seventy moorhens when his car went into a skid. A moorhen massacre. It must have been a dreadful sight. All those feathers and beaks, all that blood. Either they were huddled together in a tight pack, or it was a monster skid. Moorhens are usually unapproachably skittish. Anyway, I do have to ask myself, did the reporter make an exact tally of the bodies? And what about the injured ones? I can't imagine that every bird died on the spot. There must have been some that were still flapping about. Yeah, it's starting to make my stomach turn. All these pernickety questions I'm coming up with. Everett often drops in on a Sunday afternoon for a chat and a glass of something or other. Ever isn't fussy. Wine, gin, brandy, whiskey, it really makes no difference to him. I've seen him put away an entire bottle of eggnog with a little demi tasse spoon when we were at Mrs. Tankink's. That was all she had to offer. After two little glasses, he switched to a soup bowl and asked for a bigger spoon, as if it were custard. Tankink pretended it was the most normal thing in the world at the time, but dined on it for weeks afterwards whenever Everett was out of earshot. Sunday afternoon is, for many of the residents, the time when they receive visitors. Oh, has it been five weeks since we last went to see Mum and Dad? We had better swing by Sunday afternoon. And then they'll come for a cup of tea and grin and bear it for the next two hours. Hendrick, be honest. There's a touch of envy here, because you never have any visitors yourself. Except Abbott. But you can't really call that a visit. Tuesday, the 5th of February. There is a great buzz about plans for a euthanasia clinic, specially conceived for people with an uncooperative GP. The Netherlands Right to Die Society came up with the idea that's a society that must have a rather serious member turnover. Two years ago, Right to Die NL gathered 40,000 signatures in three days in order to force Parliament to take up the question of assisted suicide for people in their 70s and older. 40,000 signatures means the Parliament has to do something about the pensioner who considers his life largely over and who wishes to end it with some dignity. To stop him from going out and buying a bottle of meths and setting himself ablaze in his little room because nobody will help him. That very thing has actually happened, according to Right to Die NL. The society's opponents suggest making old people's lives much jollier instead to see if we can be persuaded to stick around. An interesting challenge, I'd say. Let's offer our care home as the test case. Bring on the fun! And in case that doesn't work, why not build a nice clinic for people who would like to step out of life discreetly, with expert guidance? Not too far from here, please, if possible. Now for something more cheerful, Grown. Think springtime. I've spotted some snowdrops and even a smattering of premature daffodils. The flowers are a bit confused. First a warm December, then almost three weeks of snow and ice. Next, back up to ten degrees, and now, hail and snow. Come on, flowers, don't be flustered. I'm in the mood for a glorious spring. Wednesday, the 6th of February. 
Financial news is also on the agenda at the coffee table. The SNS Bank is in trouble, and the residents who once entrusted their hard-earned nest eggs to it have emptied their accounts. Or, rather, had their son or daughter do it for them, because modern banking gives people like us the willies. A cash machine alone is quite an adventure. Having to look over your shoulder to make sure you're not about to be robbed, at the same time peering at the screen in order to punch in the four numbers of the pin code correctly, with your trembling fingers while also pressing your body against the machine to shield the code from prying eyes. It's a complicated manoeuvre that often comes a cropper. That's when one thinks with nostalgia of the good old pay packet. There are quite a number of widows in here, who, before the death of their husbands, had never so much as signed a cheque. All they had was their weekly housekeeping money. When someone dies, it's not unusual for an old sock stuffed with cash to come to light. Next we had a discussion about dancing on ice. Is there anything more deadly? I was pleased to see that I have an ally in my newest friend, Effia Brandt. It makes for a bond. In an attempt to involve her in the conversation, someone asked her what she thought of it. My doctor says I'm not allowed to watch it, she said. Eyebrows were raised all round. I got up the nerve to remark that she had a remarkably sensible doctor. Then Effia brought up the subject of the weather. The others were left gaping. When I got up to fetch my newspaper from the little shop, I offered to pick up a TV guide for her, since she has trouble walking. When I asked her which one she'd like, she said, I could choose, which I took as a vote of confidence. Don't you always read the same one, then? asked Mr. Quarter, in surprise. No, she tended to buy this magazine one week, and the next week another. But surely that makes it hard to find what you're looking for said Gorter, with eyes popping out of his skull. He simply could not get his head around such chaos. Oh, no. All I have to do is look it up. Monday usually comes after Sunday, you see, and then Tuesday is next, then Wednesday, and so on. Effia Brandt, you are not going to make very many friends in here. However, as far as friends go... I highly recommend myself. Thursday the 7th of February Evert wouldn't mind making Mrs. Brandt's acquaintance and suggested that I invite her along with himself for tea. He promised he would even drink the bloody tea this once. I don't know. They might not hit it off. Evert is rough and rude, and Effia strikes me as delicate and refined. I'm not keen on being caught in the middle. I'll end up with whiplash. But it does have a nice ring to it. Evert and Effia. Perhaps we'll be the three musketeers of this nursing home. Our chairman of the board has been in the news again. He's being forced to do some restructuring. He's giving 1,500 home care workers the chop. A few years ago, he received a bonus of 60,000 euros on top of his 220,000 euros salary, because he had managed not to let the company go belly up. It would seem to me that that's just part of his job. I don't know of many directors who are hired to make the business go bankrupt. One of the economies this chap came up with was to slash the apprentice caregivers' salaries. They're now being paid just 5,000 euros a year, for emptying bedpans and washing shriveled genitals. That is a fifty-sixth of what the boss, sitting in an office, that recently had a 40,000 euro facelift, has deposited into his own bank account. Woe to the man who thinks he is worth fifty-six times more than the woman who lovingly performs the dirty work. Friday, the 8th of February. Unrest in our rest home. There was a note on the notice board announcing that the residents could apply to their GPs for a bracelet saying 
Do not resuscitate. The note was not signed. At Elevenses, many of the residents expressed outrage over this far from subtle pitch. They would like to be rid of us. We cost too much. Fat Mr. Backer was amenable to being revived by a girl, but was adamant he would not want a man to give him mouth to mouth. I'd rather die. Was there a special bracelet for that? After the coffee hour, the note was gone. No one had any idea who had removed it. I hope the bracelet isn't too conspicuous. Otherwise, we'll never hear the end of it. I will ask my GP about it. I've invited Effia and Ebert for tea tomorrow afternoon. A proper English tea. Triangular sandwiches with the crusts cut off. And chocolates, biscuits and cake. And something with cream. I'll have to sort out what else goes into high tea. There's a Brit living on the fifth floor. Only he's got a foreign surname. He may know only about Pakistani tea customs. But I'm still going to go and ask him. In the corridor, I bumped into the sweet young social worker my GP had sent over to stop me from committing euthanasia. See? Still alive, I told her with a broad wink. She had to laugh. She's all right, that one. I can't think when I last winked at anyone. It must have been at my daughter. Saturday, the 9th of February. I'm actually a little nervous about the visit this afternoon. I keep telling myself to act normally. But in the meantime, I've tidied my room, scrubbed the floor, ironed my shirt twice, and bought four kinds of biscuits. And I'll have to pop back to the shop shortly for something other than English breakfast tea. I'm not following the advice of the friendly Pakistani gentleman. He solemnly presented me with a heavy book about tea customs all over the world. In Urdu. In Tibet, the ninety-ninth protester has gone and immolated himself. There ought to be a special celebration, marking the hundredth one. It has also been trendy for some time in the Arab world to express your displeasure that way. It must be said you do get people to pay attention, even if just for a short while. I seriously disapprove of the way things are run round here, too. But setting myself on fire would be going a bit too far. I do know some other people I wouldn't mind setting fire to, though, to get people's attention. According to de Volkskrant, the Netherlands and the Scandinavian countries have the best elderly care in the world. I mentioned this casually to some of my fellow inmates over coffee. To say that they were persuaded would be an overstatement. Either they didn't believe it, or they decided it didn't matter. If even here we're pinching pennies to eke out our pensions, what must it be like in other parts of the world? They wondered, concerned. The fact that there are perhaps half a billion old people who have never even heard of such a thing as an old age pension seemed highly unlikely to most of them. Sunday the 10th of February it wasn't a total disaster, the tea, but to claim that I was a relaxed, witty, and intelligent host is not the whole truth either. Effie was the first to arrive. I gave her a house tour, and she kindly characterized it as cosy. That covers many bases. Then, with a great deal of noise, Evert barged in. He has my spare key and refuses to use the bell. He walked into the room with a broad grin and an overly loud, Yo! When I asked what kind of tea he'd like, he expressed surprise. Since until now, I'd never offered him anything but English breakfast. And when a bit later I casually brought out the assorted biscuits, he said he felt like a king. He had never been treated in such royal fashion before. Or is all this in honor of this lovely queen? Accompanied by a broad wink. I believe I blushed a little. Effia smiled and said she felt very honoured. We chatted about this, that, and the weather, 
Then it was time to ask Effia discreetly how she likes our institution. She was diplomatically non-committal. I don't like to be too hasty in my judgment, but besides the advantages, of course, there are a few areas for improvement, to put it in modern-day business parlance. Such as? Evert wanted to know. I am still in the process of reviewing it. Perhaps we could devote another tea to the subject in the near future. Or something stronger, perhaps. Whatever was asking for was a gin, a red flag, or at least an orange one, because alcohol doesn't exactly bring out the restrained subtlety in him. But again, Effie resolved it elegantly. Right, perhaps something stronger. I might ask you two to come to my place for a glass of brandy next time, but I'm not promising anything, she added, smiling. Or gin, instead? Ever doesn't need drink to be unsubtle. I don't know why, Evert, but I have the feeling that when it comes to alcohol, with you it's quantity over quality, and my guess is that with Henk it's the exact opposite. Effia, I shall have to invite you more often, I said, with a grin at both guests. Half an hour later, she said goodbye. Another point in her favour, she doesn't overstay her welcome. Evert compensated amply for her absence. Two hours and five glasses of gin later, I kicked him out. Monday, the 11th of February. The minutes of the Residents' Association are pinned to the notice board. The Association will henceforth provide cocktail nuts and pretzel sticks on bingo night. The pretzel sticks will probably be set out on the tables in drinking glasses. That will provoke at least one person to say, Golly, remember when you'd have glasses filled with cigarettes like that? On birthdays and other occasions? Ah, yes, one glass of filtered cigarettes, one of unfiltered. If that little exchange doesn't take place, I'll eat my cigar. Or at least the cigar band. Ah, yes, in the old days, when everything was so much better, we used to save those. The Residents' Association's fee will be raised ten cents. I did read it right. Ten whole cents. The biannual outing has been postponed until the organising committee can agree on where to go. Ever since they were unable to find a new evening for bingo night, the members have been deeply divided on every issue. They'll try to choose a destination and a date again at the next meeting. If they don't succeed, the committee will schedule a new election in order to break the impasse. James O'Needin is dead. He is fondly remembered from the 70s British TV series, The O'Needin Line. One or two old ladies wiped away a tear. Such whiskers, such boldness. And then, forty years ago, they would have glanced at the bloke next to them on the couch and decided that, sadly, he would just have to do. Tuesday the 12th of February. The elderly may take pleasure in the fact that they are drawing a great deal of interest of late, not only in the Netherlands, in Germany, too. There was quite a bit of hoopla about the book Mother, When Will You Finally Die? by Martina Rosenberg. She spent years caring for her demented parents. The fact that some German offspring dump their invalid parents in much cheaper nursing homes in the Ukraine... Slovakia, or even Thailand, was widely reported in the papers. Our neighbours to the east have the Eltern Unterhalt, or compulsory parental support, to deal with. If between Ma and Pa's pensions and the piggy bank there isn't enough to pay for the nursing home rent, the children have to pay up. Parent alimony. With a bit of bad luck, you could find yourself having to pay both child support and parent support. In our own old age home, however, the alarming cutbacks in elderly care aren't felt that painfully. Most of the residents have their state pension and a small additional one from their work. If you hauled your pennies, you'll even have some left over. 
and they are ever so thrifty in here. The main expenditures are on biscuits, chocolates, the hairdresser, and the private minibus. Almost no one goes on holiday, nobody still has a car. I rarely see expensive furniture or clothing. Eating in a restaurant is a waste of money, and taxes are the ultimate extravagance. Old people like to deprive themselves. Meanwhile, the average age of the nursing home resident keeps going up. People are living independently longer, and are therefore older when they enter the home. At eighty-three, I am one of the youngest. Once you are here, there is no way out. Nobody ever goes back to living in a flat. They don't throw you out for being penniless, either. Sure, the children complain. They're furious that Pa or Ma is obliged to spend their inheritance down to the last cent. The longer the parent stays alive, the less is left over. If it were up to me, I would tell them, Dear child, it's not my problem. Poverty among the elderly is much less severe than people think. According to the latest research, just 2.6% of those over 65 are poor. 63% even say they're managing to get by quite well. The people making the fuss about seniors being robbed blind are the younger elements of 50-plus, which now has 13 seats in Parliament. That's Henk Kroll and his mates, who are still in their prime and still have plenty of time ahead of them to enjoy their generous pensions. To have the cut-off at fifty makes no sense. Fifty is the wealthiest and most powerful age group in the Netherlands. Sixty-five, or soon sixty-seven, would be a better starting point. And even then there's an enormous difference between someone who is just retiring and the extremely aged population in here. I would argue for the formation of a sixty-seven plus, a seventy-seven plus, and an eighty-seven plus. Ninety-seven plus probably wouldn't have enough members to make the electoral threshold. Wednesday the 13th of February The Pope has knocked the horsemeat scandal off the top spot of coffee table conversation topics. Everyone thought it was sensible of the Holy Father to decide to take his retirement. As for the possibility of a black Pope, opinions were mixed. Mr. Shoot didn't like the idea. He thought Berlusconi would make a better candidate. Fortunately, there were enough of us who had no objection in principle to a black pope. The only objections had to do with the need for a pope in the first place. Ours was originally a Catholic institution, but with a smattering of other denominations. Tensions between Catholics, Calvinists, and Protestants are never very far away. The Pope is a divisive figure from the outset. Rough Sketch of a Typical Day, Part 1 I get up at around half-past eight, then I walk to the mini-market for two fresh rolls. While having my breakfast, I peruse de Volkskrant, which has become quite ugly lately. Then I write here, in my secret diary for a bit. This takes about an hour. Next I go downstairs for elevenses, and after I finish my coffee I have a cigarette. After the coughing fit, at about half past eleven, I take my exercise by going for a stroll round the home, or outside. I normally start off in Everett's direction, but lately I often find myself trying to bump into Effia by accident. I have the feeling she doesn't mind coming face to face with me. Seeing that neither of us seems to mind giving chance a bit of a leg up, we'll often sit down together for a second cup of coffee. I've invited her to a lunchtime concert at the town hall. She accepted the invitation with pleasure, but remarked that stairs are a big problem for her. At one o'clock I have my lunch in the restaurant downstairs, and Everett frequently stops in for a croquette roll. If you want to eat in the dining room, you have to let them know a week ahead. That's when you receive a form to fill out. You have to tell them whether you are planning to have lunch and or dinner for the next seven days, and what you would like to eat. At night you're given a choice of three mains, two first courses and two puddings. You just mark the little boxes with a cross. Your name is on the form, 
as are all your diet restrictions. Everett always fills in all seven croquette boxes, whether he intends to show up for lunch or not. My spy in the office informs me the head cook has complained to the director about the waste of rolls and croquettes for all the times Ever does not show up. But Mrs. Stelvagen couldn't find anything against it in the rules and regulations. Thursday the 14th of February. Early this morning, Evert slipped a Valentine's Day card under Effia's door. He came to tell me about it at eight o'clock. He smelled of alcohol and clearly had not yet showered. Now you know uh, you can pretend it's from you. It's a card uh, with two swans on the front. Very romantic. I'm going back to bed now. Night, Henky. I was left speechless. When I went to the corner shop yesterday to buy a new washing-up brush, there was a young lady of about eighteen behind the till. When I went to pay, I started fumbling around for my money. I couldn't find my wallet at first. The checkout girl looked annoyed and was going to help the lady behind me, but the lady said, No, this gentleman was first. And turning to me, she continued, Take your time. I finally managed to pull out a ten-euro note. There you are. She slapped the change down on the counter. Ta! She didn't even deign to look at me. There are people who despise anything old, grey, or slow. This bratty shop girl was one of those. It's hard to steel oneself against a total lack of respect. Mrs. Van Diemen hopes that the new Pope, when elected, will in good time come to Amsterdam for Willem Alexander's coronation. She really wants it to be a Dutch Pope. Mrs. Van Diemen is well on her way to the locked ward. Friday, the 15th of February. Ebert received a note from Epia. Thanks ever so much for the lovely card. I happen to see you push it under the door. I should like us to become better acquainted. Evert was quite perplexed, until I started laughing. I couldn't help it, hoist with his own petard. Then he hurled a banana at my head. It hit his only flower vase, leaving a big crack. Oh, I suppose I'll have to go and buy you a bunch of tulips this afternoon, I teased him. I couldn't help it. It's driving everyone in here potty, this never-ending snow. I stopped by Anya's office to see if there was any more gossip about our director, who was away on important business. Her clothing allowance has been raised by 2,000 euros per year. Oh, sorry, not raised, but inflation indexed. Here in the home they have a great deal of respect for stale bargain. For bigwigs in general, really. I myself prefer to see bigwigs taken down a peg. A few years ago, three of the most powerful men in the world were in the news at once. Boris Yeltsin was too plastered to get off an aeroplane. Pope John Paul couldn't even get out a thank you for the flowers without nodding off. And Bill Clinton had stuck his cigar into an intern's privates. That's no way to light a cigar. Naturally, but what's far worse is that he couldn't stop his unorthodox smoking method from making headlines. And while I'm at it, at the UN Security Council, the Indian Foreign Minister accidentally read from a speech his Portuguese colleague had left on the podium. He never noticed it was the wrong speech. It took five minutes for a fellow countryman to get his attention. I only mean to say that we had better give those in authority the benefit of the doubt. Saturday, the 16th of February. I taste horse! Fat Mr. Backer yelled across the dining room, upon which almost everyone who had ordered the meatballs was suddenly able to detect the taste of horse meat. The cook was summoned. No, that's impossible. The meat came from the wholesale butchers, as always. So, what does that prove? The wholesale butcher can grind horse meat and mix it with the beef, can't he? 
I taste horse. That's final. I am not mad. Backer seethed. Now, the problem is that Backer is mad, and a very unpleasant madman besides. The head of housekeeping was brought in, too, but she could sputter until she was blue in the face. Nothing helped soothe the disgruntled crowd. Finally, all the meatballs were traded in for fish and chips. Most people thought there was little chance of there being any horse meat in that. The mince has been ground with pig's eyes and cow's udders for years. Never a word. And now, all of a sudden, there's a stink over a smidgen of horse meat. Downstairs in the common room, the radio is always on from ten till twelve. We are treated to the broadcast for hospital patients. No one knows why. Most residents don't mind the Dutch repertoire that's played for the invalid's pleasure. Lots of torch songs and rollicking polkas. One Easter morning a year ago, someone had the gumption to turn the dial to a classical music station. You should have seen the inmates clapping along to the strains of the St. Matthew Passion. I am trying to train myself to ignore the background music. The trick is not to sit too close to the speakers. The hospital broadcast ends at noon. The relative peace and quiet is a delight to listen to. Sunday the 17th of February. The concept of days of the week vanishes in a place where no one goes off to work, and every day is the same as every other day. The staff work, of course, but they too do the same thing day after day. The only day that's different is Sunday. Three quarters of the residents go to church in the morning, and the children and grandchildren come to visit in the afternoon. It's the only contact with the outside world some of the inmates have. And even if the visitors sometimes radiate boredom, it still counts. Receiving lots of visitors gives you status around here. Unpleasant Mr. Pot spends the first half of the week jawing on about who came last time and the second half of the week about who will come next time. He has eleven children. Pot is the kind of man who waits at the zebra crossing until there's a car coming and only then steps out into the road. I never have visitors. I usually spend my Sunday afternoon watching videos. I'm quite up to date cinematographically. My room has a fairly decent-sized flat screen. When it isn't on, I hide it behind an imitation Chinese screen. Sometimes I'll go and watch something at Ebert's, but he mostly prefers thrillers and action films. Not my favourite. Ebert's son very occasionally pays a visit, and the old granddaughter will sometimes pop in. Whether F. Chair has any visitors, I don't know. Rough Sketch of a Typical Day, Part 2 The only people who still sit down for a hot lunch are farmers from East Groningen and residents of homes for the aged. Except us. Don't ask me why we seem to be the exception. But I am glad that we are. After lunch, I often rest my eyes for a quarter of an hour as a prelude to the afternoon's activities. I like to go out, but the truth is that my lack of mobility is making that increasingly difficult. I have trouble walking, and my only means of transportation is the minibus operated by Connection. That's no picnic, I can tell you. Of course one shouldn't whine about the two euros it costs you for every trip, but Connection should really be called misconnection. They must be trying very hard in order to manage to get so much to go wrong. Let's just say that punctuality and connection have a stormy relationship. Old age and impatience, on the other hand, are on intimate terms. Monday the 18th of February. Of the five senses, my nose still works best which is not always a blessing in here. It smells of old people. I remember thinking my grandpa and grandma's house smelled funny, an indefinable pong mixed with the odour of cigars, humid clothes kept too long in plastic. Not all the rooms are that bad, but 
Sometimes before I visit someone, I'll stuff cotton wool up my nostrils. Up nice and deep, so it isn't noticeable. The fact that many people here have no sense of smell anymore seems to give them a free pass to fart to their heart's content, and the oral hygiene isn't stellar either. As if offal is the only thing they get to eat here. I myself am terrified that my dribble is leaving a pea odour wherever I go. So I change my clothes twice a day, douse myself generously with aftershave, down below as well, and suck on a ton of peppermints. Instead of aftershave, I'll sometimes go for a fragrance. The new fragrance for the old gentleman. I like to keep up with the times. When I asked the chemist for a scent for an old gentleman, they stared at me, open-mouthed. Then they tried to pop me off with a bottle costing 50 euros. Many of my fellow residents have never moved past the Eau de Cologne stage, 4711 or Old Spice. The air in here reeks of 50 years ago. Rough sketch of a typical day. Conclusion. I force myself to go for at least one stroll every day, even in the pouring rain if there's no other option. In the afternoon, I do a lot of reading, newspapers, magazines and books. I accept every free trial subscription that comes my way, not out of thriftiness, more as a kind of sport. In the late afternoon, I'll visit someone for a cup of tea, or several times a week I'll go off to Ebert's for a glass of wine, or he'll come over to my room for a cocktail. Ebert always arranges for good booze in great quantities. I, however, Partake in moderation, or else I'll fall asleep before supper. After drinks, I attend to my toilette, and then take myself downstairs for dinner. And despite all the grumbling, I usually find the food quite palatable. I often ask the staff to convey my compliments to the chef. After dinner, coffee. After coffee, telly. After telly, bed. It isn't particularly adventurous or edifying. I can't claim there's any more to it than that. Tuesday the 19th of February. Yesterday afternoon, by pure luck, the Rebels Club came into being. On the third Monday of the month, there's often some cultural activity on the schedule to take place in the recreation room. Usually... It's a cringeworthy exhibition of old people clapping along to someone warbling tulips from Amsterdam. But occasionally there's classical music. Everyone shows up because it's free, isn't it? Yesterday, the Music Association offered a violin, cello and piano trio. You can normally expect a bunch of uninspired moonlighters who only ever appear before OAPs or the mentally handicapped. But this time it was two elegant ladies and one gentleman, about thirty years old, playing with abandon. They were not put off by Mrs. Snyder, who almost choked on a biscuit, nor by Mr. Shipper, who slid off his chair and landed sideways in a flower planter. They just paused briefly and calmly resumed playing once the problem was taken care of as opposed to the pianist who once kept playing as if nothing were the matter as Mrs. Haringa was being resuscitated. A staff member finally had to shout at him to stop, even though at that point it no longer made any difference to Haringa. After the performance, a group of us found ourselves gathered round a table. Evert Dyker, who, when all's told, prefers Engelbert Humperdinck, Effia Brandt, Edward Schirmer, Grietje de Boer, Graham Gorter, and I, Hendrik Groom. The talk turned to the chronic dearth of distractions. Graham then suggested that if there was not enough in the way of diversion within the home, we should seek it on the outside, on a more regular basis. We'll just have the minibus drive up to the front twice a month to take us somewhere. If all six of us at this table participate and each comes up with a plan for four outings, then we'll have twenty-four school trips per year. That's something to look forward to, don't you think? He was absolutely right. 
and at Greecher's suggestion, it was decided to meet in the common room tonight for the inaugural meeting of the Old But Not Dead Club. I can't wait. Wednesday, the 20th of February. I had high hopes, and they came true. It was an exciting inaugural session. The laughter was loud, the enthusiasm great, and the alcohol, for us, abundant. Everett had supplied red wine, white wine, and gin. After a lengthy and lively meeting, the following charter was adopted by unanimous consent. 1. The goal of the club is to increase the enjoyment of advanced age by arranging outings. 2. The outings will set off at 11 a.m. on a Monday, Wednesday, Thursday or Friday. 3. No whining allowed. 4. The organiser must take into account the various infirmities. 5. The organiser must take into account the limits of the state pension. 6. The organiser will not divulge more information about the trip beforehand than strictly necessary. 7. Outside of points 2 to 6, anything goes. 8. This club is closed. No new members until further notice. If necessary, Effia will put her laptop at the disposal of the person charged with choosing a destination, and she will shortly give a Googling for Beginners course so that everyone can learn how to search for information. Graham will take on the first outing, followed by Effia, Gretia, me, Ebert and Edward. You could see everyone feverishly beginning to plot and scheme. Opinions are divided on whether it was fate or coincidence, but be that as it may, it was an extraordinarily happy combination of circumstances that this particular group of six people just happened to be gathered round one table on Monday afternoon. They are all jolly nice, intelligent, and most important, not a whiner among them. Thursday, the 21st of February. As if it were a teenager's party that got out of hand. We'd stay downstairs until about 11pm, and we may have been laughing just a bit too boisterously at most. Nonetheless, the following notice appeared on the board yesterday afternoon. In response to several complaints about the noise, the management has decided that from Monday to Friday... The conversation lounge will close at 22.30 in order to guarantee an undisturbed night's rest for all. Furthermore, residents are reminded to abide by the agreed two drinks per person maximum. I was never asked by anyone to agree to a two-drink maximum. Prohibition looms. And Evert has promptly declared that he will take on the Al Capone role and organise the bootleg operation. The old but not dead club is riled, up in arms, and extremely motivated. It wasn't cops, tear gas, or Twitter. A note on a notice board was enough. Ta, very much, management. Edward Shermer surprised all of us by coming out of his shell. Normally he doesn't say much because he is hard to understand on account of the stroke. But just now, at tea time, in front of quite a gathering of residents downstairs, he stood up and in a loud, slurred voice demanded to know who had complained about the noise. The room immediately went quiet. Then Edward explained vociferously and with great difficulty which is what made it so impressive, that he was sorry the plaintiffs had not come to him first, or to one of the others who had been up late the night before. Still nobody said a word. We may assume, then, that it was not anyone who is here now, he deduced, sitting down again. Effia looked round the circle with a benevolent smile. 
It is indeed a pity that we don't have the guts to raise these issues among ourselves, like adults. With that, she fixed a lengthy and pointed gaze at Mrs. Surman, who grew quite agitated. I didn't do it, she volunteered. Do what? Complain. Well, that's lucky then, isn't it? Effia accompanied this with a most beatific smile. She must have seen or heard something. I don't know if I should ask her about it or not. Friday the 22nd of February Asteroid strikes? Spontaneously combusting solar panels? Horsemeat lasagna? The return of Berlusconi? Any of these disasters could happen while we're still alive. The real terror that has gripped the home for the last two days, however, is of being put out on the street if you're not disabled enough. The announcement that 800 of the 2,000 nursing homes in the Netherlands will have to close their doors by the year 2020 is causing great concern. People who are only mildly symptomatic will just have to manage on their own. Several housemates have immediately begun embellishing their own infirmities just in case, so that seven years from now they'll be allowed to stay put. Dear people, let me reassure you, in seven years' time, everyone here will either be dead or terminally disabled. That's what I wanted to yell at them. Old people and their completely irrational fears. And if you're unwilling to sit and wait quietly until you get kicked out of your room, why not apply to 50-plus to be trained as a politician? They're looking for candidates for local and provincial councils and the national or European parliaments. 50-plus seems to be going up in the polls. It should provide plenty of entertainment, watching all those doddery political novices being allowed to weigh in on this, that and the other. My GP is a strange fellow. When I asked him how he thought I was overall, he asked, What would you like me to tell you? Well, I, I should like you to tell me that I'm fit as a fiddle. But perhaps a bit more realistically, how long do I have left? Approximately. You could hang on for years if everything goes well, but it could also be over for you by the next quarter. Who uses the phrase, the next quarter, in this context? No one, except Dr. Ohms. Not only that, it made him laugh heartily, too. When I said that he hadn't offered a very clear answer, he laughed again. And since he seemed to be in such a good mood, I plucked up the courage to ask him if he'd been the one to send the social work around to ask about my suicide plans. He even seemed to find that funny, too. Indeed. <laughs> I thought there's no harm in checking it out. <laughs> Lovely girl, isn't she? And in the same breath, well, until next time. A minute later, I found myself standing outside again, nonplussed and none the wiser. It's an old lesson, but one that I've had to learn all over again. Before going to the doctor, always jot down all your questions and be sure to go over the list with him, item by item. Saturday the 23rd of February The Old Rebels Club is meeting at Effia's for a Google lesson tonight. The halls are already abuzz. Mrs. Bacon has been fishing for an invite. Oh, how nice. I've always wanted to learn how to Google. But there's a strict door policy, and Bacon does not qualify. She is suspected of having told on Mrs. Brinkman for keeping her old dachshund under the sink. Everyone is innocent until proven guilty. But if there's the slightest doubt, you're out. I have asked Effia if she knew who had complained about the noise on Tuesday. She said she had overheard Mrs. Sermon tell her neighbour that she'd lodged a complaint with management. 
We can't be 100% certain since we don't know what a complaint was about, but there is definitely reason to suspect her. Yesterday, Cook received a request for horse steak to be added to the menu. Preferably a milk-fed foal, and please nothing force-fed, read the anonymous note. At least that was the rumour, and that rumour led to yet another lively debate at the dinner table about which animals one should eat and which should be eschewed. Everett wondered if a monkey sandwich might be an option. That took up another quarter of an hour. I'm going up to bed for a while. I'm feeling exhausted. Don't ask me why. And I want to be fit for tonight. Sunday, the 24th of February. There was plenty of cursing as people drew open their curtains this morning. More snow. Cursing of a mild calibre, I assure you, along the lines of dash it all. But it's true that we are fed up with winter. We'd really appreciate some warming sun for our old bones. Not too warm, naturally. No hotter than 22 degrees or thereabouts. It's a narrow window. While I wasn't looking, Hank Kroll, the saviour, jumped up to twenty-four seats in the polls. Fifty-plus will be seeing to it that the Netherlands' old-age pensioners aren't ripped off any further. They have it in for us because there's nothing we can do about it. We can't go on strike or anything. We've got no one to stick up for us. Victim is the role meant for the sad old croc. It's lucky not everyone joins in the chorus of wailing. The female residents think Hank's attractive. Certainly, he's often seen wearing a lovely scarf. He could just squeak by, age-wise, as the ideal son-in-law. If it weren't for the fact that he's queer. We had a very pleasant Google evening last night. Everett pronounces it jugling. And now several of the other inmates are under the impression that we're learning to juggle. Someone asked when we'd be putting on a show. Graham? When we have the balls. Excellent refreshments and pleasant company. Eptia, the charming hostess, Everett, always the loud mouth, but this time not too loud, drank in moderation. Edward, who doesn't say much, but when he does, it's worth listening to. Graham, ruminative, still rather bashful. And finally, Greecher, the evening's revelation, on account of her remarkable computer know-how, brought to light in all modesty. In consultation with Effia, Greecher graciously took command, and we spent over two hours practising, searching for information, using examples suggested by the others. In coming up with examples, no one divulged his or her plans for eventual outings. Everett wanted to find out about Amsterdam's bungee-jumping possibilities. Edward said he wasn't coming, because bungee-jumping was so 2012. It's a shame no one else heard him say it. Monday the 25th of February. Mrs. Stelbergen has asked Effia to come to her office on Wednesday. Effia seems quite unconcerned. Perhaps she is just a cool customer, or perhaps she doesn't want to make a big song and dance about it. I myself would be rather a wreck if I received an invitation of that sort. I can't imagine that Stelbergen just wants to ask her how she likes it here. Our director is a crafty sort, gracious on the outside, but power-hungry to the nth degree. Always so sympathetic, deeply sorry, but it's the rules. Usually her own rules. She finds it convenient to hide behind them, and, if necessary, a new rule will suddenly pop up in the resident's best interest. She is clever enough to see to it there is no outright abuse. Minor infractions are hushed up or the blame pinned on others. Protected by the board of directors, her throne is secure. 
A temporary throne she'll trade for a bigger model as soon as she gets the chance, I'm telling you. She's always impeccably dressed and is invariably friendly, calm and polite. She hears and controls everything. She has faithful accomplices. Some are known to us, but there must be some working undercover. She's running a suffocating regime on the QT. Every personal initiative, anything that falls outside the norm, is shot down with a smile. I asked Effia if she would like me to go with her. What for? she said. Well, she's a tough customer. She destroys people with a sweet smile. We shall see. Thanks for the warning. I'll keep it in mind. Tuesday, the 26th of February. Everett was wondering if it wasn't time for another covert action along the lines of the cake in the fish tank. He wouldn't mind having another lark. This joint could use a good shake-up. I couldn't really disagree, but I'm afraid that this sort of stunt really only goes after the superficial symptoms. The real problem is insoluble. The way I see it, growing old follows the same trajectory as a baby developing into an adult, only the other way round. You go from physical independence to becoming more and more dependent on others. An artificial hip, a bypass, a pill here or there, all it does is paper over the cracks. If death takes too long to come... You end up as a sputtering old toddler in a nappy with a runny nose. The voyage out from zero to eighteen is wonderful, challenging, exciting. You are about to make your own way in life. Round the age of forty, you're strong, healthy and powerful in the prime of life. Sadly, you usually don't come to that realisation until the descent has already begun as, slowly and noiselessly, your horizons shrink and life becomes emptier, until your daily goals and ambitions are whittled down to a cup of tea and a biscuit, the old folk's version of the baby's rattle. Forgive me, please, I'm just rattling on. Whereas, in fact... I have just taken a few important steps towards going down having a blast with new friends and wild plans. Whoopee! Wednesday, the 27th of February. I'm writing this a bit later than usual because I was waiting to hear how Effia's audience with Stellbargen had gone. We had a cup of coffee together beforehand, and when she left, I wished her luck. She returned fifteen minutes later. There was something sternly resolute about her, but don't ask me what made me think that. Her eyes, perhaps? Compliments on your perceptive prognosis, Hank. It didn't miss the mark. She told me that Mrs. Stelbargen had started off by inquiring how she was, and then almost casually, mentioned that it wasn't customary in our home to receive guests late at night. Do you mean me? Effie had asked in response. It's nothing personal, but in view of the need for peace and quiet, we don't like to have people wandering the corridors after ten o'clock or so. I've never noticed any excessive noise myself. Other people have. That's a shame, but what does this have to do with me, anyway? I heard that you entertained some guests a few days ago. Yes, I did. Very calm and civilized people. I asked my neighbors the next day if they had been bothered by it, but they had not, fortunately. This was great. I gave Effia a high-five. The first high-five of my life, actually. Where that came from, I had no idea. Stellbargen had seemed a bit put out, but when she said goodbye to Effia, she was all smiles, as if there were no tension between them at all. This isn't over, Hendrik, said Effia. 
I feel it in my bones. We took a little stroll through the garden. There's a touch of spring in the air. The snowdrops are poking their heads up through the plastic litter and rusting tins. We're feeling combative. At least I think I can speak for her as well. Thursday the 28th of February. I picked up a brochure downstairs about mobility scooters. I must broaden my range, otherwise I'll wind up being old but not dead's weakest link. Graham has announced that the first outing will take place on Thursday the 14th of March. We'll assemble at 1300 in the entrance hall. I've been racking my brain about fun day trips. I haven't come up with anything besides the Rice Museum, and that's certainly not going to win any prizes for originality. Besides which, that museum seems to be closed more often than it is open. But no need to panic. I have six weeks to think of something more exciting. Effie played me a bit of her double CD, Top 100 Bird Songs. And number six was The Garden Warbler. Never heard it, nor heard of it. At number five, The Wren. At number four, Robin Redbreast. I always thought that ticking call was the only sound they made. At number three, The Song Thrush. Number two was The Nightingale with a great reputation in poetry and song. And the gold medal goes to the blackbird. Finally, a bird whose whistle I recognise. And then there are ninety-four more whistling blowhards to go, to each her own. After ten birds, if you could tell my attention was waning. Aren't you just fascinated? she asked wickedly. I blushed. Oh, yeah, I am. If I may be so bold, I don't believe you, Hendrick. Well, yeah, you're right, I'm sorry, but birds only really interest me when they've been roasted, and at that point they're generally no longer singing. It made her laugh, luckily. What about the bulb gardens at Kokenhoff? Would that be something worthwhile? Chances are someone else has thought of it, but six weeks from now would be the perfect time of year for it. Friday, the 1st of March. Mr. Kuiper found a newspaper article in a cuttings file in the library and pinned it on the notice board. Doctors in favour of removing kidneys from terminal patients while still alive. Mrs. Bransma immediately cancelled the date for her surgery. Just leave that fibroid right where it is. I won't have them helping themselves to whatever they like in there. After all, we're all terminal in here, she cried. And she does have a point. The average age, I believe, is 89. So when you say terminal, you're talking about a high probability. The reason for removing organs from patients that aren't dead yet is that they are fresher. I don't know if you can call ours fresh, exactly. The average age of the kidneys in here is, of course, also 89. I'm not sure how it works with the expiry dates of internal organs. It's a bit grim, really, that article. You better not hope for a medical miracle. So you survive a terminal heart attack against the odds, and then it turns out they've removed both your kidneys. Mobility scooters aren't as straightforward as you'd think. They come in all shapes and sizes. You have to decide how tight a turning circle you want, for example, which is important to know if you want to be able to turn it around in your own room. The range, how far do you want to be able to go? Three wheels or four? How tippy is it? Can it capsize? Also of some importance, how fast do you want it to go? And finally, the most important factor for a Dutchman, what does a thing like that cost? I'll have a word with Mr. Hoogdalen shortly. He's very knowledgeable, and a nice chap, too. Saturday the 2nd of March 
The woman from Breda, who escaped from prison by digging a tunnel with a spoon, has yet to be caught. It's great to know that such things can still happen in real life. What if an OAP were to escape from this institution the same way? Now, that would be brilliant, just for the symbolism, naturally, since he or she could also just walk out the front door. The hard part comes afterwards, since most of the inmates here have nowhere to go. Their children would certainly have no part in it. Hello, son, I've come to live with you. Sorry, Pa, but that's just not convenient right now. The fugitive OAP doesn't have many options, other than a hotel on the Failua. Then, once the money's all gone, it's back to the old age home of the Salvation Army with your tail between your legs. Incidentally, here in the Netherlands, there are 13,000 people missing from prison. That's quite a number. The police aren't very good at finding them, apparently. The old noggin is failing. Senility light is gradually turning into senility moderate. I was trying to recall the top ten bird songs, but couldn't get past the first four. What surprises me is that some people can't remember a shopping list with three items on it but are able to sing along to 10,000 songs on the radio, or at least hum them. All those tunes stored away intact. Music and memory, they must be linked somehow. They ought to set German vocabulary lists or the first law of thermodynamics to music. Or write a musical based on the important dates of Dutch history. Sunday, the 3rd of March. Yesterday, a rack from Kring, the chemists, appeared downstairs in reception with some 50 different information leaflets. Allow me to give just a sample of the uplifting topics. Hemorrhoids, diarrhoea, eczema, head lice, incontinence, boils, constipation, athlete's foot, worms and warts. Every ailment under the sun neatly arranged in alphabetical order. And without regard for the audience in here, because I also noticed leaflets on acne and postnatal care. Matters of no great concern to us. As if there's not enough talk in this place about aches and infirmities. All right, to be perfectly honest, I did slip the incontinence leaflet as unobtrusively as I could into my breast pocket. It seems that I'm in good company. There are about a million other Dutch dribblers, which means enough urine is collected in our citizens' underpants and nappies to fill an entire swimming pool every day. Yippee! There's a great deal of speculation and fishing about where our first old but not dead outing will take us. Everett wants to set himself up as a bookie so that people can place bets on it. The excitement is akin to the feeling you had as a kid the night before a school trip. If I remember it right, that is. Mrs. Schruder, of the Hoovered Canary, was wondering who's in charge now in Vatican City. The old Pope has stepped down and the new one hasn't been chosen yet. We are a church without a shepherd, she declared. Like a chicken without a head, said one of the Slothauer sisters. Never shy about pushing someone's buttons. I'm trying to picture the conclave. 115 elderly cardinals in one room, not allowed to set foot outside until they've sent the white smoke wafting up the chimney. And that's easier said than done. During the 1978 conclave, the fireplace didn't draw well, and the room filled up with black smoke. Monday the 4th of March. A huge panic. Mrs. Shah has escaped from the dementia unit. It seems she persuaded a new intern that she was allowed out without an escort. The intern's excuse is that her own IQ is somewhere around 55. Mrs. Shah graciously swept out the front door. She believes she's nobility. She introduces herself as Lady Shah, always on the lookout for her estates. Crazy as a loon. 
and a diabetic, too. A good portion of the staff were sent out to look for her. Someone asked Stellwagen if the police shouldn't be called in. No, that's not necessary. There's no reason. The director is terrified of negative publicity and likes to keep the dirty laundry under her hat. A short time later, the floor manager announced that Mrs. Shaw had been found, probably a fib, to make everyone calm down, because Shaw was nowhere to be seen. Evert put the story to the test by casually telling a nurse that he had seen Lady Shaw standing at the bus stop. Two minutes later, a couple of staffers were seen heading for the very same stop. That said it all. Forty-five minutes later, Sister Compostela, a dear with an unpronounceable Spanish name, came and told us that Mrs. Shaw had been found. But wasn't she already home, safe and sound? asked Mr. Brentians. Yes, but now she really is, the nurse said brightly. Five minutes later, the Baroness was led in through the back door, spackled with mud. She later explained that she had been held up by the hunt on her estate. It turned out that she slipped and fell in the mud in a little park two kilometres from here, and was unable to get up again by herself. A man walking his dog found her and alerted the police. The officers who brought her back spent at least twenty minutes in Stelbargen's office. Afterwards, all residents were urgently requested not to spread any gossip about the incident, for our own good. Stelbargen made a point of stopping by Everts' armchair to tell him Mrs. Shaw had not been on any bus. I, I never said she was, sister. I only saw her standing at the bus stop. I am not your sister, and I have my doubts about what you saw. I would advise you to be more circumspect in future. Everett, who calls everyone who works here sister or brother, was ready with a retort. To be even more circumspect than I already am? Impossible, Mrs. Sister. Stelbargen hesitated a moment, then turned and walked away. Later, some of the staff went round asking if anyone had noticed if Mr. Diker had stepped outside at all today. He had. Mr. Evert Diker isn't an idiot. Tuesday the 5th of March Interesting discussion at tea time yesterday afternoon, sparked by the finding that scientists have managed to connect the brains of two rats separated by a distance of several kilometres. The question was, whose brain would you want to have linked to yours if you had the choice? Many of the parents among us chose one of their offspring. I don't think that if it were the other way round, a child would enjoy peeking inside his father's or mother's head. Mrs. Brantsma chose Tom Jones. Fat Backer would like to give Obama a piece of his mind. I couldn't think of anyone myself. Frightening idea. Some outsider poking about inside your head. Great disappointment for a number of residents. They weren't able to reserve a minibus for the coronation on the 30th of April. The bus company won't put on an extra bus to drive them to the royal palace. They are now trying to line up transportation to the banks of the River A in hope of catching a glimpse of the royal couple as they sail past. Mrs. Hoekstraten has already bought herself a pricey pair of binoculars. She has begged God to let her make it to the 30th of April, and to see in the new Pope as well. She even asked me to pray for her. Sadly for Mrs. Hoekstraten, God and I have long agreed to stay out of each other's business. A bank was robbed by two thieves disguised as old people. Latex masks and all. Would it be a laugh if the men under those masks were actually OAPs? Wednesday the 6th of March. The first sunny day of the year is the best. Yesterday afternoon I spent 45 minutes sitting on the bench at the front entrance. I was the first one there. 
Not long after, the bench was full. A few envious latecomers paced up and down, waiting for us to leave. <laughs> Tough luck. As the years ratchet up, everything else slows down. Walking, eating, talking, thinking, reading, too. It takes me three to four days to get through all the Sunday supplements, if I don't want to fall behind on the daily paper. I finally got round to reading a special section on ageing yesterday. It's something I've noticed before. Old age seems to be in fashion these days. The babies born right after the war are retiring. A few years from now, it will be the hippie generation's turn. The age group that's in power now has discovered one important thing. You have to take good care of yourself. No one needs to spend much time worrying about those so-called OAPs for another fifteen years at least. These over-fifties don't in any way resemble the over-eighties, for whom this home is the penultimate resting place. We are the ones who learn to take good care of others, namely our own kids, now in the prime of their lives. We're feeling rather neglected by those kids at the moment, actually. Many of my fellow residents wound up in here constrained by circumstance, too old and infirm to continue living independently, and too poor to hire the help they needed. They have had to come to terms with the prospect of living out their sunset years in an old age home. After a while, the phrase, old age home, began making people feel uneasy. It was replaced with retirement community. The nursing home became a care home. The care home became a care centre. And in the latest version, it seems I am enrolled in a market-oriented health services organisation providing individually tailored care. I now understand why health care costs keep rocketing. Thursday, the 7th of March. I took a head count once. We have 160 old-age pensioners living in here, give or take. Connected to this care centre is a nursing unit that has about another 80 befuddled or seriously impaired geriatric patients. I can't give you an exact number because there's a constant revolving door of the living and the dead. I would estimate that when they arrive, a person has on average about five years left to live. So, if you count the care centre and the nursing home together, that works out to some 50 deaths a year. If you grow to a very old age in here and remain on your feet, you may have to attend as many as 500 burials or cremations in the last ten years of your life. A lovely prospect. This morning, I couldn't find my keys anywhere. Turned my entire room, including the bed alcove, upside down, small as it is. Luckily, I wasn't in any hurry. I must have searched for an hour, without swearing, almost. Finally, to discover the keys. In the fridge. Absent-mindedness. Old people, like children, are always losing things, but they no longer have a mum to tell them where to look. Friday the 8th of March Having broached the subject of death just yesterday, I now discover that death has paid a visit to feel good fitness. Mrs. DeLeo announced, I don't feel so good. And two minutes later, she was no longer feeling fit either. She sat slumped in her chair and didn't catch the ball that was thrown at her. Pay attention, Mrs. DeLeo, Tina, the exercise teacher, chided her. Then Mrs. DeLeo slid off her chair onto the floor. They tried to resuscitate her. The defibrillator was brought in, but all in vain. The dreadful Slothauer sisters stood there gaping fascinated until someone told them to move out of the way. 
Later, during coffee, they gave us a blow by blow of what they'd seen. Given the chance, those slot hours would happily be spectators at a public execution. Mrs. DeLeo's passing put a bit of a damper on the cheerful mood brought on by several days of springtime weather. Some inmates won't set a foot outside the door if it is at all cold or wet. So, in the spring, at the first sign of a bit of sunshine, there's a good deal of rapturous outdoor strolling. The announcement yesterday that we may have snow again in four days' time led to even greater zeal for taking a constitutional. I wanted to go for a walk with Effia, but she wasn't home. So I had to make do with my mate, Ebert. Upon entering his room, I found him snipping at his nose hairs with a pair of nail scissors. I was a bit embarrassed, but Ebert kept at it, taking his time. Even with me standing there, we weren't allowed to go out until he had finished trimming his ears. You never know who you might bump into, was his explanation. Saturday the 9th of March. I am ill. I'll spare you the unappetizing details. I hope to have recovered by Thursday, the day of our first excursion. Wednesday the 13th of March. It was touch and go, but I'm going to make it. The members of the club were wondering if the outing should be postponed, but it isn't necessary. I am back on my feet. The GP came to see me on Monday. He casually let on that it looked a bit like the Mexican flu to him. A few years ago, the entire country was in uproar over that flu, and you couldn't switch on the radio or telly without having to listen to some epidemiologist. Yet now that I may actually have it, my GP can't even be bothered to give me a proper diagnosis. One of the nurses, later sternly, asked whether... When I told the other residents that I had the flu, I would please leave the word Mexican out of it. Who told you to say that? She couldn't tell me. It does make you wonder. Could Mrs. DeGan's death a month ago possibly have been due to bird flu? They are probably worried about another wave of flu hysteria among us. Yesterday, Ebert stopped by with a fruit basket, an empty egg carton sporting three kiwis and three clementines. Effia brought me a book, 500 poems everyone should read. I vowed to read one a day, in the fervent hope that I am granted another 500 days. On my GP's advice, I have made an appointment with a geriatrician. My potpourri of ailments was something his confrère would be interested in. He pronounced the word confrère with a rather plummy accent. He wrote a note to his amici and showed it to me. It said, in essence, Why don't you see if there's something you can do for this nice old gentleman? They have an opening for me as early as next week. There may be a monetary consideration. Old people have to be seen in a hurry, or they might die before you've even made a cent. Once they're dead, the only one who stands to make a profit is the undertaker. My personal GP, says the geriatrician, is a personable chap. I can't wait. Friday the 15th of March. At 12.55... Five minutes early, the Connection minibus drove up to the front, and our group climbed in. We were a bit giddy. It wasn't even three minutes before the peppermints were offered round. Fifty minutes later, we got out at Central Station, where a water taxi awaited us. After a few minutes on the water, Everett made a pretense of feeling seasick, quite realistically, I must say and then told us about a man he used to know, a frequent traveller, who collected the air sickness bags from all the airlines he'd flown on. Then ever proceeded to imitate Mr. Bean, who, clueless as to what those airbags are for, blows up one that's been used until it bursts in someone's face. 
Effia tut-tutted and suggested taking a vote on whether to expel Ebert from the club. Ebert was visibly alarmed until Effia started guffawing at his crestfallen expression. I'm not fond of that hee-hawing laugh of hers, but it is the only negative I have found in her thus far. After tootling along Amsterdam's canals for an hour or so, we arrived at the Hermitage Museum on the Amstel, where we disembarked. A posh chap, who was very knowledgeable about art, and seemed to assume we were equally keen to learn about it, gave us a lengthy tour of the place. Then we stopped for beer, wine, and a portion of Bitterballen, in a cafe along the Amstel. That's where the old people's minibus came to pick us up, just after half-past five. The driver, in the habit of driving cranky old geezers to and from hospital, seemed rather surprised at having to flush a gang of merrymakers out of a pub. Punctually at six o'clock, on the dot, we sat down at the dining table for a repast of meatballs and endive. The six of us were in high spirits, in contrast to the prevailing mood. Mrs. Delvagen, on her way from her office to the exit, raised an eyebrow as we pushed our way past her. I may be wrong, but I do think I detected a measure of disapproval in her eyes. Graham was lauded nearly unintelligibly by Edward for raising the bar so high on our very first outing. Oh, such a toe! You set the tone. Graham did the simultaneous interpretation, since he's the one who has the least trouble understanding Edward. A touching exchange. Ango. No, thank you. After that, we all collapsed a bit. By eight o'clock, the entire old but not dead club had gone up to bed. So the gossiping could presumably begin. Saturday the 16th of March. We seem to have caught the bug. Now there's a plan to start a separate cooking club alongside Old But Not Dead. The original members, except one, Everett, bolstered by the addition of Ria and Antoine Travimundi, like the idea of serving up an elaborate and elegant meal once a month. The Travamundis ran a restaurant for many years. They are passionate about preparing food as well as consuming it, and all too often find themselves getting up from the table disappointed. I am expecting great things of them. My own culinary talents run more to elementary tasks like dicing, slicing and stirring. Yesterday we were sitting on the table, happily rehashing our first outing, when Ria and Antoine timidly came to ask if they might join us. Of course. They told us they thought our excursion club was a lovely idea. Not that they expected us to invite them to join, naturally. But would we be interested in forming a group to cook and dine together from time to time? Once a month, for example? The object would be to come up with some very special concoctions. Just the suggestion brought a gleam to many an eye. Except Everts. He came right out and declared he wasn't keen on fancy nosh and hated having anything more complicated to concoct than a fried egg. The rest of the group ignored him. The remaining five of us liked the idea of fine cuisine, as proposed by Antoine. It was decided that Antoine, Ria, and I would ask for a meeting with Stellwagen to obtain permission to use the kitchen once a month. I'm getting to be quite busy in my old age. Sunday the 17th of March. We have a new Pope. According to an unreliable source, the Slothauer sisters, prayers were said in the meditation room this morning for him and for good weather. Some just pray for good weather. I don't think I should count on those prayers being heard. I'll keep my winter coat handy a while longer. As far as the new Pope goes, he has my sympathy for now, since when he was a cardinal, he used to take the bus to work, or the metro. 
I imagine he must have had to doff his mitre, getting off or on. Actually, some scepticism is in order where dignitaries are concerned. The British politician, David Cameron, used to ride his bike to his parliamentary job out of concern for the environment, but had his briefcase follow him in the ministerial limousine. The folk in here are especially pleased for our Queen Maxima, since this one's an Argentinian Pope. They expect that Pope Francis, being a compatriot of hers, will surely attend her husband's coronation. For those of us that never have any visitors, Sundays are not a particularly joyful prospect. The pleasures that once made the day something to look forward to, such as sleeping late, having a big breakfast, reading the papers, or listening to music, are now the daily routine. The only thing that distinguishes Sunday from any other day for me is that it's the day the other inmates receive visitors. It is true that many of the visitors come with just one goal in mind, to get it over with as quickly as possible. Any interaction with other residents is a waste of time. A curt hello in the hall or common room is about the most one can expect. Not so very long ago, I used to take long walks on Sunday afternoons, but I can't do that anymore. Monday the 18th of March Delvagen thought it was just a lovely idea, the cookery club. She said she would take it to the various parties involved and discuss with them our request to use the kitchen once a month. She promised to get back to us shortly. Then we were offered a cup of tea and a biscuit. After some chit-chat, she glanced at her watch. My, is that the time? Which means your time is up. Sometimes I do wonder. A cookery club, isn't that a bit sissy? But on the other hand, if you can't be bothered to give things that don't immediately interest you a chance, you risk being an old stick in the mud. At least it's something to do. Three more nights beauty sleep, and then I'll have made it to another spring. In the coming days, I'll do some spring cleaning, wipe down the fridge, clean out the kitchen cupboards, Switch my winter wardrobe over to summer, keeping gloves and a heavy sweater out, just in case. Pop round to Everts yesterday afternoon. He had invited me in for drinks, but when I got there at four o'clock, he already had a healthy head start on me. Half an hour later, he dozed off in his chair. I tucked a blanket round him, fed the dog, and took it out for a walk, leaving a note on the dresser among the deceased relatives. Had a lovely time, and thanks for the hundred euros. Tuesday the 19th of March The geriatrician is a candidate for geriatric care himself, aged well into his sixties and weighing on the high side at least 120 kilograms by my estimation. A cheerful demeanour, which I consider a plus when it comes to positions, Bad news is far more devastating when it's delivered in a funereal voice. Not that he had bad news for me, this Dr. Young. <laughs> What's in a name? Not to worry, but it wasn't exactly good news, either. A number of organs are either nearing their expiry date or already past it. The joints exhibit disturbing wear and tear. The prostate is beyond repair. The lungs are heavily tarred and working at half strength, and the heart is bad. One boon, the mind, is sharp enough to be conscious of the decline. No sign of Alzheimer's, at most a little forgetfulness that's normal in old age. Well, thank you, Doctor. He gave this summation with a twinkle in his eye, cracking the odd joke, and concluding with the remark that he could empathise, since he suffered from almost as many ailments himself. He roared with laughter as he said it. If he hadn't, that would have been something, wouldn't it? A doctor complaining to a patient about his own health. He prescribed some new pills, and stopped just short of letting me decide for myself how many to take. 
Physicians are so good at what they do these days that you hardly ever see anyone who's healthy, is how he ended the consultation. I had to think that one over. As I was leaving, I plucked up the courage to ask if he didn't have any mood-enhancing drugs to give me, some good dope to get through the difficult days. He, in turn, had to think that one over. I should have made another appointment right then and there. Wednesday the 20th of March. This morning, the director informed us, myself and Mananduria Travamundi, that the Cookery Club project is not going to fly because of labour regulations. Alas, alas, she added, sighing. Funny, but I didn't for a moment. Believe she was sorry. What sort of labour regulations? I asked. She gave us some complicated explanation about who's allowed to do what and who isn't. It all came down to the fact that we were not permitted to touch the kitchen appliances. The home would not be insured against accidents. I objected that we had no intention of using the kitchen appliances. All we needed were a few pans and knives. Yes, but it isn't that simple. Even for us to be in the same room as those kitchen appliances entails an insurance risk, said Stellwagen. Could I have a look at those labour regulations? I asked, as neutrally as possible. Don't you believe me, Mr. Groan? Of course I do. I just want to double-check something. Double-check what? As any manager today will tell you, to double-check is not to distrust. Isn't that so? I'll see what I can do. Thank you. Ria and Antoine had been sitting there listening, open-mouthed. Only now did they close their mouths again. By tea-time they had somewhat recovered. They had always trusted the director in the past, but their faith was now rather shaken. They thought it had been courageous of me to challenge her. And I thought so, too. I later reported our exchange to Effia. I hoped, without sounding overly self-satisfied. All she said was, Well done, Groan. The incident did inspire me with a great idea for an old but not dead outing. I have looked up several different cookery workshops on the Internet in our vicinity. There must be one among them that complies with the labour regulations and is willing to accept old people. Afterwards, we'll announce to anyone who will listen that we have never had such a safe afternoon, even if we come home with a few sliced-off fingers, noses or ears. Thursday, the 21st of March. Hooray! I have made it to another spring. Now we resolutely set our sights on the next milestone, the first strawberries emerging from the cold ground. Then we'll try to make it to the Tour de France, the new herring, the first snowfall, New Year's Eve, and on to the next spring. It's important to set yourself explicit goals. It is the silly season, which here goes by the name of cucumber time. Nothing much happening in the world. The subject of the new Pope has been milked to death. And for want of anything else, Syria is back on the front page because a Dutchman was killed over there. And there's still six weeks of coronation drivel to go. Some 360 ermines gave their lives for Queen Beatrix's coronation robe back in the day. But Prince Pilsner Alexander's considerable girth may require as many as six hundred skins. Pamela Anderson, do something. Save those poor little creatures. Here, in the care home, it's all too often cucumber time. At night you realise that nothing important has happened all day. On the other hand, what's important? For some people, simply being offered an extra biscuit with their cup of tea makes their day. 
Of course, it's the way the nurse doles out another biscuit that does it. As if you've just won the national lottery. Oh, what the hell, it's such a lovely day. Let's just go for it. Have another one. At the other end of the spectrum, we have fat Mr. Backer. His record, one entire Limburg apple crumb cake and half of a second cake, washed down with a single cup of coffee. He didn't offer anyone a bite. When he was done, he took the leftover cake back up to his room. Everyone hates him. I have, meanwhile, come up with a nice little list of excursion possibilities. A cookery class, a paranormal exhibition, bowling, the windmills of Zandam, a course in fine chocolate making, a football game at Ajax Stadium, or the Kokenhof Tulip Gardens. I must ask at the next meeting whether we can switch the dates, if necessary. In honour of cucumber time, I give you this from the old cuttings box in the how-can-that-be-possible category. Some years ago, Berlusconi was presented with an award for his human rights record by none other than Muammar Gaddafi. Friday the 22nd of March Yesterday, Mrs. Langefeld told me something interesting. She's usually well below my radar, but occasionally she will startle me by popping up into view. We happened to be sitting next to each other over a cup of coffee. Sparked by the mention that the coffee was lukewarm, she said she suspected that our home isn't high on the list of top care institutions. Oh, they surely have been keen to let everyone know. I asked what list she was talking about, and she lisped toothlessly that there is an annual review of the quality of nursing and care homes. And judging from this dick's brought up coffee, you can be sure that we are somewhere very near the bottom. She didn't know exactly what kind of review it was. I'm going to look it up on the internet. The oldest man in the Netherlands is now Chirt Apema, 106. If I were to reach his age, I'd be looking at another 23 years in this dump. Not a happy thought. The oldest woman in the world is 122. To match that... I'd have to spend another 39 years in here. It could be worse. In America, Carrie C. White turned 116 before she died, 75 of those years in a mental institution. They let her transfer to a normal old-age home when she was 110, giving her some time to enjoy her freedom. Saturday, the 23rd of March. You type Care Home Review, click on a few links, and voila, there is the list of 350 nursing homes and 1,260 care homes. The ranking depends on the rating given to the home by its residents, plus an objective grade for the quality of care. We are in almost 1,000th place on both counts. In the overall standings, that lands us just above 1,100. These are the numbers for 2009, so our home may score an even higher number today. Or an even lower one. It depends how you look at it. Why have I never known of the existence of such a list? Of course, I do understand why our director hasn't put it up on the notice board. At Hofkamp, in Almelo, it's probably pinned up on every door. That one's in first place. I'm going to ask my friends if they remember how this investigation was conducted at the time. It may be something for us to start disseminating now. Leaving that aside, the list reveals some arresting facts. The care home God's Providence in Herten is in 1,230th place. Apparently they're leaving a bit too much up to Providence. Also noteworthy, the residence of Angeli Custodes 
proudly voted their home into second place. But according to the objective assessment, it stands at number 702. I wonder if management might have given the residents a little assistance here and there, filling in the questionnaires. You can never be too suspicious. And what is going on with Spathodia Court? The residents there put their home in 1,058th place, while the inspectors have it at a respectable number four. Ought one to infer that that's where the Netherlands' grumpiest ingrates live out their sunset years? Henk, fifty-plus crawl, has bollocked it up for himself a bit here. Mr. Backer, if you can't stop his own queer sex shops from going under, how can that bloke run Netherlands Limited? I'm fascinated by that Netherlands Limited. Yesterday, I counted how many times I heard in so many words that it's ever so cold for this time of year. Thirty-five. Sunday, the 24th of March. Effia has a folder in which she collects articles about elder abuse in care homes and nursing homes. Some of those institutions leave their charges wallowing in their own poo more often than not. After reading all the stories about neglect and intimidation, I am inclined to appreciate our own home a bit more. Which is daft, of course, since things being worse somewhere else doesn't mean things are any better in here. As if it's a reason to be ecstatic if you don't have to lie there for three days in a loaded nappy. The folder came to light after I asked Effia if she'd ever heard about this ratings list. She had. We discussed the pluses and minuses of our own home at some length. Conclusion? There's work to be done. Proceeding with caution, we shall see what we can achieve. The Economic Policy Bureau has put forward a plan to weigh the costs of care against the actual health benefits. In the case of old people, there is usually little health benefit to be had. A serious operation may result in another year of just muddling through, if that. And then it's curtains for you anyway. So, if you are determined to have yourself patched up no matter what, you are better have quite a bit put away, because you'll have to cop up the money for it yourself. You know, in this string of surgeries for me, Tar, very much, even if I had the money, one thing less to worry about. Old people tend to doze off at times. Mrs. Bregman gave us a masterly example the other day. She fell asleep at dinner with her spoon in her mouth. The custard came dribbling out. I can sympathise. Having trouble keeping your eyes open in the daytime and sleeping poorly at night. Rather inconvenient. Fortunately, the fatigue rarely hits me while I'm eating. The spoon, clattering onto her plate, startled Bregman out of her sleep. She looked up, astonished, mopped the custard off her dress, or rather rubbed it in further, and went on with her dinner as if nothing had happened. Monday, 25th of March. We never talk about non-native citizens or immigrants in here, only about foreigners. Whether they have Dutch citizenship or not makes no difference. Political correctness is a rarity. The Netherlands is a segregated society. White sticks with white. The Turks stick with the Turks. The poor stick with the poor. The ignorant stick with the ignorant. In our case, there's yet another dividing line. Old sticks with old. In our home, the residents are largely white, poor, not very highly educated, old folk. There are two Indonesian ladies and one Pakistani gentleman, and that's it. We have little to nothing in common with the rest of the Netherlands, unless you count the attendants. We do have a relatively large number of immigrants among the staff. Right, dears, they are. I'm not saying they're not, but I'd still rather have a Dutch nurse, is the prevailing attitude. The older we are, the more reactionary. There are quite a few out-and-out racists walking around in here. 
The comments heard in the common room don't lie. We don't see teenagers very often either, unless they're more or less forced by their parents to go visit Gran or Gramps for once. Dutiful visits and stiff exchanges. Teenagers are embarrassed by old people. Old people don't get it. Are hard of hearing. Don't even own a computer. Are slow. Are clueless about fashion and music. And all they have to offer you is a biscuit. Worlds apart. Younger children fare much better. They'll babble away merrily and haven't yet learned to be embarrassed. Old people and toddlers get along famously. Everett has opened a betting shop. It's one euro per wager on where we're going on our next outing, scheduled for the day after tomorrow. The pot goes to the one who guessed correctly. If no one gets it right, the bank keeps the money. The bank is Everett. Hey, <laughs> the old rogue. No one has thrown in any money yet. The excitement grows. Effia remains tight-lipped. Tuesday the 26th of March One of the goals of this diary was to emerge as a minor but notorious whistleblower after I'm gone. That idea has faded into the background a bit. I do notice that writing is having a therapeutic effect on me. I'm feeling more relaxed and less frustrated. It may have come fifty years too late, but there's no use in crying over spilt milk. Mrs. Slark has an unpleasant daughter, who comes for tea once a month, and spends the half hour she's here on a Saturday, sourly informing her mother she has already heard whatever her mother is telling her. I said there's any point in spending that measly half hour berating and correcting your mother of nearly ninety. As long as what she says is coherent, we're ahead. For while Mrs. Slark is certainly no genius, at least she still has her ducks in a row. Wednesday, the 27th of March. I'm sitting here, in my Sunday best, waiting for the outing to begin. Two more hours. Childish excitement. I can't seem to concentrate. I'm just pottering about dropping things. I've already had to get out the vacuum twice, once for a piece of toast with chocolate sprinkles that slid off my plate, and another time for the sugar bowl I elbowed off the table. I don't know if there's a superstition for chocolate sprinkles on the floor, but spilt sugar means you should expect visitors. I'm not in the mood for any visitors right now, so I'll just mosey my way downstairs and wait for the minibus to arrive. Thursday, the 28th of March. Everett couldn't have known how close he was to guessing the destination of our little outing with his betting shop. The casino. We had to be downstairs at one o'clock, well-dressed and with empty stomachs. That was our assignment, as per Effia. Just before our departure, she popped round to tell us to bring along some form of identification. The connection minibus arrived punctually at one, and drove us straight to the Holland Casino on Leidseplein. There we were greeted with some surprise, but great politeness by a handsome young chap. I see that the average age here is more advanced than we are used to. I would therefore expect above average sagacity from you as well. Elegantly put, coming from such a young whippersnapper. We swept in, treading thick carpets like monarchs. We were given a delicious lunch, and then they explained the rules of the games to us. Roulette, blackjack, and one that's much in vogue nowadays, according to our host, Texas Hold'em. With our grey hair, we felt a little out of place at the Texas Hold'em tables. Almost all the other players seemed to be young punks in baseball caps, hoodies, and cool sunglasses. A miniature racetrack featuring toy horses on rails lurching to the finish caused great hilarity. Creature tossed two euros into the slot, punctured in her birth date, and with a great clatter of coins, won back her initial investment twenty-fourfold, when her horse came first across the finish line. 
She doled out her winnings among the rest of us, and we proceeded to turn our full attention to feeding coins into various mystifying machines and playing roulette, since we'd all been given a little purse at the start with a couple of tokens in it. We had made a deal when we'd arrived that we would pool any winnings we made, and when an hour and a half later we emptied our pockets at the bar, it transpired that there was a total of 286 euros in the old but not dead pot. Everyone was jubilant, even the people working there. Apparently, we were a refreshing change from all the strutting young show-offs and inscrutable Chinese. A round on the house for the team from Arfen Drought Hall, shouted the bartender. After three whiskies, Everett wanted to stake the entire 286 euro pot on the number 13, convinced we'd be going home with 10,000 euros in our pockets. Thirteen! I feel it in my bones! We gave his proposal a Calvinistic thumbs down. At 5.15, the manager, personally, came to inform us that the minibus was out front. There were already two other elderly passengers on the bus. They stared at our rowdy group with undisguised disdain. Graham handed them each one euro which they did grudgingly accept nonetheless. Once home again, we felt all eyes on us. The place was simply buzzing with a mixture of envy, admiration, and disgust. Friday the 29th of March The banking crisis has brought back the proverbial old sock. From the comments about the run on the banks in Cyprus, I must conclude that a number of residents have withdrawn their pennies from their bank accounts and stowed them under their mattresses or some other place burglars are sure to look. I've been to see Anya, my office mole, to ask her if she can find out how the quality control survey was handled by the management here. With the greatest pleasure, Hendrik. She already had a gleam in her eye. It would be fantastic if she could dig a few hushed-up reports out of one of Stelbargen's desk drawers. But be careful, Anya, don't take any risks, I urged her. To see the dear get punished for her efforts would break my heart. I would blame myself terribly. I told her so. It's sweet of you to warn me, Hank, but I'm responsible for my own actions. Another cup of coffee? And then she started humming, I Do What I Do, by Astrid Nye. Good Friday. When I was young, we had to observe a moment of silence at three o'clock to think about poor Jesus. If in today's Netherlands a father allowed his son to be nailed to the cross, our forensic psychiatrists would be at a loss as to what to do with the crazy psychopath. They would certainly not allow him to be free on probation. Not if there were other children at home as well. He'd be banned from setting foot in any lumber yard. I'll give God one last chance. If at three o'clock this afternoon I suddenly find myself able to run the hundred-meter dash in 12.4 seconds, I will return to the bosom of the Holy Mother Church. It's a promise. Saturday the 30th of March My fastest time in the 100 metre is currently 1 minute 27 seconds. I timed myself yesterday, Good Friday, at 3 o'clock. I might be a second or so off. It might have been a metre, more or less, but it was close. My one and a half minute sprint required five minutes on a bench to recover. God wrought no miracle. At the hour his son gave up the ghost, he did not give me back my erstwhile fleetness of foot. So he can kiss my return to the church goodbye. God did take Mrs. Schinkel unto himself at the hour of three yesterday. Schinkel was very devout, so I presume she deliberately chose to breathe her last at the same hour as Jesus. I never had much to do with her, but... She did seem a pleasant sort. She is to be buried privately, good. 
That's one obligation less. Pensionado has a nice ring to it. Makes you almost wish you were one of those. But then you'd have to spend the entire winter in Benidorm, playing bool with all the other Dutch pensionados, and sleeping in some of the ugliest hotels in the world for two months. They have Dutch barbers over there, Dutch snack bars and plumbers, and lately they've even opened a Dutch hospital. Were I forced to spend the winter on the Costa Blanca every year, I would sign myself up for the Dutch hospital's euthanasia ward. Yesterday, at tea time, Mr. and Mrs. Alpers couldn't stop saying how wonderful it was to winter in Spain. They had just got back last week. The continuing cold snap in the Netherlands helped to make their pensionado argument even more persuasive. If a roving travel agent had walked into the conversation lounge at that moment, he'd have sold two hundred return trips to Benidorm for next winter which would have given us a nice stretch of peace and quiet here. I'm having the kind of day when you wake up totally shattered, do nothing all day, and go to bed at night exhausted from all the resting you've done. If only I had a few of those magic pills in my medicine cabinet, the kind that give the youth of today the energy to rave for twenty-four hours straight. It doesn't mean I suddenly have to know how to rave. Being able to trudge around for a few hours without getting knackered would be good enough for me. Easter Sunday, 31st of March. I'm not all that keen on Easter. The Crafts Club has been decorating eggs to be consumed today at a so-called festive brunch. The brunch starts at 11 a.m., but most of the residents won't give up their strict mealtime schedule. If they are forced to have both breakfast and lunch at the same time, namely the hour normally reserved for elevenses, it throws them off for a week. So they take their breakfast at the usual time. Then, at eleven, a cup of coffee and two painted hard-boiled eggs. And an hour later, they're back for the midday meal. The three R's apply not only to children, but also to the elderly. Rest, recreation, and routine. Recreation is optional, but rest and routine are the cornerstones of this society. The traditional Easter Clavayas tournament is tomorrow, with fabulous prizes. I'm taking part because no one else will partner Evert. I won't let the boycott against Evert succeed. Some of the couples play as if it's a matter of life and death. Evert isn't averse to putting the boot in or rubbing salt in the wound by commenting on every card that's turned over until someone explodes and tells him to shut up. I'm sitting there pretending to be deaf and dumb. I'm quite curious to see if our Easter dinner tonight is any good. To be fair, holiday meals are usually quite palatable, but we have a new cook. Everything has been coming to the table more overcooked than ever. Monday, the 1st of April. The others were fit to be tied. Evert and I won second place yesterday at Clavias, a pepper and salt set. Evert suggested that we take turns keeping the pepper mill or the salt shaker, and then once a week at coffee time, make an ostentatious exchange in full view of all the envious Clavius fanatics. That's taking it a bit far for me. An Easter surprise attack. Three canters parked outside our front door had their tyres slashed. Excellent topic of conversation, but it's a puzzling act of vandalism. It's an attack on the Dutch senior citizen's mobility, cried Mrs. Quint, queen of silly melodramatics. The police came. It's the second time they've been called in a few weeks. Another pair of bright lights, these coppers. They just stood there and stared. Yes, slashed all right. Then they peered up the street as if hoping to catch sight of someone just fleeing around the corner with a knife in his hands. 
No, the officers could not take down a report. The injured parties could file a complaint online if they liked. The officers were sorry to hear that none of the injured parties possessed a computer. Grecia finally offered them her PC. After this impressive show of constabulary competence, the cops retreated. Upon leaving, they distributed some victim support leaflets to anyone who held out their hand, so that was something they'd achieved anyway. A fear of further attacks has set in. The candor owners are clamoring to be allowed to park their vehicles next to their beds. There's a great deal of speculation about who's behind this terrorist act. They all agree that Muslims are the most likely culprits. It may not be quite as bad as the Twin Towers, but it certainly doesn't deserve being poo-pooed by the police. Here's a perfect reason to send in the drones, Mr. Backer declared. Tuesday, the 2nd of April At lunch yesterday, Mr. Decout read aloud a letter from management stating that residents were henceforth required to pay one euro for every cup of coffee and twenty cents for each biscuit consumed. This gave rise to a tempest, nay, a veritable hurricane of indignation. It was an outrage. There was no respect for the elderly any more. The subject of the war was raised, and then the good old days when everyone was promised a worry-free old age. Then I'll just bring my own coffee and biscuits, Gombert shouted, upon which Decout pointed out another stipulation in the letter. Outside food and drink were no longer permitted in the common areas either. When Gombert grew so incensed that I feared he would explode, or at least have a heart attack, Decout decided it was enough. April Fool, he said dryly offering everyone a biscuit from a packet he had brought. Not everyone was a good sport about Decout's jest. I saw many a pursed lip. Some made a show of refusing the biscuit by way of protest. Others wondered if, in that case, they could have a second one. Gombert was looking quite purple in the face. I gave the joke an eight out of ten, and the execution a nine. Maybe we should invite Decout to apply for membership to the old but not dead club. Easter Monday, a big day for visitors. Sunny, six degrees centigrade, and wind from the east, force four, just bearable enough to take father or mother out for a little stroll, but not for very long. When they returned to the conversation lounge en masse, there weren't enough places to sit. I relinquished my chair and went upstairs. I was the only one with no visitors, as far as I could tell, and, being the exception, I felt a bit sorry for myself. Up in my room, I decided to open the best bottle I had. And three hours later, I came down for dinner, just a bit tipsy. I had a couple more glasses of wine, and barely made it to pudding. I hope I didn't make a fool of myself. Wednesday the 3rd of April. It doesn't have to be taken for walks, doesn't smell, and never dies. Its name? Paro. Japan's birth rate now stands at 1.3, which means that there are more old people and proportionately fewer children to visit them, which is why the Japanese have begun marketing Paro, a robot that looks like a seal specially created to keep old people company. My advice to the Dutch importer of this robot is to make it look like a waddling, roly-poly little dog that loves biscuits. Italy's birth rate is also 1.3. What's happened to the good old days when Catholics used to procreate like rabbits? A shortage of babies now will mean, relatively speaking, a huge surplus of OAPs forty years hence. Luckily, I won't be here to see it. 
Old people are already considered of little social value, but if years from now there are even more of us, I can predict that anyone over seventy will get a nice fat bonus for volunteering to be euthanized. The world won't be better off with two billion mobility scooters creating havoc in the streets. Investment advice for enterprising twenty-somethings. Buy shares in incontinence nappies. Last night, we had an old but not dead meeting in Graham's room, with Chablis and appetizers, delivered from the snack bar, because deep frying in the rooms is prohibited. There is nothing better than a piping hot bitter bowl with a cold glass of wine. It was a lovely evening. We decided that if an excursion has to be postponed for some reason, it will not affect the date of the next outing. But we're allowed to swap dates among ourselves. We have had various requests from people who would like to join our club. But after careful consideration, we have decided to keep the number at a maximum of six for now. A manageable number, easy to organize, and we all have time for one another. There were one or two rather good candidates. We're putting them on a waiting list. And the rest... Eight or so old boars, we can just give the brush off. Thursday the 4th of April. In Amsterdam there is a care home for wealthy OAPs. They have bridge instead of bingo, Haydn instead of humperdinck, filet mignon instead of meatballs, and unlimited clean disposables. Long-term health insurance pays for the nursing care and the residents pay 4,000 euros a month for food and lodging. If I were to check in there, I'd have to find a cardboard box to sleep under in three months' time. There are also homes for ageing vegetarians, for ancient artists, for geriatric anthroposophists, and for old homeless people. I believe you're not supposed to call them tramps or bag ladies anymore. I don't know if I would exchange one of those institutions for ours. I don't think whiny vegetarians or anthroposophists would be an improvement on our own belly acres. I would like to live somewhere without griping, moaning, or groaning. A little cantankerousness is fine. Otherwise, I too would be excluded. Actually, I don't believe we have even a single vegetarian living here let alone any anthroposophists. We do, on the other hand, have some ladies who are adept at needlework, and a few gents who are excellent billiards players. I have asked Anya if she could dig up this home's charter and regulations and photocopy them for me, plus any other documents that could be relevant, such as the Arbo Labour Ordinance to find out if Mrs. Stellwagen's refusal to allow us to use the kitchen is legitimate. I suspect that our club will run into problems with Madam Management again in future, and it will be useful to have a look into the forest of regulations she hides behind. I've told Graham and Effia about it, and they're willing to help me read through them. Evert wasn't interested. Well, if the need should arise for another round of cake crumbs in the fish tank, I'm your man. Friday the 5th of April Everyone was still reeling from the news. Fiscal law affects 65-plusers. And then, on top of that, today, government institutes new master plan to turn dementia tide. There's rather a lot to digest from the coffee table. To begin with the tax issue, it seems that the newly simplified tax law, as it applies to old age benefits, is hiding a fly in the ointment. I just can't believe that not one of the Inland Revenue's 30,000 employees, that's right, 30,000, had the foresight to work out what the consequences of the new regulations would be for us. Everyone's always surprised. Oh, 
dear! Are poor Gramps and Gran taking yet another hit? The finance minister will have to take measures to rectify it, of course, as he himself now says. And if you ask us, he should be quick about rectifying it, too. At least if it means changing it back to the way it was before. Otherwise, we'll all be staring at Crow's indignant protest face forever. As for the dementia tsunami they're expecting, more on that later. Too much misery to cope with all at once. And it's still too cold for the time of year. We're desperate for some nice, toasty sunshine. After three weeks of this blast from the east, wind force six, everyone's despondent. Summer's nearly here, and your balls, to quote Ebert, freeze to your bum. I am not one to drone on and on about the weather, but even the most high-minded human is only human. You wind up joining the belly-aching rabble. You can't help yourself. I admit it. I'm turning into an old misery guts. Saturday the 6th of April Old people are forever grunting and groaning. Sometimes it's out of exertion or pain, but more often simply out of habit. I've made a small study of it. The champion grunter is Mr. Kuiper, not my best friend to start with. Standing up, putting on his coat, picking something up, even if it's just a teacup, everything is accompanied by a groan, as if he's been run over by a steamroller. Once I started noticing, it began irking me more and more. That's wrong. Don't get annoyed. Just wonder at it, my father used to say. Advice meant for others, since my father got extremely worked up about everything. This morning I plucked up the courage and asked Kuiper what made him groan so when he sat down. Oh, me? he replied, genuinely surprised. For half an hour afterwards he didn't make a sound. But then, slowly but surely, the grunting started up again. It was like women's tennis. There used to be very little grunting, as far as I'm aware, but nowadays I have to turn down the sound when watching the tennis on the telly. They're doing it deliberately, and it's contagious. The men seem to be doing it more and more as well. Meanwhile, it's left me with a problem. I'm starting to loathe Kuiper, because I notice every little groan. And it's not just him, quite a number of the other inmates as well. And, worst of all, I can sometimes hear myself doing it, too. How do I break myself of the habit? I presented my problem to Evert. He thought answering each grunt with an even louder grunt might help. He tried out his theory a few hours later. The grunters gazed at Evert in surprise and asked him if he was feeling all right. Sunday, the 7th of April. Mr. Shaft, from the dementia unit, managed to slip through a door that had been left open and sat down with us in the common room. He showed us his new bracelet, proud as a peacock. He maintained that his mother-in-law had given it to him. It read, Do not resuscitate. Do you know what it means? asked Effia kindly. No, he did not. I asked if he was certain his mother-in-law had given it to him. That made him laugh, which brought on such a coughing fit that he almost suffocated, which attracted the attention of the attendants who conducted him back to the locked ward. So that we are left not knowing who is distributing those bracelets. Ebert saw a business opportunity there, he told us, with a perfectly straight face. I promptly ordered one from him. That stumped him for a moment. It was a joke, but then again, not really. I think he'll probably try making me one. Be that as it may, I am going to look into whether bracelets of this kind are legally binding. While I'm at it, I might as well investigate if the advanced directive requesting euthanasia in case of mental incompetence is valid, because that seems dicey too. Although it's a subject that almost never comes up, 
There's a great taboo on the you word, was Graham's solemn but provocative reaction to the resuscitation bracelet. There was some uneasy shuffling in chairs and long and concentrated stirring of coffee cups. Suicide isn't something these folks care to talk about, Ebert added slyly. Monday the 8th of April. Spring! Anyone who was able to totter took a walk yesterday, even if only to the bench by the front door. Four of our residents were sitting there companionably discussing the lovely weather when an elderly gentleman no one had seen before sat down in the last empty space. Mrs. Blocker wasn't spry enough to head him off. She glared at him. You are sitting on our bench. I don't see where it's written that it belongs to you, said the man, unfolding his newspaper. We always sit here, Blocker's fellow inmates said, backing her up. Well, for the next half hour, I'm going to be sitting here, said the gentleman, unperturbed. Mrs. Blocker went off to get help, but couldn't find anyone but the porter. Uh, this bench is the property of this home the porter tried telling him. This bench is located on a public thoroughfare, and therefore belongs to everyone, was the answer. After reading his paper for half an hour, in icy silence, he stood up, bowed, and walked away. I had to listen to this story four times in every major and minor key of indignation. It was Sunday's major event. Excursion number three has been postponed for two days because Grecia is still getting over a light bout of pneumonia. It was supposed to be tomorrow and has been moved to Friday. I was very disappointed. Oh, don't get carried away, Crone. You know perfectly well that the members of our club have seen better days and are prone to get sick. The vote we took not to alter the entire schedule if one outing has to be postponed is already being put to the test. I have finally come to a decision about the outing I am organising. It will be a cookery class. After whittling it down to four chefs I found on the internet, based on price and distance, I phoned each one at least three times in order to determine whether they had enough patience to deal with old people. My ploy disqualified two of the four. In the end, I decided on a cookery school called No Your Onions, because the name implies a sense of humour. They don't take themselves too seriously, which is the way I like it. There are too many people who consider themselves far too important, and yet not one of us is anything but a grain of sand in the desert, a speck of dust in the universe. That's a bit over the top, Hendrick. Tuesday the 9th of April. At last, another famous death to deplore over coffee. Margaret Thatcher. There haven't been very many celebrities falling by the wayside this year, and there aren't many people about whom opinions are as divided as the Iron Lady. Mr. Backer thought she was a wonderful woman. At least she stood for something. I asked him what she stood for. Well, she stood for what she wanted. Greecher. And what did she want, exactly? Backer. Is this some sort of cross-examination? Yesterday there was a residence meeting to inform us of the board's plans to adapt this building to today's needs. No idea what exactly today's needs are but the underlying motivation is usually cost-cutting, all under the banner of good stewardship or increased efficiency. The director said, emphatically over and over, that nothing was set in stone yet and that the purpose of this meeting was to ascertain the resident's wishes. The pretense that we have a say in the matter. It only led to greater anxiety. Yet another reason for worrying. 
residents started hoarding moving boxes that very afternoon. Old plants should not be repotted, Mrs. Shep kept bleating at anyone who would listen. The fact that she compares herself to a plant speaks to a self-knowledge for which I'd never given her credit. She does speak, but other than that she leads a largely vegetative existence. Personally, I'm all for a radical overhaul. The more disruptive, the merrier, and the sooner the better. At least a year will go by before they start on any actual demolition work, and you never know if you'll still be around to see it. What if the paramedics don't notice your do-not-resuscitate bracelet until they've got your ticker going again with a powerful electric shock? What then? Would they have to desuscitate you? What would people think? Or what if the spouse of the person who doesn't want to be resuscitated insists that everything possible be done to keep the patient alive, bracelet or no bracelet? I woke up this morning with these questions spinning around my head. Wednesday, the 10th of April. My mole in administration tells me that the inspector's office has given advance notice of a surprise visit. Complaints have come in. Alarm bells are going off in the office. Elder abuse is a hot topic in the papers. Two nursing home operators are in trouble. One of them has had 27 of its homes slapped with an order for extra oversight. Granny abuse bared a recent headline. Everyone was shocked, shocked. Maybe everyone ought to go and have a look for themselves at these homes, to see what you get with poorly trained, overworked and underpaid personnel. Add to that the nine administrative layers heaped upon all self-respecting nursing home conglomerates, and you'll see that every possible thing has been done to guarantee mishaps. After years of efficiency measures imposed by the boards of directors, the only thing left standing is the quality of their own compensation packages. The caregivers, on the other hand, are allowed two minutes and fifteen seconds to hoist disabled residents onto the potty and pull their pants up again afterwards, which doesn't leave a great deal of time for bum-wiping. There. I just felt like having a good gripe. The other side of the coin is that some of the old people in here are such terrible bores that you wouldn't mind letting them wallow in their own poo a bit longer. A recent scandal in here. A caregiver who was hit by one of the residents hit back. A little slap, which was not uncalled for, the so-called victim had been behaving worse than a toddler. Nevertheless, caregiver gets the boot. Peace restored. Thursday, the 11th of April. There are days when nothing much happens. Best just not to write anything. I could waffle on about the food and the weather, but... That's already most of my fellow inmates' favourite way to pass the time. Don't even think of starting a discussion about Nietzsche, which is fine by me since I don't know a thing about Nietzsche myself. Just as long as I have nobody whining at me, I'm content. The trick, therefore, is to be circumspect about who you end up sitting next to in the conversation lounge. Many of the seats are off-limits, they are reserved for the season ticket holders, the people who always sit in the same chair and make a huge fuss if someone dares to sit down in their spot. As for the allocation of the remaining seats, timing is all. If you get there too early, there's no choice to make. And if you're too late, there's no choice left. If you and a couple of your friends go and sit at another table, there are tables galore, after all, you're chided for being unsociable. It may seem innocuous, but people get miffed if you don't join their group. They think you're deliberately avoiding them, as if they're pariahs. 
even though I prefer to sit with Afya or Edward, or Everett on the rare occasion he ventures to join us. All too often I find myself nodding politely as a lady seated next to me ticks off her laundry list of ailments, or gives me a detailed synopsis of the latest instalment of The Travelling Judge on the telly. Then, silently wishing that she be struck dumb, I sit there, stoically dunking my biscuit into my tea. With report to the front gate tomorrow, the Rebels Club deploys at twelve noon. In the meantime, I have made a reservation for six OAPs at No Your Onions next Thursday. On talking it over with them, I decided to scrap the appetizer. We'll just have a main course and pudding. Otherwise, it would take too long and cost too much. I don't know what we'll be making. It's a surprise for me as well. If there are any dietary restrictions, I can work around those, said our hostess. And in case of a picky eater, I don't mind rustling up a meatball or two. That sounded reassuringly flexible. I have ordered the minibus and cancelled our supper in the dining room. Cook did not look happy. Friday the 12th of April It's ridiculous! Mrs. De Rose, head of housekeeping, came at the behest of the director to ask why six residents would be absent for dinner next Thursday. I explained that we would be out that evening. Oh, she said. Uh, yes, we, we have a little club that plans distractions from time to time, I explained feebly. Do you mean to say we don't plan enough? Distractions? De Rose asked. Oh, not at all, I hasten to say. The people in the kitchen aren't happy if six people decide not to show up for dinner. You mean we're only here to please the kitchen staff? I thought they were supposed to be there for us, and not the other way round. It's their job. So what the people in the kitchen think doesn't interest me. That's what I wanted to say but didn't dare. Instead, I muttered that we had already made the reservation. What are you going to do, then, if I may be so bold? When I said we were going to a cookery class, she was silent. Then she said, Aha! Another pause. Well, enjoy yourselves, then. She nodded and left probably straight to the director's office to report what I had said. I'm working myself up into a lather about it, but I can't tell anyone, or I'll give away what I've got planned. Oh, relax, Grun. Time to go. Don't forget your raincoat. Saturday the 13th of April. Yesterday, old but not dead, paid a visit to one of the Netherlands' largest and most notorious old age preserves. Kokenhof. Actually, it's not just for old people. It's also for the Germans and Japanese. They got their own country all tidied up again after that tsunami. Is that why the Japanese are over here again with their cameras? Evert wondered. Estimated average age of the Kokenhof visitor. Over sixty-five. No senior discounts, therefore. Giving discounts would cost the park an arm and a leg. People in wheelchairs are allowed in for free, however. It wasn't exactly advertised, but Grecia happened to know about the policy. So off Ebert went to fetch a wheelchair for me, and Graham got one for Effia. We thought more than two wheelchairs would look suspicious. We spent the forty euros we saved on the entry fees on coffee and cake, and we took turns letting ourselves be wheeled around. It's a rather prim, excessively manicured park, but it does have masses and masses of flowers, lovely flowers, even if they're a bit late this year. The weather was fickle, rain, sun, Rain, sun, indoors, outdoors, in, out. 
It was nice and warm inside the greenhouses, and if you filtered out the hordes of tourists, it was a beautiful spectacle. But there's a limit, even for flowers. Later, over white wine and appetizers, we asked ourselves, was cultivating the seven hundredth species of tulip really necessary? Grecia had done a clever job on the organising. She has a helpful grandson, Steph, who drives a minivan. Steph was willing to take his gran and friends out for the day for the cost of the petrol. Decent bloke, interested in people and their stories. He seemed to enjoy our company, made us feel quite pleased with ourselves. At the end of the day, Steph offered to play cab driver for us again in the future. Notwithstanding the fact that we'd been sitting in a traffic jam for an hour, Grecia must have counted on a long return trip, for she pulled a round of French cheese, smoked salmon toasts, and a bottle of wine from her cooler. I've never enjoyed being stuck in traffic as much as I did yesterday. The delay meant that we were late for supper. Sighing deeply, the head cook was prepared to heat up some leftovers for us in the microwave, acting as if she'd had to personally go without in order to save all that food for us. Sunday the 14th of April What you might call a stellar day for our home yesterday. One stroke, one broken hip, and one near asphyxiation on a butter biscuit. The ambulance came and went three times in a single afternoon. This gave rise to so much fodder for conversation over tea and coffee that it was hard to keep up with it all. Even though I wasn't closely acquainted with the victims, it does once again make one brutally aware of the facts. It doesn't require a storm to fell an old tree. A puff of wind, in the guise of a butter biscuit, for example, could be fatal. We all ought to live as if every day's our last, but no, we'd rather waste our precious final hours on empty stuff and nonsense. Mrs. Sitter, seeing the toing and froing of ambulances, asked if bingo would be cancelled. Those of us who are fit shouldn't have to suffer on account of those who are not, she brazenly declared. You'd almost wish that at her next bingo game she would have a stroke, break a hip, and choke to death on a biscuit. On a happier note, I'm about to go and have a cup of tea with my friend Effia, and I'm going to invite her to dinner with me tonight. I've reserved a table at a fairly posh restaurant. Live as if today's your last day. Monday, the 15th of April. The dear old girl gladly accepted the invitation. She made herself look nice, a little lipstick and a touch of rouge. I must confess that I had showered, specially before I went, and changed my clothes. Not an excessive luxury, in fact. I really must make a point of asking my geriatrician next time if there's anything that can be done about the leaky part or if I'll just have to resign myself to wearing nappies. Not so long ago, I used to think that was when one lost one's last shred of dignity. But I realize that I have now lowered the bar a bit. The frog in the cooking pot, that's me. Caught the minibus to the restaurant at seven, where we had an elegant and delicious meal that cost me half a month's pension. Effie was thrilled and greatly enjoyed the dinner. She let me treat her only on condition that I wouldn't make a habit of paying for everything. That's a habit I wouldn't be able to afford anyway, I answered truthfully. It felt good to throw caution to the wind for once. I'd never thought it would be that easy. It definitely had to do with the person I was with. Home in a taxi. On parting, a kiss on both cheeks. I felt myself get all hot and bothered. Jesus, I'm eighty-three years old. Tuesday the 16th of April. The royalist frenzy 
is reaching fever pitch. The Residents' Association has been strenuously debating how it should mark the occasion. The end result is that this year we can look forward to the same shop-bought orange Napoleons we always get on Queen's Day. Moreover, we can watch full Coronation Day coverage on the big screen in the Conversation Lounge. The post-coronation cruise on the River A will happen practically down the street from the home, but it will be virtually impossible for the likes of us to attend. That unfortunate fact is greatly deplored in here. I don't know the exact details, but I believe you're supposed to get there by twelve noon in order to stand, hemmed in for the next seven hours, ready for a fleeting glimpse of the new king and queen sailing by. These past few years they've already put lots of extra safety measures into effect for the annual 30th of April Queen's Birthday celebration. They've divided the city into safety zones, one, two, and three. Depending on where you live, you aren't even allowed to keep your car in your own locked garage on Queen's Day. Even mobility scooters are banned. There was a great deal of indignation about that around here, as you might expect. And in spite of all those security precautions, at the cost of 700,000 euros, not counting the police salaries, you'd still find everyone glued to the telly, anxiously waiting for another black Suzuki Swift to come tearing round the corner, like the one that tried to ram into the Royal Motorcade in 2009, killing eight surprised bystanders. I wouldn't mind having a look at the security plans for the coronation. The Slothauer sisters are quite sure. Something's going to happen. We don't know what, but we feel it in our bones. One of the residents asserts that Kim Jong-un, that pudgy little gnome from North Korea, is capable of sending a rocket our way on the 30th of April. The bombing of the Boston Marathon, which happened yesterday, hasn't exactly calmed the jitters. So the fun is already rather spoiled in advance by all the worried wimps in here. I look back with nostalgia on the relaxed royal processions of yore, when no one would even think of checking the one-and-a-half-metre orange raisin bread baked by the Orange Society of Verdun for explosives. I don't know how I'll get through 30th of April as a covert Republican. Wednesday the 17th of April I'm nervous about tomorrow. Will they like my cookery class? The gentlemen and ladies are definitely speculating about what I have in store for them. One by one, they've come to me fishing for hints. Yet speaking of fish, we finally have some new fish swimming in the tanks made famous by the great cake assassination caper. A note posted on the wall states that this is the last time the management will be purchasing new fish. Another calamity and the tanks will be gone for good. You should never say that sort of thing to Everett, our own house anarchist. His eyes promptly started gleaming. I made him solemnly swear he would leave the fish alone. He swore, on me mum, that he would. His mum is twenty-five years in the grave. Now Everett is trying to think of something else. A raid on... House plan doesn't appeal to him very much. The lift is a possible target. Tonight, on the telly, an interview with the future king and queen. I noticed that the best viewing spots are already reserved downstairs. There are slips of paper marked with residents' names on the front row chairs. Like hotel guests staking out lounge chairs round the swimming pool with their towels at eight in the morning. I think I'll tip Everett off about those reserved seats. That might just be the disruptive deed he's looking for, falling right into his lap. Some of the ladies will put on their fanciest frocks to watch the interview with Prince Willem and Princess Maxima. 
out of respect. Their fancy frocks aren't always that fetching. They're on the whole rather old and threadbare. The residents tend to take thriftiness to great lengths. They think it's a waste to buy new clothes, since there's a good chance they'll die before the clothes have seen their day. They'd rather walk around in faded dresses with laddered stockings and gaping holes in their shoes. I am not wholly guilt-free myself. I don't like spending money on clothes, either. Thursday, the 18th of April. I really like the blue colour of it. Maximus' blouse was the thing that interested me most about the entire interview. A number of my fellow viewers were primarily fascinated by the crown princess's bandaged finger. Had she caught it in a door? Infection? Hangnail? The royalty experts in the studio afterwards had nothing to say about the finger. Lots of pompous blather, on the other hand, dissecting the couple's trite answers. The Boston Marathon attack led Mr. Shipper to change his mind yesterday about going to watch the Amsterdam Marathon, even though his grandson is taking part. The incorrigible Ebert calculated Shipper's chances of landing his canter upside down in a ditch to be considerably greater than sustaining an injury at the marathon, and told him he would therefore be well advised to get rid of his vehicle. Everett happened to know someone who was in the market for a second-hand canter. I must make the rounds of the other old but not dead members and tell them to wear something comfortable. Preferably nothing baggy or loose that might catch fire. I'll leave out that last bit. Friday, the 19th of April. It was a great success in no small part due to the excellent wine that was generously poured at the end of the meal preparation. The chef was what a chef should be, fat and jolly, but strict as well. You weren't allowed to make a mess of it, as ever did, butchering an aubergine. At that point, Remy, that was the chef's name, told him to behave. Food is not to be fooled with. You're allowed to have fun but not make fun of it. With utmost concentration, we caramelized, we blanched, we walked, and we sauced. And then we feasted on the outcome. Remy declared himself proud of us and treated us to a snifter of brandy with the coffee. The lady with whom I'd made the arrangements came to make sure there were no casualties and sat and had a glass with us. All too soon, the minibus was tooting its horn at the door. As it turned out, we'd been at it for five whole hours. On the way home, I graciously accepted the ovations, and nobody seemed to have a problem with the cost. I don't see any of us trying to produce the same meal at home. Graham seemed to be the only one to remember much of it, but since it was almost impossible to understand what he was saying, it's hard to tell. As we walked in, Mrs. Stelbargen watched our rowdy entrance with a dour look on her face. Normally she goes home by seven o'clock. The interest shown by the other residents, who had just feasted on stewed endive, must have rankled as well. The more sympathetic among them were eager to know what we'd had to eat. The curmudgeons wanted to know what this extravagance had cost. Shortly thereafter, Stelbargen left, without a word. Saturday the 20th of April Mrs. Hokendyke thought it was an outrage. The newly refurbished Reichs Museum won't let you in on a mobility scooter. She'd been planning to scoot past Rembrandt's night watch on her counter. But that's impossible now, I suppose. The spokesman for the museum pointed out, quite rightly, that a mobility scooter is a vehicle and not a walking aid. The new displays include quite a number of glass cases and loose objects, he explained. If you were to let old people zoom through there on their mobility scooters, 
you might as well post an insurance assessor in every gallery, together with a security guard and someone to clean up the mess, since most scooter operators are terrible drivers, worse even than Andrea Bocelli. Yesterday, I finally received the results of some tests that were done when I went to see the geriatrician. Good news. No new ailments. The accompanying note from the doctor. Take comfort in the fact that there are more ailments you don't have than ones you do. I would like to see you again in six months. To celebrate the fact that I don't have lung cancer, I lit up an extra cigar. They prefer that you don't smoke right outside the front door, but I don't give a tinker's gus. I don't like the residence smoking room, where you're forced to breathe in all that second-hand smoke. Most unhealthy. The only place employees are allowed to smoke now is in the bicycle shed. Sunday the 21st of April Last night, a hearse drove up to the door, or, rather, drove round to the back, for there is a back entrance that is reserved for the discreet removal of the dead. Mrs. Twinman was the lucky one this time. She'd had quite enough of life for a while now, so they tell me. I hardly knew her myself. There is a whole protocol for the disposal of a deceased resident. Edward once tried to obtain a copy, but was told it wasn't public information. Well, that only made him more curious, of course. I know he's been trying to find another way to get hold of it. He's been trying to tease details from a nurse he's friendly with. But she isn't allowed to talk. I pin my hopes on Anya. She laughed when I asked her, and told me she would do her best. Openness is in short supply in here. The most commonplace matters are deemed confidential. The cause of death, for instance. The staff are not allowed to give out any information whatsoever about the inmates. Not even if someone has a cold or is visiting his daughter. Ebert has been mailing his letters for a while in black-edged mourning envelopes without fixing a postage stamp. Because, Ebert reasons, not only will the surcharge be waived, out of respect, you can also count on your letter arriving on time. Until the day he sent his tax forms in one of those mourning envelopes. But it could be worse. His brother used to drive a second-hand hearse, complete with a homemade coffin, so that he could park in no parking zones. Over coffee, Effie remarked that she would love it if, on the eve of the coronation, Prince Willem Alexander announced, Who needs this? I've changed my mind. Did he say that? Three or four people asked, appalled. Many inmates are hard of hearing, and most are only half listening. Monday the 22nd of April Everett was off to hospital this morning. They're letting me stay overnight, he casually told me yesterday, when he came over to ask me to look after Mo for a couple of days. He wouldn't tell me what was the matter. Nothing special. Few tests. What kind of tests? Enki, I don't feel like going over all the medical details with you right now. My leg is giving me trouble, all right? They're going to see if they can do anything about it. I'm not allowed to ring him tonight, either. To make sure of it, he didn't give me his room number. I don't know it exactly. Did not sign up for a telephone in his room, and left his mobile at home. It couldn't be clearer. Do not disturb. I'm feeling uneasy about this. Tuesday, the 23rd of April. With his master in hospital, Everett's dog is a bit out of sorts, too. As I was putting on his leash to take him out for a walk, he deposited a huge, rather elongated poo on the welcome mat, and then gazed at me with those big, sad, innocent old dog eyes. 
It took me twenty minutes to get the stinky mess out of the coir mat. I left it outside in the end because I couldn't get rid of the smell. Everett is coming home late this afternoon. He telephoned an hour ago to tell me he'll be able to let Mo out himself tonight. Yes, all's well, nothing special to report. I couldn't get more than that out of him. I recently watched an episode of Karasakanaran on the telly, a kind of big brother, only with a group of geriatric Dutch celebrities interned in a house that's supposed to make them feel younger by reminding them of the good old days. A few days later, I happened to catch a program about an old people's choir. Next Saturday, there's a film about a rebellion in a nursing home. We are everywhere. Still, it's not that these programs are representative of the Dutch elderly. The oldest Krasser Kanar participant was 69. The residents in here are well into their 80s, on average. Care homes have, over the past few years, seen an unprecedented influx of old crocs who are no longer able to live on their own. You need a Condition 3 designation, or something like it, to qualify for immediate admittance. Condition 3 means you're no longer capable of boiling an egg, and usually you're on your way to the locked ward. Condition 2 puts you on the waiting list which can take years, by which time you may not need it any more. Those lists tend to sort themselves out. In the seventies and eighties, happy and healthy couples just turning seventy would move into an old people's home to enjoy a long, comfortable old age. Now it's mainly old crocs. You could drop dead at any moment. Wednesday, the 24th of April. A day and a half in hospital and not a drop to drink, or very nearly. I need to fill the tank. When I looked in on Everett at half past seven to see how he was, he'd already had a couple. He didn't reveal much, except that he'd had to resort to taking quick nips from a water bottle when nobody was looking. When you're young, you can't wait to grow up. As an adult, until about the age of sixty, you want, above all, to stay young. But when you're as old as the hills, you've got nothing left to strive for. That is the essence of the emptiness of life in here. There are no more goals, no exams to pass, no career ladders to climb, no children to raise. We are too old even to babysit the grandchildren. In this stimulating environment, it isn't always easy to set yourself a modest goal or two. When I look around, I see only passive resignation in people's eyes. It's the eyes of people with nothing to do, but go from cup of coffee to cup of tea and back again. I may have said this before. Maybe I shouldn't grumble so much. I should just work harder at making sure that every day is worth living, or at least every other day. There have to be rest days, too, just like the ones in the Tour de France. Thursday, the 25th of April. Yesterday I took in a lunchtime concert. Rereading my own complaints about the emptiness of our days, I told myself to buck up and do something. Classical music is wasting on Ebert. Effia wasn't feeling well, and I wasn't in the mood to look any further for company, so I went by myself to one of the free concerts our municipality offers her citizens, held in the town hall. Alas, doing something is no guarantee of a pleasant afternoon. The music was rather monotonous and seemed to go on forever which is why I nodded off, until some lady angrily prodded me awake. I'm afraid I may have been snoring. Everyone was staring at me. I was terribly embarrassed. When it was over, I was trying to slink out as unobtrusively as possible. I could still feel contemptuous eyes on my back. Come on, Hendrik, stop moping. Doing nothing is the only way to make sure nothing goes wrong. 
Stop brooding about a minor mistake, and next time you go, you can just go in a false beard. That was Effia's advice when I visited her on her sickbed. She had no appetite for the chocolate truffles I brought her. She didn't complain, but explained in a business-like voice that her intestines often gave her trouble. When that happens, the only thing to do is to stay in my room. Tomorrow I am invited, on condition that she's feeling better, to come back for a glass of white wine and chocolate truffles. Friday the 26th of April Between bites of custard pudding, Mr. Dieudonné Titular, brilliant name, isn't it? But what an old windbag! read out a newspaper article reporting that, according to the anti-intruder task force, there's been a huge increase in the number of old people assaulted in their own homes. Diodone rubbed his hands gleefully, as if to gloat about how much better off he was living in this safe refuge, and not the dangerous world outside. I noted a big clump of custard dangling from his moustache. There was also, the task force reported, an increased tendency for roughing up the victims, to get them to confess where they'd hidden their money socks, because one of the reasons for the increase in robberies was that OAPs hate to use ATM machines, and so keep relatively large amounts of cash in their homes. I myself suspect there's a different reason. Old people aren't as ready with the baseball bat to defend their possessions. Thieves have a marked preference for defenceless victims. The tone was set for the evening's conversation. Fear has been sown. Fear is a seed that falls on fertile soil in here. More than half the inmates are afraid to venture out alone at night. We got to hear a whole litany of stories about purse snatchers, intruders, pickpockets, vacuum-selling con men, and other scam artists. I went to see Effia. We watched a DVD, a romantic comedy, a genre that usually sends me to sleep. <laughs> Not this time. Saturday, the 27th of April. Children laugh approximately a hundred times a day. Adults, only about fifteen. Somewhere along the line, we lose the inclination. Those are statistics from a research study. Old people weren't singled out as a separate category, but from personal observation, I would say that a, a rise in age corresponds to a decrease in laughter. Although it does depend greatly on the individual, of course. I've spent the past several days watching for it. And of the people I see regularly, five haven't smiled for three days straight. There are four ladies, on the other hand, who tend to laugh a lot. They laugh so often and for so little cause that once you start noticing it, it gets awfully irritating. Which is why you shouldn't pay attention to it. The minute you decide not to notice, however, it's already too late. You find you can't help noticing. The middle bracket consists of a majority that seldom laughs from the belly, but smiles frequently. I tried keeping score for a while, but stopped because it became too distracting. I'd count how many times a group of us laughed, but then I'd have no idea what they'd been talking about, with the result that my companions would ask me if I was feeling all right. Now I'm trying to keep track of how often I laugh myself. But that, too, is harder than you would think. After one hour of tea drinking, and one hour of playing billiards with Graham and Ebert, it came to three laughs, out loud, and somewhere between ten and fifteen smiles. Not bad. It has made me painfully aware, however, that when I or other people laugh, it is often for social acceptance. A little laugh here, a smile there, for no other reason than to be polite. 
as a friendly gesture, or because you're too spineless to reveal you didn't think it was funny, or as a way of avoiding the subject. Sunday the 28th of April When you read in the paper that some Dutch celebrity has died, it's fine if you think, Cripes, was that one still alive? for it shows that the person in question had already long passed into oblivion. But sometimes it's the other way round, and some decrepit former star is dragged back into the spotlight. Painful. Just before he died, a doddering Ramses Korsakoff Shaffy was hauled back on stage to sing, quavering and off-key, We'll go on. They showed a drooling Willem Douse sitting in a wheelchair, speechless after his fifth stroke for his last appearance on the telly. Tough guy right to Goya, when he'd had a few, used to beat big bruisers to a pulp if he didn't like the look of their face. Near death, he was dragged before the cameras, a helpless, lisping mummy, for a reunion with his old mate Johnny. I'd have expected Wright to put a bullet in his own head before allowing decrepitude to set in. Why are those vultures of the telly so keen to put on these demeaning spectacles? Why doesn't anyone tell those wonderful colleagues that it's disrespectful and a downright shame to parade former heroes once they're old and helpless? I turn the telly off every time it happens but I can't turn off the picture it leaves in my mind. The date of the coronation approaches. The irritation over the accommodations that have to be made by the populace to that punch and duty show is escalating. Mr. Shaft, one of the few inmates who still gets around by bicycle, was furious. Last Tuesday, the police confiscated, stole, his bike at the ferry crossing, all because a week later some big fat boat with a crown on his head is set to cruise by at a considerable distance. The whole city is being tidied, raked and polished, and then next week, when the whole circus is over, Amsterdam can just go to hell again as far as they're concerned. But I can't share my opinion of the whole palaver with my fellow inmates. Not a negative word about the House of Orange. Monday, the 29th of April. I don't feel well. My head is heavy and dizzy. Could it be something's growing in there? Methinks I have far too many ailments already to start growing tumours as well. Friday, the 3rd of May. For a staunch Republican, it wasn't bad timing to be indisposed on the 30th of April. I barely noticed the hoopla surrounding the coronation. I had a raging headache on the big day and a tummy bug. So I swallowed a nice cocktail of aspirin and imodium and stayed in bed. Ebert stuck his head in once, as did Edward, Greecher and Effia. I pretended to be asleep. On the second day, I suspected I must be starting to pong, and thought I'd take a shower. I slipped and fell in the tub, managed to drag myself back into bed with a great deal of effort and pain. The immediate tendency is not to want to call for help. It's that mixture of pride and embarrassment that stops you. In the end, a nurse arrived, alerted by my next-door neighbour, who'd heard a funny thud. The nurse called the house GP, who diagnosed just a couple of bruised ribs, so it seems I've been let off relatively easy. A broken hip means at least four months confined to bed, before you could even think of attempting to shuffle about, leaning on a Zimmer frame. Now, it only hurts when I breathe. The doctor isn't too fussed about limiting painkillers, fortunately, so I was just downstairs for the first time in three days for a cup of coffee. 
There were even one or two people who actually seemed happy to see me. That did me the world of good, I tell you. I shall be taking it easy for a few days. I must be on top form again come Monday, because that's the day of Everett's club outing. He has put up a bottle of brandy as a reward for whoever guesses what we're doing. I did not win. We are not going synchronised swimming. Saturday, the 4th of May. Mrs. Stelbergen summoned me to her office yesterday. First, she asked kindly if my swollen knee had gone down at all. Actually, I said, there's nothing wrong with my knee, but my bruised ribs still hurt. Oh, sorry, she was confusing two different accidents. Our director tries her best to show sympathy, but she's a bit lacking in that department. What she really wanted was to tell me that she had gone to the board to discuss my request to see the regulations, and that the board felt the regulations were not a public matter and was therefore unable to grant said request. And. Why aren't they public? I asked. The board has no comment. And so? So nothing. I am very sorry that I can't help you. Now, will you please excuse me? I have someone else waiting. Enjoy the rest of your day. I slunk off, disappointed. At least, I hope I gave her that impression. I had decided beforehand to make a fuss for form's sake, if they wouldn't let me see those regulations. Ria and Antoine Travamundi know many people, and among their acquaintances is a friendly retired lawyer. Antoine had told me about him before my conference with Selbargen. He said he would give him a ring, and then perhaps I could pay him a visit to find out what the law says about board transparency. I don't have to worry about compensating him. I shall take myself there shortly. Sunday the 5th of May. Liberation Day. In a place filled with so many old people, you would expect to hear some moving or shocking stories about the war on the 4th and 5th of May, wouldn't you? But no, they never mention the war. Or else they fall back on the old chestnuts, sugar rations and such. It is striking how little the folk in here know about one another. That thought occurred to me yesterday during the two-minute silence for the fallen. I looked around and realised I knew next to nothing about how any of them had fared during the Second World War, not even the people I see most often. I do know quite a bit of Ebert's history. I'd known him for twenty years or so. He was a printer by trade, and I met him through my work. Our friendship has endured. We have never looked back. His wife died ten years ago. Two kids he seldom sees. He has neither money, nor property, nor God. For years he's been playing the role of reprobate, with great conviction. A classic diamond in the rough, salt of the earth. I've known Anya Applebaum for forty years. She never married. Perhaps she waited too long for Mr. Wright. Smart, sweet, and dependable. I think she must be lonely. Ebert and Anya, that's what remains of what was once a tolerably full social life, with a wife, child, and friends. Until three years ago, I lived in a nice terraced house with a garden. The plan was to die there in peace when the time came. So much for that. My wife has suffered from manic depression for forty years. She lost it completely soon after our little girl drowned. She decided to drive to Groningen in the middle of the night because she wanted to climb to the top of the Martini Tower. She gave the car away to a complete stranger, a junkie, and returned to Amsterdam in a taxi. She squandered thousands of guilders. In the end, she was nabbed for shoplifting by the police, and forcibly sedated by her shrink. Then, 
after months in an institution. She sank into a deep depression. Finally still shaky, but more or less stabilised by a slew of medications, she was allowed to come home until the next manic breakdown, followed by yet another depression. This happened five times in a row. The last time, most of our house went up in flames while I was out running an errand. Now she is locked up for good. After the fire, Anya arranged for me to come and live here. I visit her twice a year. She barely recognises me, but takes my hand and pats it. I have never been angry with her. The calendar tells me that my last visit was over six months ago. A life in a nutshell. For the past two years, the emptiness was slowly but surely growing unbearable. But look, suddenly I have Effia, I have Graham, Gritia, Edward, Antoine and Rhea. It isn't time to kick the bucket just yet. Monday, the 6th of May. Last night it occurred to me that the reader might like a bit more background information about this care home to give you a clearer picture, since the chances that you will end your days in this home or a similar one are slim. So I will henceforth pay some attention to describing the stage set on which our lives are played out and the daily routine. In the late sixties, homes for the elderly began sprouting up everywhere, a warehouse type of design was acceptable and cheap. Old people weren't used to a great deal of luxury back then. They had been through the war and were easy to please. The architect of this home decided to make it a grey concrete affair, seven stories high, each floor composed of two wings, separated in the middle by the lifts. The wings consist of long, windowless corridors, each lined with eight one- or two-room flats equipped with kitchenettes. The kitchenette consists of four cupboards, two up and two down, a countertop one metre long, and two gas rings that can only be used to heat water or milk for tea and coffee. If you wanted to boil an egg as well, they might just turn a blind eye. There's a small shower and a WC. The installation of grab rails in places where you could slip and fall and the absence of thresholds show that the builders did give some thought to the target audience. Each flat has a balcony, large enough for a dustbin and a hanging geranium. At the end of each wing, on each floor, there's a conservatory-like area furnished with sofas and chairs. Although hardly anyone ever sits there, most residents prefer the large common room downstairs. It is generally frowned upon for someone from another floor to sit there for no good reason. To be continued, I should save my strength. At two o'clock I must take myself in comfortable clothes down to the lobby, where today's group leader, Evert, awaits us for what ought to be a memorable excursion. Tuesday, the 7th of May. Who'd have thought that Everett, of all people, would treat us to a Tai Chi class? The last thing you'd expect of him. Luckily, our instructor didn't mind us having a laugh, and we made good use of his indulgence. We did, however, try in all seriousness to apply ourselves to the slow-motion fighting poses, although I'm afraid that in the case of our mugging, what we learned is unlikely to be of immediate use. Tai Chi is a sport you can practice even with a Zimmer frame, so it's an ideal form of exercise for the elderly. Bruised ribs, however, are another story. I took it very slowly, suffering in silence. The Tai Chi master and his comely assistant 
taught us the glorious names of the various moods. I've already forgotten most of them, unfortunately. Graham crashed to the floor while trying the stork imitation. It cost him some points, but did not jeopardise his diploma. Afterwards, in keeping with the theme, we went to the Great Wall for a Chinese meal. Gretchen ordered, straight-faced, number 33 with white rice. Silly, but good for a laugh. It's lucky Chinese people are so tolerant of old people. Respect for their elders was rammed down their throats with chopsticks from the moment they were born. In Western culture, the old are considered more of a nuisance. There's a case to be made for that, too. Upon being bombarded with compliments on the way home for having organised a superlative day for us, Everett tried not to beam with pride. He even seemed to have caught something in his eye. You're all right, oh, all right, that, that's enough of that. Since our first outing, seventeen people have asked to be admitted to our club. Sadly for them, old but not dead is not accepting new members for the time being. Wednesday the 8th of May. This morning, a harassment protocol has appeared on the notice board in the common room. It lists seven tips for combating bullying. It is a dated directive, I see, from two years ago. The work of a Mr. Jan Roma, director of the National Foundation for the Elderly, as if this were a primary school for OAPs. Tip number one. A counsellor must be brought in. Tip number two. Bullying information sessions must be held. And on and on in that vein. Most impressive. A protocol like that will surely put an immediate stop to the bullying in here. Something to be considered for Syria too, perhaps? Or for Afghanistan? People are harassing each other all over the world. A global harassment protocol is what we need with counsellors and information sessions. Not funny, Groan. It's true. People in here gossip, humiliate and ridicule one another as if it's the most normal thing in the world. Nothing childish is foreign to us in these parts. The best thing to do is pretend not to notice, and if that's impossible, if it bothers you, speak up or go and sit somewhere else. Or take a swing at them, as Edward suggested. Something I'd never have expected of him. It's easy for me to say, since I am rarely the victim. There are a few thoroughly rotten apples you have to keep an eye on. Like four-legged predators, they choose the weakest to prey on, not stopping until they have torn them to pieces, if you let them. The best is when, for want of victims, the bullies wind up turning on one another. There are a few interesting vendettas going on. The ladies at Doubts and Schoendewald are out for each other's blood, as a result of some coffee spilled on an antimacassar three years ago. Until death do them part. Thursday, the 9th of May. A great comfort to know. Once you get here, here is where you remain until your final departure for the churchyard or crematorium. The papers were full of it again. The cost of elderly care is going through the roof. The solution is twofold. First, the bar to what constitutes disability is to be raised, and second, the personal contribution the elderly must pay will be jacked up considerably. Item 1. According to these new measures, quite a few of the residents shouldn't be here at all. They are far too spry and independent. There was a rumour going round that people in that category would be kicked out to make room for more serious cases. It created quite a stir, and in some quarters resulted in an acute exacerbation of existing ailments. Just that's a precaution. But we can all breathe easy now. Management has assured residents 
in writing that they'll never have to leave, no matter how healthy. Unforeseen circumstances accepted. It is a shame they had to add that proviso. Item two. I have gathered from hushed conversations over coffee that some residents who hadn't emptied their bank accounts already have now done so, hiding their nest egg under the mattress or in an old sock. Elderly care should be free. We've worked hard for it all our lives, is the prevailing opinion. The two euros for the minibus is already highway robbery. A couple of sorry cases confessed in a whisper that their children had already withdrawn everything from their bank accounts without asking for safekeeping. Safekeeping the inheritance, they mean. Every day you're still alive costs me oodles of money, Mrs. Shipper's son teased her. He was just joking. His wife, who has no sense of humour, sat there, nodding agreement. Friday the 10th of May There's an initiative called An Outing with Grandma. Children are rounded up to spend a day with some poor granny, no relation, who otherwise is sitting home all alone. I gather it could also be a grandpa. A group of secondary school children took some of our residents to visit the revamped Madura Dam Miniature Park. At the risk of being accused of being a peevish old curmudgeon, I'd much rather stay at home. Visiting Madura Dam wouldn't be a barrel of fun under any circumstance. But in the company of eleven or twelve-year-old know-it-alls I've never seen before in my life, it could be a blistering bore. Now stop being so negative, Grun. It's a lovely idea. Especially if you remember that the children of today seem to think you don't have to bother with old people because social services will take care of them. Many adults think the same. The newspaper that took the trouble of devoting a column to an outing with Grandma further reported some disconcerting statistics from the Economic Policy Bureau. The Netherlands has some million and a half solitary old people, of whom over 300,000 are extremely lonely. That's a lot. But it should be said that some old people do it to themselves. In this house alone there are dozens who are to be avoided like the plague because they're boring, bigoted belly acres. Forgive me for stating the truth, but that's just the way it is. Frequently overheard. At least in here there's someone to talk to. That is, indeed, the great advantage of this place, as opposed to living alone, where only the cat or canary can be relied upon to discuss the weather. I wonder how many of the residents in here suffer from extreme loneliness. Saturday the 11th of May Reading about cute American five-year-olds who, on their birthdays, are presented with their first pink gun, my first rifle, complete with real bullets, made me wonder if in American nursing homes the oldies walk around packing loaded... My last rifles. With all the Parkinson's about, that would lead to quite a few accidents. I haven't heard of any such mass shootings, but I can't imagine there aren't at least some instances of old geezers shot point-blank by fellow residents, protecting their God-given property. A piece of cake, for instance. One advantage to being surrounded by all those weapons is that you won't have to jump through hoops to obtain that elusive euthanasia pill. As long as you can still move one trigger finger, the solution is waiting for you in a holster. As in every other year, we never seem to run out of things to say about the wonders of spring. Nature running riot. 
You could just see it growing, you'll hear, at least three times a day. Then Everett will say facetiously, I can just hear it growing. Occasionally, someone will actually try to listen. Sometimes, rarely, they'll say they can hear it too. I walk to the park twice a day, with Effia one time, the next time with Graham, Edward or Ebert. Eight minutes getting there, fifteen minutes on a bench, eight minutes home. There's no haste, and spring is never boring. Sometimes I'll slosh there in the pouring rain. <laughs> What's that old kid think he's doing? I overheard some gangly teenagers sheltering in a doorway, thinking out loud, just a bit too loudly. I was amused. They just didn't get it. Sunday the 12th of May. Although the nursing wing is separate from ours, you do sometimes come across a dementia case in the corridors, accompanied by a nurse or male attendant. Some residents will scoot back inside their rooms because they think dementia is catching, or maybe it's not, but you never know. Keeping out of the way can't hurt in any case, is the basic attitude. And that goes not only for dementia. Cancer patients, homosexuals, Muslims, they're all best avoided. The older they are, the more scared they are. At our age, surely, there's nothing left to lose, so why not be fearless? It's the little things that get you. Or rather, that you don't get. A daily annoyance? Packaging. Cans with tabs you can't wedge your finger under. Vacuum-sealed, lift-up-here corners, too small to pull. Child-proof cleaning products. Applesauce lids, impossible to twist open. Prosecco corks, blister packs. They're all specially designed to make it as difficult as possible for feeble, trembling old hands to manage. Today a jar of pickles slipped from my grasp as I was trying in vain to get the lid off. My entire room stank of pickles, glass everywhere. I found the last piece in my carpet slipper. Someone ought to bring a class-action lawsuit against the packaging industry for physical damage and mental distress. They have to be doing it on purpose. If they can send people to the moon, surely they ought to be able to come up with an easy twist-off lid. All right, I'll admit it, I'm a bit of an old moaner today. Monday, the 13th of May. Ebert was rushed to the emergency room this morning. He rang me from the hospital, could I look after Mo? Two of his toes had turned black a couple of days ago. When he went to the surgery this morning, the GP immediately called for an ambulance. What he was afraid of has come to pass. He's following in the footsteps of that old mate of his, who kept having to have bits amputated. He rang me from his bed. Why didn't you say something? I couldn't help asking. I'd only have been bombarded with unsolicited advice which I'd have ignored anyway. He had a point. He is to be operated on tomorrow morning, and if everything goes well, he'll wake with only a couple of toes missing. After we'd hung up, I took a taxi to the hospital to bring him some necessities, underwear, pyjamas, toothbrush. He was trying to cheer me up, while it should have been the other way round. It only occurred to me afterwards, and I felt ashamed. Evert takes things as they come. He weighed the risks beforehand, accepted them, and went on living his life as if he didn't have diabetes. With gusto and bravado. That was still his attitude, lying there in his hospital bed. When I returned home, I informed the members of our club and the staff. The nurses and attendants were remarkably sympathetic. Most of them do have a soft spot for him, after all, although there's probably at least one who silently wishes even more amputations of him, preferably his head. 
Two of our fellow residents couldn't resist remarking, triumphantly almost, that they'd warned him, hadn't they? What a rotten day. Thursday the 14th of May. I have just spoken to Ebert. He came to from the anesthesia an hour ago. He was operated on early this morning, and they amputated three toes on his right foot, including the big toe. It will be hard for him to walk, especially at first. He is looking at six weeks' convalescence. He sounded knackered. I'll draw up a visiting schedule for those who want to see him. Now I must go and fill in our club members and some of the staff. Wednesday, the 15th of May. I visited Everett in hospital this morning. He already has his usual swagger back. He'd asked the nurse if he could take the sawn-off toes home to display them in a jar on the dresser. The nurse had gaped at him at first. I, I believe your toes have already been disposed of, she had said, a bit nervously. Ebert. Yeah, but they still belong to me. Surely I might just lodge a complaint. Don't worry, love. Just kidding. They've put him in a ward with two other old men. One of them hacks and coughs constantly, and when he's not spluttering, does nothing but carp and complain. That's according to Everett, anyway, who didn't look too good himself, pale and drawn, although well enough to wink broadly at every nurse he sees. Just ten days or so and I'll be strutting about like a pee-wit beyond my zimmer frame, he assured me. I had to solemnly swear that we wouldn't put off our excursions for his sake. He did suggest limiting the next ones to stuffy museum visits, saving the fun ones for later. I promised to propose it at the next meeting. Everett couldn't say how well the operation had gone. The surgeon should have stopped by yesterday afternoon, but had been called away on an emergency. There was no one to take his place, and the nurses knew nothing, or pretended to know nothing. The doctor might come by this afternoon. Patients don't matter very much in hospitals. It's all about the doctors. A minor trauma avoided. Anouk has made it into the Eurovision Song Contest finals, thank God. Around here, people would have preferred an old-timer like Ronnie Tober to sing for the Netherlands, but fine, whatever they think is best for our country. The general opinion here is that all those corrupt Eastern Bloc countries have turned the Netherlands into a Eurovision dwarf. Wherefore, the Iron Curtain ought to be drawn shut again as soon as possible. And don't forget to kick all those worthless Romanian accordion players back behind that curtain where they belong. Thus, the ever-diplomatic Mr. Backer. Thursday, the 16th of May. It costs 550 euros a day for me to be in here. And for those few lousy cents, I have to eat a breakfast of dry toast at seven in the morning. I'm given three cups of dishwater coffee a day. The food is cold and the bread tasteless. A five-star tab, but a no-star hotel. Well, OK. And a nurse who takes my temperature twice a day. Everett Dyker was already full of bluster as he ate an entire box of sugar-free Jamaican rum chocolates. The hospital won't let him have any alcohol, so he hoped to get some into his system that way. He had rung me specially to buy him some. Cherry liqueur chocolates were another option. And a bottle of mineral water. Buy bowls if you get my drift. The surgeon had popped in a day and a half after the operation to report it had been a success. What do you mean, a success? asked Ebert. But the infected toes have been amputated. I don't consider that a great success. Doing nothing wasn't an option, the doctor said, unperturbed, and made as if to go. What next? If there are no complications, 
you will be allowed to go home in four days. You do have to make an appointment for a follow-up and for physical therapy. Goodbye. And he was gone. Hadn't even bothered to take off the bandage. My diary has, for the time being, become more of a journal about effort. Friday the 17th of May. Last night there was an impromptu meeting of the old but not dead club. Principal item on the agenda? Everts condition. We decided to give him a warm welcome home, probably next Monday or Tuesday. The next excursion will be wheelchair-friendly, according to Edward. This will be the last outing of the first go-round. The enthusiasm is as high as ever, and we are to embark on the second round following the same sequence. At the end of the meeting, we raised our glasses to that and to Everts' health, and may possibly have overdone it a bit on the drink. Returning to my room, I tripped on the doormat and fell flat on my face over the threshold. I was lucky. The white wine had made me as supple as a garden hose, and I got up again unscathed. However, this morning I did discover a bump on my head. I've thrown out the doormat, and will need a day to recover. Falls are uncommonly common in here. Sometimes people fall by tripping over a rug, as I did. But often they'll just keel over for no good reason. Or they'll sit down and miss the chair. Mrs. Bean, getting up from her chair, grabbed the tea trolley for support. Someone had failed to lock the wheels. The trolley tipped over with a great crash. Down went Mrs. Bean, in a cascade of biscuits, sugar cubes and creamers. Luckily, the thermoses were tightly closed. A brief silence, and then Mrs. Bean, on the floor, began laughing hysterically. Everyone joined in the laughter, to be polite, until Mrs. Bean's laughter turned to wailing. It was at that point that someone went to fetch the nurse. I wasn't there, but it must have been quite a surreal scene. Saturday the 18th of May my temporary dog-walking job means I now have to take a stroll three times a day. Fortunately, Mo walks even more slowly than I do. Actually, it's more of a slow-mo waddle. It would be hard for him to get lost on his saunter around the house, so I could just let him go by himself. But for Mo, it's more about the company. If he weren't so old and lazy, he'd jump up on me and wag his tail whenever I come in, no doubt about it. As it is, he slowly hauls himself out of his basket, groaning, gives me a few languid welcome licks, and then goes and stands by the door. Whenever takes him out, he sometimes shouts for Mo by his full name. Not that that's necessary, since Mo is never more than a couple of metres away. It's only when he spies some Moroccans in the vicinity, or people who look like they might be, that he'll yell, Come, Mohammed! In the hope that one of those Moroccans answers to the same name. Which is not unlikely. Once Everts created enough confusion, he'll make an apologetic gesture, point at the dog, nod politely, and continue on his way. It does embarrass me, though, to have to scoop up most turds and drop them into a plastic bag. I keep my head down because I know I'm being spied on from behind many curtains. By the way, I read that someone suggested using DNA testing to trace any unclaimed feces back to the dog so that its master could be fined. Whether dogs would be required to submit to a cheek swab or could do so on a voluntary basis, it did not say. Sunday the 19th of May. This morning I took Mr. Decout's mobility scooter for a test drive. He of the April Fool's joke. He had already offered to let me try it out several times, but I'd said no out of politeness and reserve. I was on my way to go out for a walk when he came riding into the lobby. Care to give it a try, Hendrick? The insurance regulations say you're not allowed to let anyone else drive your scooter. And officially, 
any new mobility scooter rider is supposed to have three driving lessons before he can drive off by himself. But Tikout doesn't like rules and isn't fussed about such details. He just spent five minutes giving me a few pointers, told me to have fun, and went to have a coffee. Taking a deep breath, off I went, ever so cautiously. I ended up cruising round for a good half hour, taking bicycle paths and cutting through public gardens. It was early in the morning, Whitson, so there was hardly anyone about. I kept it in snail gear at first, which barely lets you overtake a pedestrian, but a few minutes later, throwing caution to the wind, I switched to hair. The manufacturer assumes all old people are senile, so a little picture of a snail and a hair is easier for them to understand than, say, gears one and two. The manufacturer may even be right. I must admit, however, it rides wonderfully. It makes almost no noise. You sit there like a king. You don't get tired, and your legs don't hurt. I am sold. My only complaint, it gave me cramp in my right hand, because you have to keep squeezing the throttle. So, Mr. Manufacturer, please consider adding cruise control. I was a tad too confident as I drove into the lobby, and just bumped the porter who was rolling the linen trolley out of the lift. Nothing serious, but the turning radius is wider than I thought. Luckily, I don't like the porter anyway. The Capri Pro 3 mobility scooter only costs 399 euros. But I'm in the market for something a little more robust. I'll have to pay for it myself, since I'm still able to walk. Monday the 20th of May. A dementia patient, yesterday, stuck a billiard ball in his mouth. It couldn't be dislodged by any means. He sat there pitifully emitting high-pitched squeaks as two male nurses tried to pry the ball out with a spoon. After a fruitless fifteen-minute struggle, he was carted off to the emergency room. It wasn't as big as an official tournament ball, but when I briefly held one up to my mouth, it did strike me as a very large item to swallow. Quite alarming. Mr. Cloak was furious, because he had to finish his game with only two balls. Evert is coming home this afternoon. He has asked me to put a nice bottle of very old gin on ice for him. And he said I could buy a little something for myself while I was at it, if I liked. The welcome committee consists of the club members, plus Ria and Antoine, who are providing a high tea. Ria had asked the director if, just this once, they could cook a few little dishes in their room. But, alas, Mrs. Stellwagen was so incredibly sorry, but the board would not allow her to make any exceptions to the rules. From now on, we just won't ask, Antoine said angrily, an hour ago. He set the extractor on high and began preparing a veal of ragu. There are flowers on the table, and Mo will have a nice bow on his collar. Tuesday, the 21st of May. At two o'clock yesterday afternoon, Evert was delivered in a wheelchair to the door of his sheltered housing flat. An orderly pushed him inside, where the welcome committee awaited him. Effia, Grecia, Graham, Antoine, Ria, Edward, and yours truly, in a party hat, standing by his garlanded chair. Evert suddenly had to blow his nose loudly. Did you catch cold in hospital? asked Effia wickedly. Uh, uh, no, in hospital it was the extreme thirst that got to me mostly he said, trying to save face. I'm parched! His voice sounded shrill. Go, ma'am, the ninth big glass of milk is not, said Edward. I'd rather have a cocktail, please, if it's all the same to you. 
Let me offer you something tasty to go with it, Antoine said, revealing an elaborate spread of both savoury and sweet titbits. There was also tea and champagne. It was a most enjoyable afternoon. There was strict agreement at Everts' express request that there will be no mention of illnesses or hospitals. At four o'clock, the patient crashed. Seconds later, he was fast asleep, with a contented grin on his face, a touching sight. We finished our drinks and then cleaned up. Now, it's just hope and pray that Everett doesn't lose any more toes. A welcome home like this is fun, only once. Edward's excursion is scheduled for Tuesday, the 28th of May. With a little bit of luck, Everett will be feeling well enough to participate. I feel a bit sorry for Antoine and Maria. Although they haven't said anything, I sense they would love to join us on our outings. I'm going to do some lobbying on their behalf. Wednesday, the 22nd of May. It isn't easy to keep your chin up sometimes. Today, the conversation ranged from those two murdered little boys found in a drainage pipe, through rheumatism, hernias, and wonky hips, to, finally, the outdoor temperature refusing to climb above eleven degrees. It's the end of May, but all the heaters are still on. The thermostat is set at twenty-three degrees. The older, the colder. And then we have to consider the continual cutbacks in elderly care. People sigh, moan, and deplore. The stock market seems to be the only thing that's still going up, in a bizarre reverse measure of how bad things truly are. I read that they've started a nationwide campaign to combat the national mood of glumness in the Netherlands. The campaign organisers are hereby cordially invited to stop by our home. Lots of work to be done here. They could start with something simple. One day, without mention of illnesses or ailments. Anyone who starts moaning about an ache or pain has to pay ten euros into a kitty. We'll spend the winnings on a fancy champagne dinner. Antoine has given me his friend, the retired lawyer's, telephone number. I'll give him a ring this afternoon to ask him how to go about getting hold of all the rules and regulations. He'll enjoy that, Antoine had said. I'll ask Effia to listen in. Thursday, the 23rd of May. Our unit head, Mrs. Gestat, has given Mr. Backer a warning. He has to watch his language. Backer is slowly losing it. Alzheimer's. Maybe they'll move him over to the other side one of these days. It would be no great loss. He was never the most civil customer to start with, but lately he's been getting really crass. He curses and swears without any apparent provocation. When Gestat had a word with him for constantly raging on about bleeding shitheads, he glared at the floor, furious. The moment she was out of earshot, he told his table companions, That effing bitch struts about as if she's got an effing cucumber up her ass. I couldn't help finding it hilarious. But the other five people sitting there were shocked, speechless. I wound up hiccuping into my handkerchief. They all glared at me. I wouldn't be at all surprised if as soon as we were finished having coffee, Bacchus' words, perhaps somewhat sanitised, were relayed back to Gestat. Ebert almost fell out of his wheelchair laughing when I told him about it. I, I may possibly be a candidate for Alzheimer's myself, since I'm finding crude jokes much funnier now than I once did. I'm growing less respectable all the time. Yesterday afternoon, I talked on the phone with the lawyer recommended by Antoine. Just call me Victor, seemed enthusiastic, and said filing an appeal based on the Governance Transparency Act would be a piece of cake. He suggested that we meet for further discussion. I had the telephone on speaker. Effia nodded. 
we made a date for Thursday the 30th of May at the Toll House, a nice old-fashioned establishment with tablecloths and pub food. Everett is doing as well as can be expected under the circumstances. Friday the 24th of May They do make a molehill out of every bull in a china shop, don't they? said Mrs. Pott, upon hearing about the latest poison attack in Syria. The Arab Spring is a bit like our own, isn't it? More like autumn than spring, mused her neighbour, dunking a biscuit in her tea. Mr. Backer, with his usual self-restraint, remarked that so long as those Arabs were killing each other, he wasn't going to lose any sleep over it. Analysts of world events at our coffee table are not known for nuance and are not deterred by lack of understanding either. The same goes, I must add, for news on a more local level. A flood of indignation swept through the home when the mini-market downstairs was shut yesterday for a funeral. It was simply an outrage to have to go for an entire day without being able to buy cheese crackers or hairspray. You'd think we were in Eastern Europe. For a funeral, shouldn't half a day's closure be more than sufficient? This shop, whose assortment could easily fit inside three moving boxes, is the same one they lambaste for charging twenty cents more for the toilet duck than they do at Aldi. Last night Ephel invited me in for a glass of wine. Inspired by the harassment protocol, we discussed the possibility of drawing up a protocol for making old-age homes more pleasant for their occupants. We are in two minds about it. Is it worth doing? Is something like that wasted on our fellow residents? Are our limited energies not better employed making our own twilight years more agreeable? Or rather, our twilight days? One never knows. We are leaning towards the latter option, but have decided to give it some more thought. At least it gives us a good reason to meet again soon. Saturday, the 25th of May. A crematorium crisis. The coffin got stuck halfway in, so the oven door couldn't close properly. The coffin caught fire and the smoke seeped into the chapel. The crematorium had to be evacuated. Anyone who hadn't been weeping emerged teary-eyed. That's what I call a spectacular way to say goodbye. This actually happened a few years ago. For myself, I've come up with the idea of having a small CD player hidden inside my coffin, equipped with a remote control that will pipe out my voice, shouting, Hello! Hello out there! Knock, knock! You're making a mistake! Let me out! I'm still alive! Oh, don't worry! Just joking! I'm dead as a doornail. Such a pity I won't be there to enjoy it. I do have to give some serious thought, however, to my last wishes. Not that I have a lot of them, but there are a few things I don't want. And I haven't put anything down on paper yet. It's a chore that one tends to put off as long as possible. The disadvantaged elderly in Amsterdam will shortly be able to ride the buses and trams for free. Disadvantaged we certainly are. Only it's a pity almost nobody dares to ride the bus or tram these days. The trams are packed with pickpockets and purse snatchers. Well, you can protect yourself from pickpockets by tucking your wallet somewhere secure. But there's nothing you can do about insolent bus drivers who drive much too fast. I have to agree with my fellow residents, albeit reluctantly. Public transport and the over-80s are incompatible. It's far too crowded, too fast, and demands physical agility you no longer possess. You hold up the other passengers and make them impatient. It makes old people anxious and helpless. I've noticed that I'm getting more hesitant and uncertain myself, although I hate to admit it. So, thanks a lot, public transport, but we prefer to take our own 
dedicated minibus. Sunday the 26th of May The first and only item on the agenda of the ad hoc meeting of the Residents' Association, New Mobility Scooter Regulations, motivated by a head-on collision between two motorised chairs turning a corner from opposite directions. Considerable chassis damage and one minor scrape. Of course, each claimed it was the other driver's fault. The Residents' Association wants to ask the management to put up traffic signs and mirrors at the blind corners. Last week, so the rumour goes, a resident wound up in hospital. Mrs. Shap didn't just slip and fall, as reported. She was actually knocked down by a scooter. The driver, who wishes to have his identity kept secret, had been a bit too intent on his shopping basket. The director is keeping the exact details under her hat. The eyewitnesses must have been told to keep their mouths shut for the sake of the investigation. There is barely enough room for two scooters to pass each other in the corridor. Add to that the fact that many of the residents are either short-sighted or stone-deaf or both, and, as you can imagine, this place can sometimes resemble one big circus attraction. It's a miracle, actually, that there haven't been many more casualties, especially if you take into account the average driver's sluggish reaction time. And if the drivers would just keep their wits about them, then, at a speed of five kilometres an hour, there's not much that can go wrong. But the panic at every encounter with another driver or pedestrian means anything can happen. I wish the Grand Marshal of this home much luck and wisdom in trying to come up with a traffic plan. Monday, the 27th of May this morning I received a brochure in the post. Libid crystal shots will make your penis hard as steel. Volcanic ejaculations. I had a good laugh at that one. Could it be Everett's idea of a joke? I had an uncle who used to mark each birthday with the boast that he could still batter down the church door with his willy. And since I'm going there, uh, another uncle was fond of singing a ditty with the unforgettable refrain, Aunt Marie, she had a trough big enough for a horse to stuff. They still have, I believe, a call-in programme on the radio for listeners trying to track down lost or forgotten songs. You get to sing the lines you remember on the air, and they try to dig up the rest of it for you. Should I... Yeah, I must get a move on. Our club outing was moved forward a day. It is today instead of tomorrow, thanks to the stellar weather forecast. It promises to be the first balmy springtime day in weeks. Last night, Edward checked with each of us individually to see if we could all make it. No one had a problem. Our calendars are completely blank. Today, tomorrow, and the rest of the year, we have all the time in the world. We once complained of our being overscheduled. Now we're thrilled to bits if there's something to jot down other than a doctor's appointment. I have to be down in the lobby in half an hour, in comfy outdoor clothing. Tuesday the 28th of May. We did not have far to go. A leisurely five-minute stroll took us to our destination. The Boole Strip on the green on the south side of our building. That is where the exclusive, first-ever Jeux de Boule championship for over 79s took place. Edward had planned it to a tee. Twelve shiny balls, tape measure, large trophy for the winning team, six comfortable deck chairs, table, tablecloth, thermos of coffee and one of tea, apple pie, sandwiches, sunscreen, china, Cool box filled with cold drinks, smoked salmon and eel on toast. Parasol, all under a radiant spring sun. Edward had hired Steph, Greecher's grandson, to take care of the logistics, and together they had loaded everything into his minivan that morning, and after a two-minute ride, 
unloaded it all again and neatly arranged it on the green. At noon, we came trundling up, Everett leading the way in his wheelchair, amazed at what greeted our eyes. First there was coffee and cake, then the drawing of lots, and then the tournament. Three teams of two players, each playing a full round. Steph was the umpire. Halfway through the contest, lunch was served, and at the end, for the prize ceremony, champagne. The victors were Graham and Grecia, a respectable second place for Effia and Ebert, who shouted that without his toes his aim was considerably improved, and the bronze for Edward and myself. Graham was taunted for being the Paul Gascoigne of Boole, because when he won, he did look a bit teary. The one thing Edward hadn't counted on was that half the care home had gathered towards the end to have a look. It was brilliant publicity for our club, only we don't want any new members. At four o'clock, everything was loaded back into the minivan, and our little group trooped home again. Dead tired, but happy. Wednesday, the 29th of May. An eighty-year-old chap has managed to climb Mount Everest. I, I have enough trouble stepping up on the curb. It isn't fair. The previous oldest record holder, Min Bahadur Sechan, now eighty-one, promptly announced he intends to recapture his record next week. There's also been a one-legged woman who reached the summit. On a prosthetic leg, surely. She can't have got all the way up to eight thousand metres hopping on one leg. Can she? The first man with no arms has also been spotted up there. It's quite a remarkable convoy that makes its way to the top of Everest nowadays. I'm waiting for the first incontinent-veiled nun to plant the Polynesian flag up there, and then I shall have a go myself. I've rung my insurance company, and it appears that I have to be approved in order to qualify for a mobility scooter. I can make an appointment for six weeks from now. I think that I'll just go out and buy one myself. I'll check the consumer's guide to see if they've tested any mobility scooters recently. There are three categories of buyers. The first and the biggest group takes the middle road. Not the cheapest, but certainly not the most expensive product. A second, much smaller group always goes for the most expensive, and the last group decides on the cheapest version. Unless I have a reason not to, I always go for the cheapest. At least I'll be saving money. Naturally, cheap can cost you in the end, but on the other hand, dear is bound to cost even more. Call it coincidence. Yesterday there was an article in the paper about an all-terrain scooter, the action track chair, with caterpillar tread tyres. You can drive it across hill and dale and through heavy snow. Ten thousand euros. There's the rub. Thursday, the 30th of May. Everett is not doing well. The wound just will not heal. A nurse comes daily to change the dressing, so that's not the problem. She's a bit of all right, so I don't mind if she has to keep coming. He still talks the good talk. But when I picked up the dog this morning, I continue in my role as full-time dog walker, he did not hear me come in, and I overheard him say to Mo, Your master may not be around much longer, Mo, and honestly, I don't know what's to become of you. I coughed rather uneasily, to let him know I was there. Did you overhear what I was saying, Enki? Yes. What do you think? Should I have Mo put to sleep if I die? You can't put an old brute like him in a shelter. You can't do that to the shelter. You're jumping the gun a bit, aren't you? Well, I am prepared to look after Mo but only as long as Ebert's alive. If he dies, his flat has to be surrendered, without the dog. 
Dogs are not permitted on my floor. Friday the 31st of May. Effie and I had an appointment yesterday afternoon with the retired lawyer Victor Forstenbosch, 71. A posh, self-satisfied fellow, who, as he admitted to us in our plummy voice, tends to get rather bored at home. He was looking forward to rolling up his sleeves again. His former office never rang him for a consult any more, and that did not sit well with him. He didn't mind telling us. He'd like a chance to show them he's still a clever old fox. In short, he was keen. He promised he would this very week contact the administration to request, under the Government's Transparency Act, any document that may have even the faintest relevance. The request will be made under his name. Effie remarked astutely that our home wasn't a publicly owned institution and that the law might, therefore, not be applicable. Yes, she had a point there, Victor admitted. He would take it into consideration in his pursuit of the rules and statutes. He said we could come back in a few days' time and review the draft request, which he prefers to keep with him at home. He has lost faith in the trustworthiness of his fellow man over the years. That care whom confidentiality clause doesn't carry much weight, and email security is virtually non-existent. We seem to have landed in a spy thriller. Let's just hope we can dig up some juicy scandals. Mr. Shansley, a friendly chap who lives on the third floor, was a passionate pigeon fancier before moving here, he couldn't get over it. Some Chinese man paid 310,000 euros for a Belgian prize pigeon. Unbelievable! Just unbelievable, he kept saying. Edward wondered what would happen if an expensive pigeon like that ever decided to join his gutter mates on Dam Square. Or if some sportsman shot it out of the sky for a pate. Would it taste like three hundred thousand smuggers? Well, yes, you have some that vanish without a trace, Chancellor said gloomily. He admitted he had lost dozens of birds over the years. Saturday the 1st of June Bad news. Yesterday, Gretchen and I went for a walk. After five minutes... We had to sit down for a rest on the bench the council has so kindly provided. The sun was shining. After the usual pleasantries, we found ourselves discussing more personal matters. She told me she has started losing it quite a bit of late, both literally and figuratively. I'm good at camouflaging it, but some day I won't be able to do that any more. It's making me feel very insecure. I'll suddenly find myself standing in the lift, for example, with no idea how I got there or where I'm going. I didn't really know what to say. We were silent for a while. Then I suggested she might want to go to her GP to be tested for Alzheimer's. And that any time she felt confused, she should seek help from the people she trusted. They would set her right. You can come and knock on my door whenever you like, Greecher. I'll gladly help you as much as I can. Greecher, the epitome of kindness, but always a bit closed and reserved. I was surprised that she was confiding in me, and also rather proud and sad. In short, it wasn't easy, all those feelings at once. Herbert seems to be doing a bit better. At the physiotherapist's, he is giving it his all, which manifests itself mainly in the amount of curses emerging from his mouth while he's doing his exercises. Once, when Everett was about to step on the treadmill, one of the assistants made a show of stuffing cotton wool in her ears in jest. In response, Everett plugged his own mouth with a huge wad of the stuff. Sunday the 2nd of June I had a bad night thinking about my talk with Greecher. Everything seems to point to Alzheimer's. 
I asked her this morning if she had mentioned it to anyone else. She has not. Not even to your GP? Uh, no, he's an unpleasant chap. Would you mind if I asked the others for advice? She needed some time to think about that. I did some browsing on the internet. There are some 250,000 people suffering from dementia in the Netherlands. Alzheimer's is the most common type. Your chance of getting it is one in five. And rather alarmingly, you live on for another eight years on average. It isn't something we're unfamiliar with here, of course. There are plenty of folk in here who start losing their marbles as they age. And after those first marbles, they keep losing more, until all that's left in the old noggin is a jumble of loose ends. If you're lucky, it's a happy jumble. If you're unlucky, a frightening or aggressive one. Fortunately, we don't have to witness the last stage of disintegration close up. By that time, the poor things have been moved to the other side, the locked ward. When people start stirring their soup with their hands or slinging their poo about, their departure is imminent. I don't want to see that happening to Grisha. Monday, the 3rd of June. The board has sent a letter to all the residents, saying the care in this and other institutions is to receive a makeover. When management starts using that word, you had better watch out. Makeover means cutbacks and reorganization. From the letter, the makeover will lead to improved quality in the long run. Yes, yes. The only thing missing was a vow to put the elderly back in the driver's seat. The company's spin doctor seems to have left a perfectly good piece of blarney on the table there. Our Prime Minister, Mark Rutter, also promised to put the Dutch people back in the driver's seat. Have you noticed anything changing? Even though no one was able to pull anything concrete from the board's letter, opinions were divided. To some, we were on the road to hell, whereas others read the same words and beheld paradise gleaming on the horizon. Old people run the gamut of human beliefs. One thing is certain. When all said and done, the planning and reorganization will inevitably entail a rise in salary for the board of directors. Tuesday the 4th of June I wonder how the first anarchist old-age home in the Netherlands is faring. It's a nursing home by the name of De Hoven, in the hamlet of Onderden Dam in Groningen province. Two years ago, they decided, as an experiment, to do away with all rules and regulations. Well, perhaps not all. Knowing what the average OAP is like, I'm afraid such freedom would mean murder and mayhem. And bingo, every day. The director of De Hoven wanted to see whether her colleagues and the residents would be happier without rules. The Regulation Free Care experiment was to be conducted by scientists from the University of Groningen. I have looked online, but can't find any mention of the outcome. What made me think of it was a new rule that's just been imposed here. Only low-energy light bulbs are to be used in the rooms. The environment, you know. I went over to our lawyer Victor's house to look at the draft letter requesting that we be allowed to see our institution's rules and regulations. It all sounded very legalistic. I so legalistic that I couldn't make head nor tail of it. It did inspire confidence. It was a pity Effia wasn't with me. She's got a sharper eye. She wasn't feeling well. Although it was only two o'clock in the afternoon, Victor poured me an enormous snifter of very expensive cognac and gave me a cigar, which I cautiously puffed on, coughing and wheezing. Our lawyer is a bit of a caricature of the Tweedy Knob, a role he plays with gusto. Pretense and reality all rolled into one. But in his case, the two don't really contradict. 
Wednesday, the 5th of June. Mrs. Fisser set out early this morning by minibus for the Ikea on the other side of town, with two suspect coffee cups in her bag, to ask for her money back. Although they're not the actual Lider Jumbo Cups that are being recalled because the bottoms tend to fall out, uh, but a different Ikea design. Says Mrs. Fisser, Who's to say these will hold scalding hot water? It's been almost three hours, and Mrs. Fisser still isn't back. People in here don't like taking risks. If there's a recall on any food item anywhere in the world, Every kitchen cupboard is thoroughly excavated for potential samples of the offending tin or package. On the other hand, people are not pernickety about expiry dates. Throwing food away is a dreadful shame, even if it's covered in mould. Just scrape it off, or scoop it out, and it's still perfectly fine to eat. Which does much to explain the frequency of food poisoning cases among the elderly. Meanwhile, the kitchen has to check the butter every day to make sure its temperature is between five and seven degrees. A new record was set recently. In clearing out a deceased resident's room, they found something in the refrigerator that was seventeen years past the expiry date. The room was spick and span otherwise. That's the rumour, at least. For of course... That sort of thing is never made public. We have another outing set for tomorrow. The weather report predicts perfect conditions for the aged, not too warm and not too cold, very little wind and no humidity. Thursday the 6th of June If you happen to see any Amsterdam municipal guards about, I believe they are now called neighbourhood watch officers, you can be fairly sure the coast is clear, for they tend to avoid danger at all cost. So, in nice weather, you'll find them sunning themselves on the bench by our door. I expect that for the paltry salary they make, you can't blame them for avoiding troubled neighbourhoods, ruled by street gangs. I have never witnessed one of them stopping a motorcycle that's racing along the bike path at seventy kilometres per hour with the roar of a fighter jet. Municipal guards radiate sad impotence. Their uniform is also always a bit too tight. It could be worse. Some time ago I read that in The Hague... The average meter man or maid gives out one parking ticket a day. Apparently, they don't work on commission. I wonder what the interviewers are looking for in applicants for the job. There we go. Yesterday, we had the first complaints about the warm weather. Uh, it always gets so muggy here in the Netherlands, according to Fat Backer. Only two days ago, he was still complaining about the cold. Sometimes I like to kill him. I am wearing my best and only lightweight suit. I've also unearthed an old-fashioned straw boater. I want to look a bit like Maurice Chevalier. We are to report after lunch for an outing organised by Graham. He's been saying for days that as long as the weather's nice, it can't go wrong. Friday the 7th of June. At 1300, sharp, three pedicaps pulled up in front, driven by three strapping young fellows who we don't have to feel sorry for them. One of them was a friend of Graham's son who had organised our transportation. We were helped on board courteously, and with many eyes on us, the convoy moved off. I shared a cab with Ebert, who immediately launched into... Bicycle built for two. Every single lyric and refrain. He sounds like an old crow. The trip took us through the Waterland region. Zunderdorp, Ransdorp, Eitdam and Zeidewalder. Picturesque old villages, seemingly untouched by time. But judging from the fancy modern cargo bikes on the driveways, 
in fact, taken over by rich Amsterdam yuppies. Ebert regaled me with stories of the past. From time to time we heard peals of laughter from one of the other pedicabs, or Epia would demand a bird-watching halt. I recognised the godwit from its picture on the matchbox, but that's as far as my bird expertise goes. Inside the Waldo we were driven to a wine shop. The greengrocer is gone. A sommelier has taken his place. A wine tasting was planned for us, with snacks, titbits which, according to Ebert, were too light for really heavy drinking. In wine tasting, you're not supposed to swallow, but spit. Still, there are limits to our compliance. We'll spit when we're sick, but not when we're imbibing. We let the pedicab boys join in the tasting, on condition they promised not to drive us into a ditch on the way back. After an impromptu passing of the hat, we bought two dozen bottles with the proceeds. A good time, I can't think of a better way of putting it, was had by all. We started the return journey with some more singing, but soon we all nodded off. We were deposited at the front door, the drivers were each given a bottle of the wine as a tip, and were then gaily waved goodbye. We always discreetly settle up with the organiser the day after the outing. Expensive? Let's put it this way. An outstanding price-to-quality ratio. Saturday, the 8th of June. There's a DIY Alzheimer's test. The name is a bit misleading, since the test is designed to find out if someone else has Alzheimer's. I did test myself, however, and got a reassuring result. No Alzheimer's. The reason I'm mentioning this is that I paid close attention to Grecia on our trip. She seemed to be enjoying herself immensely, but did occasionally have a dazed look on her face, and sometimes one of surprise. I haven't known her long enough or well enough to administer the Alzheimer's test to her, but she does have symptoms that point in that direction. What she herself told me is not reassuring. To realise that you are slowly but surely losing your grip on reality. Unlike the frog in a pan of hot water that doesn't realise it's slowly getting cooked, you're painfully aware for a long time of your own deterioration. You find yourself sinking more and more often into a deep black hole and spending less and less time crawling out of it, certain you'll only fall in again. Still time enough to see where this leads, ending up like one of all the other befuddled, frightened or furious old bundles of misery, not counting the few that remain obliviously cheerful anxiously trying to retrieve what no longer exists. And then, confined to bed, or listlessly drooling in a wheelchair, tied to the bed, once there's nothing more they can do for you. No dignity left. Poor Grecia. What can I say to console her? Sunday, the 9th of June. Mrs. Surman decided to dry her wet slippers in the microwave. She set the timer for twenty minutes and then went to watch the telly. The slippers melted and set off the fire alarm. I shouldn't be surprised if management used the incident as a pretext to outlaw the use of microwaves. The same management sent round a letter announcing that cameras are being installed in the corridors. For our own safety. That's really the last straw. The word Gestapo has been muttered. Has she completely lost her marbles, that Stelvagen woman? Cameras? To find out who's been tossing cakes in the fish tank? Or whose rollator won't give way to the nurse with the pill trolley? Graham was uncharacteristically incensed. He vowed he'd personally trash those cameras. Ebert promptly offered to help. I think Mrs. Stelvagen has overplayed her hand this time. 
Most of the inhabitants don't want surveillance cameras in here. Although they do like the other kind of camera. Whenever the local TV station shows up to film a hundredth birthday, they fall over themselves to get in the picture. Residents who for years have done nothing but mumble are suddenly capable of belting it out at the top of their lungs. Ladies who always sit downstairs in the same grubby grey frock are suddenly seen wearing an exuberantly flowered dress and party hat. Fortunately, the forty-five minutes of showing off the cameramen filmed last time was cut down to exactly fifty seconds for the broadcast. Everyone was terribly disappointed. Some even felt seriously insulted. Monday the 10th of June Yesterday was the kind of day when you doze off four times over the newspaper or telly, then stay up, tossing and turning half the night. I first tried a glass of warm milk and honey, then swallowed two sleeping pills. According to addiction experts, I am one of the 930,000 Dutch over 55s who resort to a pill when sleep won't come on its own. It seems old age homes are teeming with junkies. They're addicted to sleeping pills containing benzodiazepines. Huh? Oh, yes. Benzodiazepines. They also help assuage anxiety and fretting. But they come with a dangerous side effect. You might break a hip. In the Netherlands alone, they've caused over a thousand broken hips. By the expert's estimate, all elderly folk who wake up in the middle of the night in an extra doddery state stagger to the loo and take a fall. Crack. Tuesday, 11th of June. Our club meeting yesterday was hosted by Ebert. A rather disappointing performance. He burned the appetizers, blackened bitter barlin and charred chicken nuggets. His extractor fan is too efficient, so nobody noticed the smell of burning. Elderly noses. The liver sausage was past its use-by date. We had to make do with cheese and, of course, an overabundance of alcohol. The clamour to include Ria and Antoine Trevor Mundi, our home's aged culinary whiz-kids, grew too loud to ignore. They would immediately and unanimously vote it in as probationary members of the old but not dead club. A delegation consisting of Gretia and Edward was sent to invite them to join us forthwith. They came, and were quite moved. They heartily thanked each and every one of us in turn. Antoine had tears in his eyes. Isn't it nice we can all still be part of this, said Effia, sardonically. Antoine nodded. Rhea laughed a bit awkwardly. Then they went back to their room to raid their fridge for some French cheeses, Serrano ham and smoked salmon to celebrate their 100th 